homily seventeen of homilies on hebrews by st john chrysostom this librivox recording is in the public domain homily seventeen hebrews nine twenty four through twenty six for christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands which are the figures of the true but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of god for us nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest enter into the holy place every year with the blood of others for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself the jews greatly prided themselves on the temple and the tabernacle wherefore they said the temple of the lord the temple of the lord the temple of the lord for nowhere else in the earth was such a temple constructed as this either for costliness or beauty or anything else for god who ordained it commanded that it should be made with great magnificence because they also were more attracted and urged on by material things for it had bricks of gold in the walls and any one who wishes may learn this in the second book of kings and in ezekiel and how many talents of gold were then expended but the second temple was a more glorious building both on account of its beauty and in all other respects nor was it reverenced for this reason only but also from its being one for they were wont to resort thither from the uttermost parts of the earth whether from babylon or from ethiopia and luke shows this when he says in the acts there were dwelling there parthians and medes and elamites and the dwellers in mesopotamia in judea and cappadocia in pontus and asia phrygia and pamphylia in egypt and in the parts of libya about cyrene they then who lived in all parts of the world assembled there and the fame of the temple was great what then does paul do what he did in regard to the sacrifices that also he does here for as there he set against them the death of christ so here also he sets the whole heaven against the temple and not by this alone did he point out the difference but also by adding that the priest is nearer to god for he says to appear in the presence of god so that he made the matter august not only by the consideration of heaven but also by that of christ's entering in there for not merely through symbols is here but he sees god himself there seest thou that condescension through the lowly things that have been said throughout why dost thou then any longer wonder that he intercedes there where he places himself as a high priest nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest for christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands he says which are the figures of the true these then are true and those are figures for the temple too has been so arranged as the heaven of heavens what sayest thou he who is everywhere present and who filleth all things doth not he appear unless he enter into heaven thou seest that all these things pertain to the flesh to appear he says in the presence of god for us what is for us he went up he means with a sacrifice which had power to propitiate the father wherefore tell me was he an enemy the angels were enemies he was not an enemy for that the angels were enemies hear what he says he made peace as to things on earth and things in heaven so that he also entered into heaven now to appear in the presence of god for us he now appeareth but for us nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest enter into the holy place every year with blood of others seest thou how many are the differences the often for the once the blood of others for his own great is the distance he is himself then both victim and priest and sacrifice for if it had not been so and it had been necessary to offer many sacrifices he must have been many times crucified 
for then he says he must often have suffered since the foundation of the world in this place he has also veiled over something but now once more in the end of the world why at the end of the world after the many sins if therefore it had taken place at the beginning then no one would have believed and he must not die a second time all would have been useless but since later there were many transgressions with reason he then appeared which he expresses in another place also where sin abounded grace did much more abound but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself verse twenty seven and as it is appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment he next says also why he died once only because he became a ransom by one death it had been appointed he says unto men once to die this then is the meaning of he died once for all what then do we no longer die that death we do indeed die but we do not continue in it which is not to die at all for the tyranny of death and death indeed is when he who dies is never more allowed to return to life but when after dying is living and that a better life this is not death but sleep since then death was to have possession of all therefore he died that he might deliver us verse twenty eight so christ was once offered by whom offered evidently by himself here he says that he is not priest only but victim also and what is sacrificed on this account are the words was offered was once offered he says to bear the sins of many why of many and not of all because not all believed for he died indeed for all that is his part for that death was a counterbalance against the destruction of all men but he did not bear the sins of all men because they were not willing and what is the meaning of he bare the sins just as in the oblation we bear up our sins and say whether we have sinned voluntarily or involuntarily do thou forgive that is we make mention of them first and then ask for their forgiveness so also was it done here where has christ done this hear himself saying and for their sakes i sanctify myself lo he bore the sins he took them from men and bore them to the father not that he might determine anything against them mankind but that he might forgive them unto them that look for him shall he appear he says the second time without sin unto salvation what is without sin it is as much as to say he sinneth not for neither did he die as owing the debt of death nor yet because of sin but how shall he appear to punish you say he did not however say this but what was cheering shall he appear unto them that look for him without sin unto salvation so that for the time to come they no longer need sacrifices to save themselves but to do this by deeds chapter ten verse one for he says the law having a shadow of the good things to come not the very image of the things that is to say not the very reality for as in painting so long as one only draws the outlines it is a sort of shadow but when one has added the bright paints and laid in the colours then it becomes an image something of this kind also was the law for he says the law having a shadow of the good things to come not the very image of the things that is to say of the sacrifice of the remission can never by those sacrifices with which they offered continually make the comers thereunto perfect verses two through nine for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins 
but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins wherefore when he cometh into the world he saith sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not but a body hast thou prepared me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure then said i lo i come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will o god above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin that wouldest not neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law then he said lo i come to do thy will o god he taketh away the first that he may establish the second thou seest again the superabundance of his proofs this sacrifice he says is one whereas the others were many therefore they had no strength because they were many for tell me what need of many if one had been sufficient so that there being many and offered continually proves that they the worshippers were never made clean for as a medicine when it is powerful and productive of health and able to remove the disease entirely affects all after one application as therefore if being once applied it accomplishes the whole it proves its own strength in being no more applied and this is its business to be no more applied whereas if it is applied continually this is a plain proof of its not having strength for it is the excellence of a medicine to be applied once and not often so is it in this case also why forsooth are they continually cured with the same sacrifices for if they were set free from all their sins the sacrifices would not have gone on being offered every day for they had been appointed to be continually offered in behalf of the whole people both in the evening and in the day so that there was an arraignment of sins and not a release from sins an arraignment of weakness not an exhibition of strength for because the first had no strength another also was offered and since this effected nothing again another so that it was an evidence of sins the offering indeed then was an evidence of sins the continually an evidence of weakness but with regard to christ it was the contrary he was once offered the types therefore contain the figure only not the power just as in images the image has the figure of a man not the power so that the reality and the type have somewhat in common with one another for the figure exists equally in both but not the power so too also is it in respect of heaven and of the tabernacle for the figure was equal for there was the holy of holies but the power and the other things were not the same what is he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself what is this putting away it is making contemptible for sin has no longer any boldness for it is made of no effect in that when it ought to have demanded punishment it did not demand it that is it suffered violence when it expected to destroy all men then it was itself destroyed he hath appeared by the sacrifice of himself he says that is he hath appeared unto god and draw near unto him for do not think because the high priest was wont to do this oftentimes in the year so that henceforward this is done in vain although it is done for what need is there of medicines where there are no wounds on this account he ordained offerings continually because of their want of power and that a remembrance of sins might be made what then do we not offer every day we offer indeed but making a remembrance of his death and this remembrance is one and not many how is it one and not many inasmuch as that sacrifice was once for all offered and carried into the holy of holies this is a figure of that sacrifice and this remembrance of that for we always offer the same 
not one sheep now and to-morrow another but always the same thing so that the sacrifice is one and yet by this reasoning since the offering is made in many places are there many christs but christ is one everywhere being complete here and complete there also one body as then while offered in many places he is one body and not many bodies so also he is one sacrifice he is our high priest who offered the sacrifice that cleanses us that we offer now also which was then offered which cannot be exhausted this is done in remembrance of what was then done for saith he do this in remembrance of me it is not another sacrifice as the high priest but we offer always the same or rather we perform a remembrance of a sacrifice but since i have mentioned this sacrifice i wish to say a little in reference to you who have been initiated little in quantity but possessing great force and profit for it is not our own but the words of divine spirit what then is it many partake of this sacrifice once in the whole year others twice others many times our word then is to all not to those only who are here but to those also who are settled in the desert for they partake once in the year and often indeed at intervals of two years what then which shall we approve those who receive once in the year those who receive many times those who receive few times neither those who receive once nor those who receive often nor those who receive seldom but those who come with a pure conscience from a pure heart with an irreproachable life let such draw near continually but those who are not such not even once why you will ask because they receive to themselves judgment yea and condemnation and punishment and vengeance and do not wonder for is food nourishing by nature if received by a person without appetite ruins and corrupts all the system and becomes an occasion of disease so surely is it also with respect to the awful mysteries dost thou feast at a spiritual table a royal table and again pollute thy mouth with mire dost thou anoint thyself with sweet ointment and again fill thyself with ill savours tell me i beseech thee when after a year thou partakest of the communion dost thou think that the forty days are sufficient for thee for the purifying of the sins of all that time and again when a week has passed dost thou give thyself up to the former things tell me now if when thou hast been well for forty days after a long illness thou shouldest again give thyself up to the food which caused the sickness hast thou not lost thy former labour too for if natural things are changed much more those which depend on choice as for instance by nature we see and naturally we have healthy eyes but oftentimes from a habit of body our power of vision is injured if then natural things are changed much more those of choice thou assignest forty days for the health of the soul or perhaps not even forty but dost thou expect to propitiate god tell me art thou in sport these things i say not as forbidding you the one and annual coming but as wishing you to draw near continually these things have been given to the holy this the deacon also proclaims when he calls on the holy even by this calling searching the faults of all for as in a flock where many sheep indeed are in good health but many are full of the scab it is needful that these should be separated from the healthy so also in the church since some sheep are healthy and some diseased by this voice he separates the one from the other the priest i mean going round on all sides by this most awful cry and calling and drawing on the holy for it is not possible that a man should know the things of his neighbour for what man he says knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him 
he utters this voice after the whole sacrifice has been completed that no person should come to the spiritual fountain carelessly and in a chance way for in the case of the flock also for nothing prevents us from again using the same example the sickly ones we shut up within and keep them in the dark and give them different food not permitting them to partake either of pure air or of simple grass or of the fountain without the fold in this case then also this voice is instead of fetters thou canst not say i did not know i was not aware that danger attends the matter nay surely paul too especially testified this but wilt thou say i never read it this is not an apology but even an accusation dost thou come into the church every day and yet art thou ignorant of this however that thou mayest not have even this excuse to offer for this cause with a loud voice with an awful cry like some herald lifting up his hand on high standing aloft conspicuous to all and after that awful silence crying out aloud he invites some and some he forbids not doing this with his hand but with his tongue more distinctly than with his hand for that voice falling on our ears just like a hand thrust away and cast out some and introduces and presents others tell me then i beseech you in the olympic games does not the herald stand calling out with loud and uplifted voice saying does any one accuse this man is he a slave is he a thief is he one of wicked manners and yet those contests for prizes are not of the soul nor yet of good morals but of strength and the body if then where there is exercise of bodies much examination is made about character how much rather here where the soul is alone the combatant our herald then even now stands not holding each person by the head and drawing him forward but holding all together by the head within he does not set against them other accusers but themselves against themselves for he says not does any one accuse this man but what if any man accuse himself for when he says the holy things for the holy he means this if any is not holy let him not draw near he does not simply say free from sins but holy for it is not merely freedom from sins which makes a man holy but also the presence of the spirit and the wealth of good works i do not merely wish he says that you should be delivered from the mire but also that you should be bright and beautiful for if the babylonian king when he made choice of the youths from the captives chose out those who were beautiful in form and of fair countenance much more is it needful that we when we stand by the royal table should be beautiful in form i mean that of the soul having adornment of gold our robe pure our shoes royal the face of our soul well formed the golden ornament put around it even the girdle of truth let such an one as this draw near and touch the royal cups but if any man clothed in rags filthy squalid wish to enter into the royal table consider how much he will suffer the forty days not being sufficient to wash away the offences which have been committed in all the time for if hell is not sufficient although it be eternal for therefore also it is eternal much more this short time for we have not shown a strong repentance but a weak eunuchs especially ought to stand by the king by eunuchs i mean those who are clear in their mind having no wrinkle nor spot lofty in mind having the eye of the soul gentle and quick-sighted active and sharp not sleepy or supine full of much freedom and yet far from impudence and overboldness wakeful healthful neither very gloomy and downcast nor yet dissolute and soft this eye we have it in our own power to create and to make it quick-sighted and beautiful 
for when we direct it not to the smoke nor to the dust for such are all human things but to the delicate breeze to the light air to things heavenly and high and full of much calmness and purity and of much delight we shall speedily restore it and shall invigorate it as it luxuriates in such contemplation hast thou seen covetousness and great wealth do not thou lift up thine eye thereto the thing is mire it is smoke and evil vapour darkness and great distress and suffocating cares hast thou seen a man cultivating righteousness content with his own and having abundant space for recreation having anxieties not fixing his thoughts on things here set thine eye there and lift it up on high and thou wilt make it far the most beautiful and more splendid feasting it not with the flowers of the earth but with those of virtue with temperance moderation and all the rest for nothing so troubles the eye as an evil conscience mine eye it is said was troubled by reason of anger nothing so darkens it set it free from this injury and thou wilt make it vigorous and strong ever nourished with good hopes and may we all make both it and also the other energies of the soul such as christ desires that being made worthy of the head who is set over us we may depart thither where he wishes for he saith i will that where i am they also may be with me that they may behold my glory which may we all enjoy in christ jesus our lord with whom to the father together with the holy ghost be glory might honour now and for ever and world without end amen end of homily seventeen homily eighteen of homilies on hebrews by st john chrysostom this librivox recording is in the public domain homily eighteen hebrews ten eight through thirteen above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin that wouldest not neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law then said he lo i come to do thy will o god he taketh away the first that he may establish the second by the which will we are sanctified by the offering of the body of jesus christ once for all and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins but this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins for ever sat down on the right hand of god from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool in what has gone before he had shown that the sacrifices were unavailing for perfect purification and were a type and greatly defective since then there was this objection to his argument if they are types how is it that after the truth is come they have not ceased nor given place but are still performed he here accordingly labours at this very point showing that they are no longer performed even as a figure for god does not accept them and this again he shows not from the new testament but from the prophets bringing forward from times of old the strongest testimony that it the old system comes to an end and ceases and that they do all in vain always resisting the holy ghost and he shows over and above that they cease not now only but at the very coming of the messiah nay rather even before his coming and how it was that christ did not abolish them at the last but they were abolished first and then he came first they were made to cease and then he appeared that they might not say even without this sacrifice and by means of those we could have been well pleasing unto god he waited for these sacrifices to be convicted of weakness and then he appeared for he says sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not hereby he took all away and having spoken generally he says also particularly in burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin thou hadst no pleasure 
but the offering was everything except the sacrifice then said i lo i come of whom was this spoken of none other than the christ here he does not blame those who offer showing that it is not because of their wickedness that he does not accept them as he says elsewhere but because the thing itself has been convicted for the future and shown to have no strength nor any suitableness to the times what then has this to do with the sacrifices being offered often times not only from their being often times offered he means it is manifest that they are weak and that they affected nothing but also from god's not accepting them as being unprofitable and useless and in another place it is said if thou hadst desired sacrifice i would have given it therefore by this also he makes it plain that he does not desire it therefore sacrifices are not god's will but the abolition of sacrifices wherefore they sacrifice contrary to his will what is to do thy will to give up myself he means this is the will of god by which will we are sanctified or he even means something still further that the sacrifices do not make men clean but the will of god therefore to offer sacrifice is not the will of god and why dost thou wonder that it is not the will of god now when it was not his will even from the beginning for who saith he hath required this at your hands how then did he himself enjoin it in condescension for as paul says i would that all men were even as myself in respect of continence and again says i will that the younger women marry bear children and lays down two wills yet the two are not his own although he commands but the one indeed is his own and therefore he lays it down without reasons while the other is not his own though he wishes it and therefore it is added with a reason for having previously accused them because they had waxed wanton against christ he then says i will that the younger women marry bear children so in this place also it was not his leading will that the sacrifices should be offered for as he says i wish not the death of the sinner but that he should return unto me and live and in another place he says that he not only wished but even desired this and yet these are contrary to each other for intense wishing is desire how then dost thou not wish how dost thou in another place desire which is a sign of vehement wishing so is it in this case also by the which will we are sanctified he says how sanctified by the offering of the body of jesus christ once for all and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice to stand therefore is a sign of ministering accordingly to sit is a sign of being ministered unto but this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins for ever sat down on the right hand of god from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool verses fourteen and fifteen for by one offering he hath perfected for ever them that are sanctified whereof the holy ghost also is a witness to us he had said that those sacrifices are not offered he reasoned from what is written and from what is not written moreover also he put forward the prophetic word which says sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not he had said that he had forgiven their sins again this also he proves from the testimony of what is written for the holy ghost he says is a witness to us for after that he had said verses sixteen through eighteen this is the covenant that i will make with them after those days saith the lord i will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will i write them and their sins and iniquities will i remember no more now where remission of these is there is no more offering for sin 
so then he forgave their sins when he gave the covenant and he gave the covenant by sacrifice if therefore he forgave the sins through the one sacrifice there is no longer need of a second he sat down on the right hand of god from henceforth expecting why the delay that his enemies be put under his feet for by one offering he hath perfected for ever them that are sanctified but perhaps some one might say wherefore did he not put them under at once for the sake of the faithful who should afterwards be brought forth and born whence then does it appear that they shall be put under by the saying he sat down he called to mind again that testimony which saith until i put the enemies under his feet but his enemies are the jews since then he had said till his enemies be put under his feet and they these enemies were vehemently urgent therefore he introduces all his discourse concerning faith after this but who are the enemies all unbelievers the demons and intimating the greatness of their subjection he said not are subjected but are put under his feet let us not therefore be of the number of his enemies for not they alone are enemies the unbelievers and jews but those also who are full of unclean living for the carnal mind is enmity against god for it is not subject to the law of god for neither can it be what then you say this is not a ground of blame nay rather it is very much a ground of blame for the wicked man as long as he is wicked cannot be subject to god's law he can however change and become good let us then cast out carnal minds but what are carnal whatever makes the body flourish and do well but injures the soul as for instance wealth luxury glory all these things are of the flesh carnal love let us not then love gain but ever follow after poverty for this is a great good but you say it makes one humble and of little account true for we have need of this for it benefits us much poverty it is said humbles a man and again christ says blessed are the poor in spirit dost thou then grieve because thou art upon a path leading to virtue dost thou not know that this gives us great confidence but one says the wisdom of the poor man is despised and again another says give me neither riches nor poverty and deliver me from the furnace of poverty and again if riches and poverty are from the lord how can either poverty or riches be an evil why then were these things said they were said under the old covenant where there was much account made of wealth where there was great contempt of poverty where the one was a curse and the other a blessing but now it is no longer so but wilt thou hear the praises of poverty christ sought after it and saith but the son of man hath not where to lay his head and again he said to his disciples provide neither gold nor silver nor two coats and paul in writing said as having nothing and yet possessing all things and peter said to him who was lame from his birth silver and gold have i none yea and under the old covenant itself where wealth was held in admiration who were the admired was not elijah who had nothing save the sheepskin was not elisha was not john let no man then be humiliated on account of his poverty it is not poverty which humiliates but wealth which compels us to have need of many and forces us to be under obligations to many and what could be poorer than jacob tell me who said if the lord give me bread to eat and raiment to put on were elijah and john then wanting in boldness did not the one reprove ahab and the other herod 
the latter said it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother philip's wife and elias said to ahab with boldness it is not that i trouble israel but thou and thy father's house thou seest that this especially produces boldness poverty i mean for while the rich man is a slave being subject to loss and in the power of every one wishing to do him hurt he who has nothing fears not confiscation nor fine so if poverty had made men wanting in boldness christ would not have sent his disciples with poverty to a work requiring great boldness for the poor man is very strong and has nothing wherefrom he may be wronged or evil entreated but the rich man is assailable on every side just in the same way as one would easily catch a man who was dragging many long ropes after him whereas one could not readily lay hold on a naked man so here also it falls out in the case of the rich man slaves gold lands affairs innumerable innumerable cares difficult circumstances necessities make him an easy prey to all let no man then henceforth esteem poverty a cause of disgrace for if virtue be there all the wealth of this world is neither clay nor even a mote in comparison of it this then let us follow after if we would enter into the kingdom of heaven for he saith sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and again it is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven dost thou see that even if we have it not we ought to draw it to us so great a good is poverty for it guides us by the hand as it were on the path which leads to heaven it is an anointing for the combat an exercise great and admirable a tranquil haven but you say i have need of many things and am unwilling to receive a favour from any nevertheless even in this respect the rich man is inferior to thee for thou perhaps askest the favour for thy support but he shamelessly asked for ten thousand things for covetousness sake so that it is the rich that are in need of many persons yea oftentimes those who are unworthy of them for instance they often stand in need of those who are in the rank of soldiers or of slaves but the poor man who has no need even of the emperor himself and if he should need him he is admired because he has brought himself down to this when he might have been rich let no man then accuse poverty as being the cause of innumerable evils nor let him contradict christ who declared it to be the perfection of virtue saying if thou wilt be perfect for this he both uttered in his words and showed by his acts and taught by his disciples let us therefore follow after poverty it is the greatest good to the sober-minded perhaps some of those who hear me avoid it as a thing of ill omen i do not doubt it for this disease is great among most men and such is the tyranny of wealth that they cannot even as far as words endure the renunciation of it but avoid it as of ill omen far be this from the christian soul for nothing is richer than he who chooses poverty of his own accord and with a ready mind how i will tell you and if you please i will prove that he who chooses poverty of his own accord is richer even than the king himself for he indeed needs many things and is in anxiety and fears lest the supplies for the army should fail him but the other has enough of everything and fears about nothing and if he fears it is not about so great matters who then tell me is the rich man he who is daily asking and earnestly labouring to gather much together and fears lest at any time he should fall short or he who gathers nothing together and is in great abundance and hath need of no one for it is virtue and the fear of god and not possessions which give confidence for these even enslave for it is said gifts and presents blind the eyes of the wise and like a muzzle on the mouth turn away reproofs consider how the poor man peter chastised the rich ananias 
was not the one rich and the other poor but behold the one speaking with authority and saying tell me whether ye sold the land for so much and the other sang with submission yea for so much and who you say will grant to me to be as peter it is open to thee to be as peter if thou wilt cast away what thou hast disperse give to the poor follow christ and thou shalt be such as he how he you say wrought miracles is it this then tell me which made peter an object of admiration or the boldness which arose from his manner of life dost thou not hear christ saying rejoice not because the devils are subject unto you if thou wilt be perfect etc hear what peter says silver and gold have i none but what i have i give thee if any man have silver and gold he hath not those other gifts why is it then you say that many have neither the one nor the other because they are not voluntarily poor since they who are voluntarily poor have all good things for although they do not raise up the dead nor the lame yet what is greater than all they have confidence towards god they will hear in that day that blessed voice come ye blessed of my father what can be better than this inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world for i was in hungered and ye gave me meat i was thirsty and ye gave me drink i was a stranger and ye took me in i was naked and ye clothed me i was sick and in prison and ye visited me inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world let us then flee from covetousness that we may attain to the kingdom of heaven let us feed the poor that we may feed christ that we may become fellow heirs with him in christ jesus our lord with whom to the father together with the holy ghost be glory power honour now and for ever and world without end amen and of homily eighteen homily nineteen of homilies on hebrews by st john chrysostom this librivox recording is in the public domain homily nineteen hebrews ten nineteen through twenty three having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of jesus by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh and having an high priest over the house of god let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water let us hold fast the profession of our hope without wavering having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of jesus by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us having shown the difference of the high priest and of the sacrifices and of the tabernacle and of the covenant and of the promise and that the difference is great since those are temporal but these eternal those near to vanishing away these permanent those powerless these perfect those figures these reality for he says not according to the law of a carnal commandment but according to the power of an endless life and thou art a priest for ever behold the continuance of the priest and concerning the covenant that he says is old for that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away but this is new and has remission of sins while that has nothing of the kind for he says the law made nothing perfect and again sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not that is made with hands while this is not made with hands that has the blood of goats this of the lord that has the priest standing this sitting since therefore all those are inferior and these greater therefore he says 
having therefore, brethren, boldness. Boldness, from whence? As since he means produce shame, so the having all things forgiven us, and being made fellow heirs, and enjoying so great love, produces boldness. For the entrance into the holiest. What does he mean here by entrance? Heaven, and the access to spiritual things. Which he hath inaugurated, that is, which he prepared, and which he began. For the beginning of using is thenceforth called the inaugurating which he prepared, he means, and by which he himself passed. A new and living way. Here he expresses the full assurance of hope. New, he says. He is anxious to show that we have all things greater, since now the gates of heaven have been opened, which was not done even for Abraham. A new and living way, he says. For the first was a way of death, leading to Hades, but this of life. And yet he did not say, of life, but called it living, the ordinances, that is, that which abideth. Through the veil, he says, of his flesh. For this flesh first cut that way, by this he inaugurated it the way by which he walked. And with good reason did he call the flesh a veil. For when it was lifted up on high, then the things in heaven appeared. Let us draw near, he says, with a true heart. To what should we draw near? To the holy things, the faith, the spiritual service. With a true heart, in full assurance of faith. Since nothing is seen, neither the priest henceforward, nor the sacrifice, nor the altar. And yet neither was that priest visible, but stood within, and they all without, the whole people. But here not only has this taken place, that the priest has entered into the Holy of Holies, but that we also enter in. Therefore he says, in full assurance of faith, for it is possible for the doubter to believe in one way, as there are even now many who say, that of some there is a resurrection, and of others not. But this is not faith. In full assurance of faith, he says, for we ought to believe as concerning things that we see, nay, even much more. For here it is possible to be deceived in the things that are seen, but there not. Here we trust to the senses, but there to the spirit. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. He shows that not faith only, but a virtuous life also is required, and the consciousness to ourselves of nothing evil. Since the Holy of Holies does not receive with full assurance those who are not thus disposed, for they are holy, and the Holy of Holies, but here no profane person enters. They were sprinkled as to the body, we as to the conscience, so that we may even now be sprinkled over with virtue itself and having our body washed with pure water. Here he speaks of the washing, which no longer cleanses the bodies, but the soul. For he is faithful that promised. That promised what? That we are to depart thither and enter into the kingdom. Be then in nothing over-curious, nor demand reasonings. Our religion needs faith. Verses 24 and 25. And, he says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. And again in other places. The Lord is at hand, be careful for nothing. For now is our salvation nearer, henceforth the time is short. What is not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together? He knew that much strength arises from being together and assembling together. For where two or three, it is said, are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And again, 
that they may be one, as we also are. And they had all one heart and one soul. And not this only, but also because love is increased by the gathering of ourselves together, and love being increased, of necessity the things of God must follow also. And earnest prayer, it is said, was made by the people, as the manner of some is. Here he not only exhorted, but also blamed them. And let us consider one another, he says, to provoke unto love and to good works. He knew that this also arises from gathering together, for as iron sharpeneth iron, so also association increases love. For if a stone rubbed against a stone sends forth fire, how much more soul mingled with soul? But not unto emulation, he says, but unto the sharpening of love. What is unto the sharpening of love? Unto the loving and being loved more, and of good works, so that they might acquire zeal. For if doing has greater force for instruction than speaking, ye also have in your number many teachers, who effect this by their deeds. What is, let us draw near with a true heart? That is, without hypocrisy, for woe be to a fearful heart and faint hands. Let there be, he means, no falsehood among us. Let us not say one thing and think another, for this is falsehood. Neither let us be faint-hearted, for this is not a mark of a true heart. Faint-heartedness comes from not believing. But how shall this be? If we fully assure ourselves through faith. Having our hearts sprinkled. Why did he not say, having been purified? Because he wished to point out the difference of the sprinklings. The one, he says, is of God, the other our own. For the washing and sprinkling the conscience is of God, but the drawing near with truth and in full assurance of faith is our own. Then he also gives strength to their faith from the truth of him that promised. What is, and having our bodies washed with pure water? With water which makes pure, or which has no blood. Then he adds the perfect thing, love not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, which some, he says, do, and divide the assemblies. For a brother helped by a brother is as a strong city. But let us consider one another to provoke unto love. What is, let us consider one another? For instance, if any be virtuous, let us imitate him. Let us look on him so as to love and be loved. For from love good works proceed. For the assembling is a great good, since it makes love more warm, and out of love all good things arise. For nothing is good which is not done through love. This then let us confirm towards one another. For love is the fulfilling of the law. We have no need of labors or of sweatings if we love one another. It is a pathway leading of itself towards virtue. For as on the highway, if any man find the beginning, he is guided by it, and has no need of one to take him by the hand, so is it also in regard to love. Only lay hold on the beginning, and at once thou art guided and directed by it. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, thinketh no evil. Let each man consider with himself how he is disposed toward himself. He does not envy himself, he wishes all good things for himself, he prefers himself before all, he is willing to do all things for himself. If, then, we were so disposed towards others also, all grievous things are brought to an end. There is no enmity, there is no covetousness, for who would choose to overreach himself? No man. But on the contrary, we shall possess all things in common, and shall not cease assembling ourselves together. And if we do this, the remembrance of injuries would have no place. For who would choose to remember injuries against himself? Who would choose to be angry with himself? Do we not make allowances for ourselves most of all? If we were thus disposed towards our neighbors also, there will never be any remembrance of injuries." 
and how is it possible you say that one should so love his neighbour as himself if others had not done this you might well think it impossible but if they have done it it is plain that from indolence it is not done by ourselves and besides christ enjoins nothing impossible seeing that many have even gone beyond his commands who has done this paul peter all the company of the saints nay indeed if i say that they love their neighbours i say no great matter they so loved their enemies as no man would love those who were like-minded with himself for who would choose for the sake of those like-minded to go away into hell when he was about to depart unto a kingdom no man but paul chose this for the sake of his enemies for those who stoned him those who scourged him what pardon then will there be for us what excuse if we shall not show towards our friends even the very smallest portion of that love which paul showed towards his enemies and before him too the blessed moses was willing to be blotted out of god's book for the sake of his enemies who had stoned him david also when he saw those who had stood up against him slain saith i the shepherd have sinned but these what have they done and when saul he had in his hands he would not slay him but saved him and this when he himself would be in danger but if these things were done under the old covenant what excuse shall we have who live under the new and do not attain even to the same measure with them for if unless our righteousness exceed that of the scribes and pharisees we shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven how shall we enter in when we have even less than they love your enemies he says love thou therefore thy enemy for thou art doing good not to him but to thyself how thou art becoming like god he if he be beloved of thee hath no great gain for he is beloved by a fellow-slave but thou if thou love thy fellow-slave hast gained much for thou art becoming like god seest thou that thou art doing a kindness not to him but to thyself for he appoints the prize not for him but for thee what then if he be evil you say so much the greater is the reward even for his wickedness thou oughtest to feel grateful to him even should he be evil after receiving ten thousand kindnesses for if he were not exceedingly evil thy reward would not have been exceedingly increased so that the reason that was sinest for not loving him the saying that he is evil is the very reason for loving him take away the contestant and thou takest away the opportunity for the crowns seest thou not the athletes how they exercise when they have filled the bags with sand but there is no need for thee to practise this life is full of things that exercise thee and make thee strong seest thou not the trees too the more they are shaken by the winds so much the more do they become stronger and firmer we then if we be long-suffering shall also become strong for it is said a man who is long-suffering abounds in wisdom but he that is of a little soul is strongly foolish seest thou how great is his commendation of the one seest thou how great his censure of the other strongly foolish that is to say very foolish let us not then be faint-hearted one towards another for this does not rise from enmity but from having a small soul as if the soul be strong it will endure all things easily and nothing will be able to sink it but will lead it into tranquil havens to which may we all attain by the grace and loving-kindness of our lord jesus christ with whom to the father together with the holy ghost be glory power honour now and for ever and world without end amen End of homily nineteen homily twenty of homilies on hebrews by st john chrysostom this librivox recording is in the public domain homily twenty hebrews ten twenty six and twenty seven 
For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment, and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Trees which have been planted, and have had the advantage of all other care, and the hands and the labors of the cultivator, and yet yield no return for the labors, are pulled up by the roots, and handed over to the fire. So somewhat of this kind takes place also in the case of our illumination. For when Christ has planted us, and we have enjoyed the watering of the Spirit, and then show no fruit, fire, even that of hell, awaits us, and flame unquenchable. Paul, therefore, having exhorted them to love, and to bringing forth the fruit of good works, and having urged them from the kindlier considerations, what are these? That we have an entrance into the Holy of Holies, the new way which he hath inaugurated for us. Does the same again from the more gloomy ones, speaking thus, for having said, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. This being sufficient for consolation, he added, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is need, he means, of good works, yea, very great need. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Thou wast cleansed, thou wast set free from the charges against thee, thou hast become a son. If then thou return to thy former vomit, there await thee on the other hand excommunication and fire and whatever such things there are, for there is no second sacrifice. At this place we are again assailed by those who take away repentance, and by those who delay to come to baptism the one saying that it is not safe for them to come to baptism since there is no second remission, and the other asserting that it is not safe to impart the mysteries to those who have sinned if there is no second remission. What shall we say then to them both? That he does not take away repentance, nor the propitiation through repentance, nor does he thrust away and cast down with despair the fallen, he is not thus an enemy of our salvation, but what? He takes away the second washing, for he did not say, No more is there repentance, or no more is there remission, but no more is there a sacrifice, that is, there is no more a second cross, for this is what he means by sacrifice. For by one sacrifice, he says, he hath perfected for ever them that are sanctified not like the Jewish rites. For this reason he is treated so much throughout concerning the sacrifice, that it is one, even one, not wishing to show this only, that herein it differed from the Jewish rites, but also to make men more steadfast, so that they might no longer expect another sacrifice according to the Jewish law. For, saith he, if we sin willfully, see how he is disposed to pardon, he says, if we sin willfully, so that there is pardon for those who sin not willfully, after the knowledge of the truth, he either means of Christ or of all doctrines. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But what? A certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. By adversaries he means not the unbelievers, but those also who do what is against virtue. Or else he means that the same fire shall receive them of the household also, which receives the adversaries. Then expressing its devouring nature, he says, as if giving it life. Fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. For as a wild beast, when irritated and very fierce and savage, would not rest till it could lay hold on someone and eat him up, so also that fire, like one goaded by indignation, whatever it can lay hold of does not let go, 
but devours and tears it to pieces next he adds also the reason of the threat that it is on good grounds that it is just for this contributes to confidence when we show that it is just for he says verse twenty eight he that hath despised moses law dies without mercy under two or three witnesses without mercy he says so that there is no pardon no pity there although the law is of moses for he ordained the most of it what is under two or three if two or three bore witness he means they immediately suffered punishment if then under the old covenant when the law of moses is set at naught there is so great punishment verse twenty nine of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under foot the son of god and hath counted the blood of the covenant an unholy a common thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace and how does a man tread under foot the son of god when partaking of him in the mysteries he would say he has wrought sin has he not trodden him under foot has he not despised him for just as we make no account of those who are trodden under foot so also they who sin have made no account of christ and so they have sinned thou art become the body of christ and givest thou thyself to the devil so that he treads thee under foot and accounted the blood a common thing he says what is common it is unclean or the having nothing beyond other things and done despite under the spirit of grace for he that accepts not a benefit does despite to the benefactor he made thee a son and thou wishest to become a slave he came to dwell with thee and thou bringest in wicked imaginations to him christ wished to stay with thee and thou treadest him down by surfeiting by drunkenness let us listen whoever partakes of the mysteries unworthily let us listen whoever approach that table unworthily give not he says that which is holy unto the dogs lest in time they trample them under their feet that is lest they despise lest they repudiate them yet he did not say this but what was more fearful than this for he constrains their souls by what is fearful for this also is adapted to convert no less than consolation and at the same time he shows both the difference and the chastisement and sets forth the judgment upon them as though it were an evident matter of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy here also he appears to me to hint at the mysteries next he adds testimony saying verses thirty one and thirty it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living god for it is written vengeance belongeth unto me i will recompense saith the lord and again the lord shall judge his people let us fall it is said into the hands of the lord and not into the hands of men but if ye repent not ye shall fall into the hands of god that is fearful it is nothing to fall into the hands of men when he means we see any man punished here let us not be terrified at the things present but shudder at the things to come for according to his mercy so is his wrath and his indignation will rest upon sinners at the same time too he hints at something else for vengeance belongeth unto me he says i will recompense this is said in regard to their enemies who are doing evil not to those who are suffering evil here he is consoling them too all but saying god abideth for ever and liveth so that even if they receive not their reward now they will receive it hereafter they ought to groan not we for we indeed shall fall into their hands but they into the hands of god 
for neither is it the sufferer who suffers the ill but he that does it nor is it he who receives a benefit that is benefited but the benefactor knowing then these things let us be patient as to suffering evil forward as to kindnesses and this will be if we think lightly of wealth and honour he that hath stripped himself of those affections is of all men most generous and more wealthy even than he who wears the purple seest thou not how many evils come through money i do not say how many through covetousness but merely by our attachment to these things for instance if a man has lost his money he leads a life more wretched than any death why grievest thou o man why weepest thou because god has delivered thee from excessive watching because thou dost not sit trembling and fearful again if any one chain thee to a treasure commanding thee to sit there perpetually and to keep watch for other people's goods thou art grieved thou art disgusted and dost thou after thou hast bound thyself with the most grievous chains grieve when thou art delivered from the slavery truly sorrows and joys are matters of fancy for we guard them as if we had another's now my discourse is for the women a woman often has a garment woven with gold and this she shakes wraps up in linen keeps with care trembles for it and has no enjoyment of it for either she dies or she becomes a widow or even if none of these things happen yet from fear lest wearing it out by continual use she should deprive herself of it she deprives herself of it in another way by sparing it but she passes it on you say to another but neither is this clear and even if she should pass it on the other again will also use it in the same way and if any one will search their houses he will find that the most costly garments and other choice things are tended with special honour as if they were living masters for she does not use them habitually but fears and trembles driving away moths and the other things that are wont to eat them and laying most of them in perfumes and spices nor permitting all persons to be counted worthy of the sight of them but oftentimes carefully putting them in order herself with her husband tell me did not paul with reason call covetousness idolatry for these show as great honour to their garments their gold as they to their idols how long shall we stir up the mire how long shall we be fixed to the clay and the brick-making for as they toiled for the king of the egyptians so do we also toil for the devil and are scourged with far more grievous stripes for by how much the soul surpasses the body by so much does anxiety the wheels of scourging we are scourged every day we are full of fear in anxiety in trembling but if we will groan if we will look up to god he sendeth to us not moses nor aaron but his own word and compunction when this word has come and taken hold of our souls he will free us from the bitter slavery he will bring us forth out of egypt from unprofitable and vain zeal from slavery which brings no gain for they indeed went forth after having at least received golden ornaments the wages for building but we receive nothing and would it were nothing for indeed we also receive not golden ornaments but the evils of egypt sins and chastisements and punishments let us then learn to be made use of let us learn to be spitefully treated this is the part of a christian let us think lightly of golden raiment let us think lightly of money that we may not think lightly of our salvation let us think lightly of money and not think lightly of the soul for this is chastised this is punished those things remain here but the soul departeth yonder why tell me dost thou cut thyself to pieces without perceiving it these things i say to the overreaching and it is well to say also to those who are overreached bear their overreachings generously 
they are ruining themselves not you you indeed they defraud of your money but they strip themselves of the good will and help of god and he that is stripped of that though he clothe himself with the whole wealth of the world is of all men most poor and so he who is the poorest of all if he have this is the wealthiest of all for the lord it is said is my shepherd and i shall lack nothing tell me now if thou hadst had a husband a great and admirable man who thoroughly loved thee and cared for thee and then knewest that he would live always and not die before thee and would give thee all things to enjoy in security as thine own wouldst thou then have wished to possess anything even if thou hadst been stripped of all wouldst thou not have thought thyself the richer for this why then dost thou grieve because thou hast no property but consider that thou hast had the occasion of sin taken away but is it because thou hadst the property and hadst been deprived of it but thou hast acquired the good will of god and how have i acquired it you say he has said wherefore do ye not rather suffer wrong he hath said blessed are they who bear all things with thankfulness consider therefore how great good will thou wilt enjoy if thou showest forth those things by thy works for one thing only is required from us in all things to give thanks to god and then we have all things in abundance i mean for instance hast thou lost ten thousand pounds of gold forthwith give thanks unto god and thou hast acquired ten times ten thousand by that word and thanksgiving for tell me when dost thou account job blessed when he had so many camels and flocks and herds or when he uttered that saying the lord gave the lord hath taken away therefore also the devil causes us losses not that he may take away our goods only for he knows that is nothing but that through them he may compel us to utter some blasphemy so in the case of the blessed job too he did not strive after this only to make him poor but also to make him a blasphemer at any rate when he had stripped him of everything observe what he says to him through his wife say some word against the lord and die and yet o accursed one thou hadst stripped him of everything but he says this is not what i was striving for for i have not yet accomplished that for which i did all i was striving to deprive him of god's help for this cause i deprived him of his goods too this is what i wish that other is nothing if this be not gained he not only has not been injured at all but has even been benefited thou seest that even that wicked demon knows how great is the loss in this matter and see him plotting the treachery through the wife hear this ye husbands as many as have wives that are fond of money and compel you to blaspheme god call job to mind but let us see if it please you his great moderation how he silenced her wherefore he says hast thou spoken as one of the foolish women speaketh of a truth evil communications corrupt good manners at all times indeed but particularly in calamities then they who give evil advice have strength for if the soul is even of itself prone to impatience how much more when there is also an adviser is it not thrust into a pit a wife is a great good as also a great evil for because a wife is a great good observe from what point he satan wishes to break through the strong wall the depriving him of his property he says did not take him the loss has produced no great effect therefore he says if indeed he will curse thee to thy face you see whither he was aspiring if then we bear losses thankfully we shall recover even these things and if we should not recover them our reward will be greater for when he had wrestled nobly then god restored to him these things also when he had shown the devil that it is not for these things that he serves him 
then he restored them also to him for such is he when god sees that we are not riveted to things of this life then he gives them to us when he sees that we set a higher value on things spiritual then he also bestows on us things carnal but not first lest we should break away from the thing spiritual and to spare us he does not give carnal things to keep us away from them even against our will not so you say but if i receive them i am satisfied and am the more thankful it is false o man for then especially wilt thou be thoughtless why then you say does he give them to many whence is it clear that he gives them but who else you say gives their overreaching their plundering how then does he allow these things as he also allows murders thefts and violence what then you will say as to those who receive by succession an inheritance from their fathers being themselves full of evils innumerable and what of this how does god suffer them you say to enjoy these things surely just as he allows thieves and murderers and other evil-doers for it is not now the time of judgment but of the best course of life and what i just now said that i repeat that they shall suffer greater punishment who when they have enjoyed all good things do not even so become better for all shall not be punished alike but they who even after his benefits have continued evil shall suffer a greater punishment while they who after poverty have done this not so and that this is true hear what he says to david did i not give thee all thy master's goods whenever then thou seest a young man that has received a paternal inheritance without labor and continues wicked be assured that his punishment is increased and the vengeance is made more intense let us not then emulate these but if any man has succeeded to virtue if any man has obtained spiritual wealth him let us emulate for it is said woe to them that trust in their riches blessed are they that fear the lord to which of these tell me wouldst thou belong doubtless to those who are pronounced blessed therefore emulate these not the other that thou also may obtain the good things which are laid up for them which may we all obtain in christ jesus our lord with whom to the father be glory together with the holy ghost now and for ever and world without end amen end of homily twenty Homily twenty one of Homilies on Hebrews by St. John Chrysostom. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Homily twenty one Hebrews ten thirty two through thirty four. But call to remembrance the former days, in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used for ye had compassion on those who were in bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods knowing that ye have for yourselves in heaven a better and an enduring substance the best physicians after they have made a deep incision and have increased the pains by the wound soothing the afflicted part and giving rest and refreshment to the disturbed soul proceed not to make a second incision but rather soothe that which has been made with gentle remedies and such as are suited to remove the violence of the pain this paul also did after he had shaken their souls and pierced them with the recollection of hell and convinced then that he must certainly perish who does despite to the grace of god and after he had shown from the laws of moses that they also shall perish and the more fearfully and confirm it by other testimonies and had said it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living god then lest the soul desponding through excessive fear should be swallowed up with grief 
he soothes them by commendations and exhortation and gives them zeal derived from their own conduct for he says call to remembrance the former days in which after ye had been enlightened ye endured a great fight of afflictions powerful is the exhortation from deeds already done for he who begins a work ought to go forward and add to it as if he had said when ye were brought in to the church when ye were in the rank of learners ye displayed so great readiness so great nobleness but now it is no longer so and he who encourages does thus especially encourage them from their own example and he did not simply say ye endured a fight but a great fight moreover he did not say temptations but fight which is an expression of commendation and of very great praise then he also enumerates them particularly amplifying his discourse and multiplying his praise how partly he says whilst ye were made a gazing stock by reproaches and afflictions for reproach is a great thing and calculated to pervert the soul and to darken the judgment for hear what the prophet says while they daily say unto me where is thy god and again if the enemy had reproached me i would have borne it for since the human race is exceedingly vainglorious therefore it is easily overcome by this and he did not simply say by reproaches but that even with great intensity being made a gazing stock for when a person is reproached alone it is indeed painful but far more so when in presence of all for tell me how great the evil was when men who had left the meanness of judaism and gone over as it were to the best course of life and despised the customs of their fathers were ill-treated by their own people and had no help i cannot say he says that ye suffered these things indeed and were grieved but ye even rejoiced exceedingly and this he expressed by saying whilst ye became companions of them that were so used and he brings forward the apostles themselves not only he means were ye not ashamed of your own sufferings but he even shared with others who were suffering the same things this too is the language of one who is encouraging them he said not bear my afflictions share with me but respect your own ye had compassion on them that were in bonds thou seest that he is speaking concerning himself and the rest who were in prison thus he did not account bonds to be bonds but as noble wrestlers so stood ye for not only ye needed no consolation in your own distresses but even became a consolation to others and ye took joyfully the spoiling of your goods oh what full assurance of faith then he also sets forth the motive not only consoling them for their struggles but also that they might not be shaken from the faith when ye saw your property plundered he means ye endured for already ye saw him who is invisible as visible which was the effect of genuine faith and ye showed it forth by your deeds themselves well then the plundering was perhaps from the force of the plunderers and no man could prevent it so that as yet it is not clear that ye endured the plundering for the faith's sake although this too is clear for it was in your power if you chose not to be plundered by not believing but ye did what is far greater than this the enduring such things even with joy which was altogether apostolical and worthy of those noble souls who rejoiced when scourged for it says they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name but he that endures with joy shows that he has some reward and that the affair is no loss but a gain moreover the expression ye took shows their willing endurance because he means ye chose and accepted knowing he says that ye have for yourselves in heaven a better and an enduring substance instead of saying firm not perishing like this 
In the next place, having praised them, he says, Verse 35. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. What meanest thou? He did not say, Ye have cast it away, and recover it, but, which tended more to strengthen them, Ye have it, he says. For to recover again that which has been cast away requires more labor, but not to lose that which is held fast does not but to the Galatians he says the very opposite. My children, of whom I travail in birth again, till Christ be formed in you. And with reason, for they were more supine, whence they needed a sharper word. But these were more faint-hearted, so that they rather needed what was more soothing. Cast not away, therefore, he says, your confidence, so that they were in great confidence toward God, which hath, he says, great recompense of reward. And when shall we receive them, some one might say? Behold, all things on our part have been done. Therefore he anticipated them on their own supposition, saying, in effect, If ye know that ye have in heaven a better substance, seek nothing here. For ye have need of patience, not of any addition to your labors, that ye may continue in the same state, that ye may not cast away what has been put into your hands. Ye need nothing else, but so to stand as ye have stood, that when ye come to the end, ye may receive the promise. Verse 36 For, he says, ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Ye have need of one thing only, to bear with the delay, not that ye should fight again. Ye are at the very crown, he means. Ye have borne all the combats of bonds, of afflictions. Your goods have been spoiled. What then? Henceforward ye are standing to be crowned. Endure this only, the delay of the crown. Oh, the greatness of the consolation! It is as if one should speak to an athlete who had overthrown all, and had no antagonist, and then was to be crowned, and yet endured not that time, during which the president of the games comes, and places the crown upon him, and he, impatient, should wish to go out, and escape as though he could not bear the thirst and the heat. He then also hinting this, what does he say? Verse 37 yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. For lest they should say, And when will he come? He comforts them from the scriptures. For thus also when he says in another place, Now is our salvation nearer. He comforts them, because the remaining time is short. And this he says not of himself, but from the scriptures. But if from that time it was said, Yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. It is plain that now he is nearer. Wherefore also waiting is no small reward. Verse 38 Now the just, he says, shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. This is a great encouragement when one shows that they have succeeded in the whole matter and are losing it through a little indolence. Verse 39 But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Chapter 11, verses 1 and 2 Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Oh, what an expression has he used in saying an evidence of things not seen. For we say there is evidence in the case of things that are very plain. Faith, then, is the seeing things not plain, he means, and brings what are not seen to the same full assurance with what are seen. So then neither is it possible to disbelieve in things which are seen, nor, on the other hand, can there be faith unless a man be more fully assured with respect to things invisible. 
than he is with respect to things that are most clearly seen. For since the objects of hope seem to be unsubstantial, faith gives them substantiality, or rather does not give it, but is itself their substance. For instance, the resurrection has not come, nor does it exist substantially, but hope makes it substantial in our soul. This is the meaning of the substance of things. If, therefore, it is an evidence of things not seen, why, forsooth, do you wish to see them, so as to fall away from faith and from being just? Since the just shall live by faith, whereas ye, if ye wish to see these things, are no longer faithful. Ye have labored, he says, ye have struggled. I too allow this. Nevertheless, wait, for this is faith. Do not seek the whole here. These things were indeed said to the Hebrews, but they are a general exhortation also to the many of those who are here assembled. How and in what way? To the faint-hearted, to the mean-spirited. For when they see the wicked prospering, and themselves faring ill, they are troubled, they bear it impatiently, while they long for the chastisement and the inflicting vengeance on others, while they wait for the rewards of their own sufferings. For yet a little time, and he that shall come will come. Let us then say this to the slothful. Doubtless there will be punishment. Doubtless he will come. Henceforth the events of the resurrection are even at the doors. Whence does that appear, you say? I do not say, from the prophets. For neither do I now speak to Christians only. But even if a heathen be here, I am perfectly confident, and bring forward my proofs, and will instruct him. How, you say? Christ foretold many things. If those former things did not come to pass, then do not believe them. But if they all came to pass, why doubt concerning those that remain? And indeed it were very unreasonable, nothing have come to pass, to believe the one, or when all has come to pass, to disbelieve the others. But I will make the matter more plain by an example. Christ said, that Jerusalem should be taken, and should be so taken as no city ever was before, and that it should never be raised up. And, in fact, this prediction came to pass. He said that there should be great tribulation, and it came to pass. He said that a grain of mustard seed is sown, so should the preaching of the gospel be extended. And every day we see this running over the world. He said that they who left father or mother, or brethren or sisters, should have both fathers and mothers, and this we see fulfilled by facts. He said, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. That is, no man shall get the better of you. And this we see by the events has come to pass. He said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, even though persecuted, and that no one shall quench the preaching of the gospel. And the experience of events bears witness to this prediction also. And yet when he said these things, it was very hard to believe him. Why? Because all these were words, and he had not as yet given proof of the things spoken, so that they have now become far more credible. He said that, when the gospel should have been preached among all the nations, then the end shall come. Lo, now ye have arrived at the end, for the greater part of the world hath been preached to, therefore the end is now at hand. Let us tremble, beloved. But what, tell me? Art thou anxious about the end? It indeed is itself near, but each man's life and death is nearer. For it is said, the days of our years are seventy years, but if one be in strength, fourscore years. The day of judgment is near, let us fear. A brother doth not redeem, shall man redeem? There we shall repent much, but in death no man shall praise him. 
wherefore he saith, Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. That is, his coming. For here, in this life indeed, whatever we do has efficacy, but there no longer. Tell me, if a man placed us for a little while in a flaming furnace, should we not submit to anything in order to escape, even if it were necessary to part with our money, nay, to undergo slavery? How many have fallen into grievous diseases, and would gladly give up all to be delivered from them, if the choice were offered them? If in this world, then, a disease of short duration so afflicts us, what shall we do yonder, when repentance will be of no avail? Of how many evils are we now full, without being conscious of them? We bite one another, we devour one another, in wronging, accusing, calumniating, being vexed by the credit of our neighbors. And see the difficulty. When a man wishes to undermine the reputation of a neighbor, he says, such an one said this of him, O oh God, forgive me, do not examine me strictly, I must give account of what I have heard. Why then dost thou speak of it at all, if thou dost not believe it? Why dost thou speak of it? Why dost thou make it credible by much reporting? Why dost thou pass on the story which is not true? Thou dost not believe it, and that entreatest God not to call thee to strict account? Do not say it, then, but keep silence, and free thyself from all fear. But I know not from whence this disease has fallen upon men. We have become tattlers, nothing remains in our mind. Hear the exhortation of a wise man who says, Hast thou heard a word? Let it die in thee. Be bold, it will not burst thee. And again, a fool heareth a word, and travaileth as a woman in labor of a child. We are ready to make accusations, prepared for condemning. Even if no other evil thing had been done by us, this were sufficient to ruin us, and to carry us away to hell. This involves us in ten thousand evils. And that thou mayest know this certainly, hear what the prophet says. Thou sattest and spakest against thy brother. But it is not I, you say, but the other who told me. Nay, rather, it is thyself. For if thou hadst not spoken, another would not have heard. Or even if he should have heard it, yet thou wouldst not have been to blame for the sin. We ought to shade over and conceal the failings of neighbors, but thou paradest them under a cloak of zeal for goodness. Thou becomest not an accuser, but a gossip, a trifler, a fool. Oh, what cleverness! Without being aware of it, thou bringest disgrace upon thyself as well as on him. And see what great evils which arise from this. Thou provokest the wrath of God. Dost thou not hear Paul saying about widows? They not only, these are his words, learn to be idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, wandering about from house to house, and speaking things which they ought not. So that even when thou believest the things which are said against thy brother, thou oughtest not even in that case to speak of them, much less when thou dost not believe them. But thou, forsooth, lookest to thine own interest? Thou fearest to be called to account by God? Fear then, lest even for thy tattling thou be called to account. For here thou canst not say, O God, call me not to account for light talking. For the whole matter is light talking. Why didst thou publish it? Why didst thou increase the evil? This is sufficient to destroy us. On this account Christ said, Judge not, that ye be not judged. But we pay no regard to this, neither are we brought to our senses by what happened to the Pharisee. He said what was true, I am not as this publican. He said it too in no man's hearing, yet was he condemned. If he were condemned when he said what was true, and uttered it in no man's hearing, what fearful punishment shall not they suffer, who, like gossiping women, carry about everywhere lies which they do not even themselves believe? What shall they not endure? 
henceforward let us set a door and a bolt before the mouth for innumerable evils have arisen from tattling families have been ruined friendships torn asunder innumerable other miseries have happened busy not thyself o man about the affairs of thy neighbour but thou art talkative and hast a weakness talk of thine own faults to god thus the weakness will be no longer a weakness but an advantage talk of thy own faults to thy friends those who are thorough friends and righteous men and in whom thou hast confidence that so they may pray for thy sins if thou speak of the sins of others thou art nowise profited neither hast thou gained anything but hast ruined thyself if thou confessest thine own sins to the lord thou hast great reward for one says i said i will confess against myself mine iniquity to the lord and thou forgavest the impiety of my heart dost thou wish to judge judge thine own sins no one will accuse thee if thou condemn thyself but he will accuse if thou do not condemn he will accuse thee unless thou convict thyself will accuse thee of insensibility thou hast seen such an one angry irritated doing something else out of place think at once even thou on thine own faults and thus thou wilt not greatly condemn him and wilt free thyself from the load of thy past transgressions if we thus regulate our own conduct if we thus manage our own life if we condemn ourselves we shall probably not commit many sins and we shall do many good things being fair and moderate and shall enjoy all the promises to them that love god to which may all attain by the grace and loving kindness of our lord jesus christ with whom to the father together with the holy ghost be glory power honour now and for ever and world without end amen End of homily twenty one Homily twenty two of Homilies on Hebrews by St. John Chrysostom. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Homily twenty two Hebrews eleven three and four. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Faith needs a generous and vigorous soul, and one rising above all things of sense, and passing beyond the weakness of human reasonings, for it is not possible to become a believer otherwise than by raising oneself above the common customs of the world inasmuch then as the souls of the hebrews were thoroughly weakened and though they had begun from faith yet from circumstances i mean sufferings afflictions they had afterwards become faint-hearted and of little spirit and were shaken from their position he encouraged them first indeed from these very things saying call to remembrance the former days next from the scripture saying but the just shall live by faith afterwards from arguments saying but faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen and now again from their forefathers those great and admirable men as much as saying if where the good things were close at hand all were saved by faith much more are we for when a soul finds one that shares the same sufferings with itself it is refreshed and recovers breath this we may see both in the case of faith and in the case of affliction that there may be comfort for you it is said through our mutual faith for mankind are very distrustful and cannot place confidence in themselves are fearful about whatever things they think they possess and have great regard for the opinion of the many what then does paul do he encourages them by the fathers and before that by the common notions of mankind for tell me he says 
since faith is calumniated as being a thing without demonstration and rather a matter of deceit therefore he shows that the greatest things are attained through faith and not through reasonings and how does he show this tell me it is manifest he saith that god made the things which are out of things which are not things which appear out of things which appear not things which subsist out of things which subsist not but whence is it shown that he did this even by a word for reason suggests nothing of this kind but on the contrary that the things which appear are formed out of things which appear therefore the philosophers expressly say that nothing comes out of things that are not being sensual and trusting nothing to faith and yet these same men when they happen to say anything great and noble are caught in trusting it to faith for instance that god is without beginning and unborn for reason does not suggest this but the contrary and consider i beseech you their great folly they say that god is without beginning and yet this is far more wonderful than the creation out of things that are not for to say that he is without beginning that he is unborn neither begotten by himself nor by another is more full of difficulties than to say that god made the things which are out of things which are not for here there are many things uncertain as that some one made it that what was made had a beginning that in a word it was made but in the other case what he is self-existing unborn he neither had beginning nor time tell me do not these things require faith but he did not assert this which was far greater but the lesser whence does it appear he would say that god made these things reason does not suggest it no one was present when it was done whence is it shown it is plainly the result of faith through faith we understand that the worlds were made why through faith because the things that are seen were not made of things which do appear for this is faith having thus stated the general principle he afterwards tested by individuals for a man of note is equivalent to the world this at all events he afterwards hinted for when he had matched it against one or two hundred persons and then saw the smallness of the number he afterwards says by whom the world was outweighed in worth and observe whom he puts first him who was ill-treated and that by a brother it was their own affliction for you also he says have suffered like things of your own countrymen and by a brother who had been nothing wronged but who envied him on god's account showing that they also are looked on with an evil eye and envied he honoured god and died because he honoured him and has not yet attained to a resurrection but his readiness is manifest and his part has been done but god's part has not yet been carried out towards him and by a more excellent sacrifice in this place he means that which is more honourable more splendid more necessary and we cannot say he says that it was not accepted he did accept it and said unto cain hast thou not sinned if thou rightly offer but dost not rightly divide so then abel both rightly offered and rightly divided nevertheless for this what recompense did he receive he was slain by his brother's hand and that sentence which his father endured on account of sin this he first received who was upright and he suffered so much the more grievously because it was from a brother and he was the first to suffer and he did these things rightly looking to no man for to whom could he look when he so honoured god to his father and his mother but they had outraged him in return for his benefits to his brother then but he also had dishonoured god so that by himself he sought out what was good and he that is worthy of so great honour what does he suffer he is put to death and how too was he otherwise testified of that he was righteous 
it is said that fire came down and consumed the sacrifices for instead of and the lord had respect to abel and to his sacrifices the syriac said and he set them on fire he therefore who both by word and deed bear witness to the righteous man and sees him slain for his sake did not avenge him but left him to suffer but your case is not much for how could it be you who have both prophets and examples and encouragements innumerable and signs and miracles accomplished hence that was faith indeed for what miracles did he see that he might believe he should have any recompense of good things did he not choose virtue from faith alone what is and by it he being dead yet speaketh that he might not cast them into great despondency he shows that he has in part obtained a recompense how the influence coming from him is great he means and he yet speaketh that is cain slew him but he did not with him slay his glory and memory he is not dead therefore neither shall ye die for by how much the more grievous a man's sufferings are so much the greater is his glory how does he yet speak this is a sign both of his being alive and of his being by all celebrated admired counted blessed for he who encourages others to be righteous speaks for no speech avails so much as that man's suffering as then heaven by its mere appearance speaks so also does he by being had in remembrance not if he had made proclamation of himself not if he had ten thousand tongues and were alive would he have been so admired as now that is these things do not take place with impunity nor lightly neither do they pass away verse five by faith enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because god had translated him this man displayed greater faith than abel how you ask because although he came after him yet what befell abel was sufficient to guide him back how god for it knew that abel would be killed for he said to cain thou hast sinned do not add thereto honoured by him he did not protect him and yet neither did this throw him enoch into indifference he said not to himself what need of toils and dangers abel honoured god yet he did not protect him for what advantage had he that was departed from the punishment of his brother and what benefit could he reap therefrom let us allow that he suffers severe punishment what is that to him who has been slain he neither said nor thought anything of this kind but passing beyond all these things he knew that if there is a god certainly there is a rewarder also although as yet they knew nothing of the resurrection but if they who as yet know nothing of a resurrection and see contradictory things here thus pleased god how much more should we for they neither knew of a resurrection nor had they any examples to look to this same thing then made enoch well pleasing to god namely that he received nothing for he knew that god is a rewarder whence knew he this for he recompensed abel do you say so that reason suggested other things but faith the opposite of what was seen even then he would say if you see that you receive nothing here be not troubled how was it by faith that enoch was translated because his pleasing god was the cause of his translation and faith the cause of his pleasing him for if he had not known that he should receive a reward how could he have pleased him but without faith it is impossible to please him how if a man believe that there is a god and a retribution he will have the reward whence then is the well-pleasing it is necessary to believe that he is not what he is if that he is needs faith and not reasonings it is impossible to comprehend by reasoning what he is if that he is a rewarder needs faith and not reasonings how is it possible by reasoning to compass his essence 
for what reasoning can reach this for some persons say that the things that exist are self-caused seest thou that unless we have faith in regard to all things not only in regard to retribution but also in regard to the very being of god all is lost to us but many ask whither enoch was translated and why he was translated and why he did not die neither he nor elijah and if they are still alive how they live and in what form but to ask these things is superfluous for that the one was translated and that the other was taken up the scriptures have said but where they are and how they are they have not added for they see nothing more than is necessary for this indeed took place i mean his translation immediately at the beginning the human soul thereby receiving a hope of the destruction of death and of the overthrow of the devil's tyranny and that death will be done away for he was translated not dead but that he should not see death therefore he added he was translated alive because he was well pleasing unto god for just as a father when he has threatened his son wishes indeed immediately after he has threatened to relax his threat but endures and continues resolute that for a time he may chasten and correct him allowing the threat to remain firm so also god to speak as it were after the manner of men did not continue resolute but immediately showed that death is done away and first he allows death to happen wishing to terrify the father through the son for wishing to show that the sentence is verily fixed he subjected to this punishment not wicked men at once but even him who was well pleasing i mean the blessed abel and almost immediately after him he translated enoch moreover he did not raise the former lest they should immediately grow bold but he translated the other being yet alive having excited fear by abel but by this latter giving zeal to be well pleasing unto him wherefore they who say that all things are ruled and governed of themselves and do not expect a reward are not well pleasing as neither are the heathen for he becomes a rewarder of them that diligently seek him by works and by knowledge since then we have a rewarder let us do all things that we may not be deprived of the rewards of virtue for indeed the neglecting such a recompense the scorning such a reward is worthy of many tears for as to those who diligently seek him he is a rewarder so to those who seek him not the contrary seek he says and ye shall find but how can we find the lord consider how gold is found with much labour i sought the lord with my hands it is said by night before him and i was not deceived that is just as we seek what is lost so let us seek god do we not concentrate our mind thereon do we not inquire of every one do we not travel from home do we not promise money for instance suppose that any among us has lost his son what do we not do what land what sea do we not make the circuit of do we not reckon money and houses and everything else as secondary to the finding him and should we find him we cling to him we hold him fast we do not let him go and when we are going to seek anything whatever we busy ourselves in all ways to find what is sought how much more ought we to do this in regard to god as seeking what is indispensable nay rather not in the same way but much more but since we are weak at least seek god as thou seekest thy money or thy son wilt thou not leave thy home for him hast thou never left thy home for money dost thou not busy thyself in all ways when thou hast found it art thou not full of confidence seek he says and ye shall find for things sought after need much care especially in regard of god for many are the hindrances many the things that darken many that impede our perception for as the sun is manifest and set forth publicly before all and we have no need to seek it 
but if on the other hand we bury ourselves and turn everything upside down we need much labour to look at the sun so truly here also if we bury ourselves in the depth of evil desires in the darkness of passions and of the affairs of this life with difficulty do we look up with difficulty do we raise our heads with difficulty do we see clearly he that is buried underground in whatever degree he sees upwards in that degree does he come towards the sun let us therefore shake off the earth let us break through the mist which lies upon us it is thick and close and does not allow us to see clearly and how you say is this cloud broken through if we draw to ourselves the beams of the sun of righteousness the lifting up of my hands it is said is an evening sacrifice with our hands let us also lift up our mind you who have been initiated know what i mean perhaps too you recognize the expression and see at a glance what i have hinted at let us raise up our thoughts on high i myself know many men almost suspended apart from the earth and beyond measure stretching up their hands and out of heart because it is not possible to be lifted into the air and thus praying with earnestness thus i would have you always and if not always at least very often and if not very often at least now and then at least in the morning at least in the evening prayers for tell me canst thou not stretch forth the hands stretch forth the will stretch forth as far as thou wilt yea even to heaven itself even shouldst thou wish to touch the very summit even if thou wouldst descend higher and walk thereon it is open to thee for our mind is lighter and higher than any winged creature and when it receives grace from the spirit oh how swift is it how quick is it how does it compass all things how does it never sink down or fall to the ground these wings let us provide for ourselves by means of them shall we be able to fly even across the tempestuous sea of this present life the swiftest birds fly unheard over mountains and woods and seas and rocks in a brief moment of time such also is the mind when it is winged when it is separated from the things of this life nothing can lay hold of it it is higher than all things even than the fiery darts of the devil the devil is not so good a marksman as to be able to reach this height he sends forth his darts indeed for he is void of all shame yet he does not hit the mark the dart returns to him without effect and not without effect only but it falls upon his own head for what is sent forth by him must of necessity strike something as then that which has been shot out by men either strikes the person against whom it is directed or pierces bird or fence or garment or wood or the mere air so does the dart of the devil also it must of necessity strike and if it strike not him that it is shot at it necessarily strikes him that shoots it and we may learn from many instances that when we are not hit without doubt he is hit himself for instance he plotted against job he did not hit him but was struck himself he plotted against paul he did not hit him but was struck himself if we watch we may see this happening everywhere for even when he strikes he is hit and much more than when he does not hit let us turn his weapons then against himself and having armed and fortified ourselves with the shield of faith let us keep guard with steadfastness so as to be impregnable now the dart of the devil is evil concupiscence anger especially is a fire a flame it catches destroys consumes let us quench it by long suffering by forbearance for as red-hot iron dipped into water loses its fire so an angry man filling in with a patient one does no harm to the patient man but rather benefits him and is himself more thoroughly subdued for nothing is equal to long-suffering such a man is never insulted but as bodies of adamant are not wounded so neither are such souls for they are above the reach of the darts the long-suffering man is high 
and so high as not to receive a wound from the shot. When one is furious, laugh, but do not laugh openly, lest that irritate him, but laugh mentally on his account. For in the case of children, when they strike us passionately, as though forsooth they were avenging themselves, we laugh. If then thou laugh, there will be as great difference between thee and him, as between a child and a man. But if thou art furious, thou hast made thyself a child. For the angry are more senseless than children. If one look at a furious child, does he not laugh at him? The poor spirited, it is said, is mightily simple. The simple then is a child, and he who is long-suffering, it is said, is abundant in wisdom. This abundant wisdom, then, let us follow after, that we may attain to the good things promised us in Christ Jesus our Lord, with whom to the Father, together with the Holy Ghost, be glory, power, honor, now and for ever, and world without end. Amen. End of Homily 22Homily 23 of Homilies on Hebrews by St. John Chrysostom. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Homily 23. Hebrews 11, 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith, he says, Noah being warned of God. As the Son of God, speaking of his own coming, said, In the days of Noah they married and were given in marriage. Therefore the apostle also recalled to their mind an appropriate image. For the example of Enoch was an example only of faith, that of Noah, on the other hand, of unbelief also. And this is a complete consolation and exhortation, when not only believers are found approved, but also unbelievers suffer the opposite. For what does he say? By faith being warned of God. What is being warned of God? It is, it having been foretold to him. But why is the expression divine communication used? For in another place also it is said, and it was communicated to him by the Spirit. And again, and what saith the divine communication? Seest thou the equal dignity of the Spirit? For as God reveals, so also does the Holy Spirit. But why did he speak thus? The prophecy is called a divine communication. Of things not seen as yet, he says, that is, of the rain. Moved with fear, prepared an ark. Reason indeed suggested nothing of this sort, for they were marrying and being given in marriage. The air was clear, there were no signs of change, but nevertheless he feared. By faith, he says, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. How is it, by the which he condemned the world? He showed them to be worthy of punishment, since they were not brought to their senses even by the preparation and he became, he says, heir of the righteousness which is by faith. That is, by his believing God, he was shown to be righteous, for this is the part of a soul sincerely disposed towards him, and judging nothing more reliable than his words, just as unbelief is the very contrary. Faith, it is manifest, works righteousness. For as we have been warned of God respecting hell, so was he also and yet at that time he was laughed at he was reviled and ridiculed but he regarded none of these things verses eight and nine by faith abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. By faith, for tell me, whom did he see to emulate? He had for a father a Gentile, and an idolater. 
he had heard no prophets he knew not whither he was going for as they of the hebrews who believed looked to these patriarchs as having enjoyed blessings innumerable he shows that none of them obtained anything as yet all were unrewarded no one as yet received his reward he escaped from his country and his home and went out not knowing whither he went and what marvel if he himself were so when his seed also dwelt in this same way for seeing the promise disproved since he had said to thee will i give this land and to thy seed he saw his son dwelling there and again his grandson saw himself dwelling in the land not yet his own yet he was nowise troubled for the affairs of abraham happened as we might have expected since the promise was to be accomplished afterwards in his family although it is said even to himself to thee and to thy seed not to thee through thy seed but to thee and to thy seed still neither he nor isaac nor jacob enjoyed the promise for one of them served for hire and the other was driven out and he himself even was failing through fear and while he took some things indeed in war others unless he had had the aid of god would have been destroyed on this account the apostle says with the heirs of the same promise not himself alone he means but the heirs also verse thirteen these all died in faith he says not having obtained the promises at this place it is worth while to make two inquiries how after saying that god translated enoch and he was not found so that he did not see death does he say these all died in faith and again after saying they not having obtained the promises he declares that noah had received a reward to the saving of his house and that enoch had been translated and that abel yet speaks and that abraham had gained a hold on the land and yet he says these all died in faith not having obtained the promises what then is meant it is necessary to solve the first difficulty and then the second these all he says died in faith the word all is used here not because all had died but because with that one exception all these had died whom we know to be dead and the statement not having obtained the promises is true for surely the promise to noah was not to be this which is here spoken of but further of what kind of promises is he speaking for isaac and jacob received the promises of the land but as to noah and abel and enoch what kind of promises did they receive either then he is speaking concerning these three or if concerning those others also the promise was not this that abel should be admired nor that enoch should be translated nor that noah should be preserved but these things came to them for their virtue's sake and were a sort of foretaste of things to come for god from the beginning knowing that the human race needs much condescension bestows on us not only the things in the world to come but also those here as for instance christ said even to the disciples whosoever hath left houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life and again seek ye the kingdom of god and all these things shall be added unto you seest thou that these things are given by him in the way of addition that we might not faint for as the athletes have the benefit of careful attention even when engaged in the combat but do not then enjoy entire ease living under rules yet afterwards they enjoy it entire so god also does not grant us here to partake of entire ease for even here does he give some but having seen them afar off he says and embraced them here he hints at something mystical that they received beforehand all the things which have been spoken concerning things to come concerning the resurrection concerning the kingdom of heaven concerning the other things which christ proclaimed when he came 
for these are the promises of which he speaks either then he means this or that they did not indeed receive them but died in confidence respecting them and were thus confident through faith only having seen them afar off four generations before for after so many generations they went up out of egypt and embraced them saith he and were glad they were so persuaded of them as even to embrace or salute them from the metaphor of persons on shipboard seeing from afar the longed-for cities which before they enter them they take and occupy by words of greeting verse ten for they looked he says for the city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is god seest thou that they received them in this sense in their already accepting them and been confident respecting them if then to be confident is to receive it is in your power also to receive for these although they enjoyed not those blessings yet still saw them by their longing desire why now do these things happen that we might be put to shame in that they indeed when things on earth were promised them regarded them not but sought the future city whereas god again and again speaks to us of the city which is above and yet we seek that which is here he said to them i will give you the things of the present world but when he saw or rather when they showed themselves worthy of greater things then he no longer suffers them to receive these but those greater ones wishing to show us that they are worthy of greater things being unwilling to be bound to these as if one should promise playthings to an intelligent child not that he might receive them but by way of exhibiting his philosophy when he asks for things more important for this is to show that they held off from the land with so great earnestness that they did not even accept what was given wherefore their posterity received it on this account for themselves were worthy of the land what is the city which hath foundations for are not these which are visible foundations in comparison of the other they are not whose builder and maker is god oh what an encomium on that city verse eleven by faith also sarah herself he says here he began speaking in a way to put them to shame in case that is they should show themselves more faint-hearted than a woman but possibly some one might say how by faith when she laughed nay while her laughter indeed was from unbelief her fear was from faith for to say i laughed not arose from faith from this then it appears that when unbelief had been cleared out faith came in its place by faith also sarah received strength to conceive seed even when she was past age what is to conceive seed she who was become dead who was barren received power for the retaining of seed for conception for her imperfection was twofold first from her time of life for she was really old secondly from nature for she was barren verse twelve wherefore even from one they all sprang as the stars of the sky and as the sand which is by the seashore wherefore he says even from one they all sprang here he not only says that she bare a child but that she also became mother of so many as not even fruitful wombs are mothers of as the stars he says how then is it that he often numbers them although he said as the stars of the heaven shall not be numbered so neither shall your seed he either means the excess or else speaks of those who are continually being born for is it possible tell me to number their forefathers of one family as such and one son of such and one and such and one son of such and one but here such are the promises of god so skilfully arranged are his undertakings but if the things which he promised as additional are so admirable so beyond expectation so magnificent what will those be to which these are in addition 
to which these are somewhat over and above what then can be more blessed than they who attain them what more wretched than those who miss them for if a man when driven out from his native country is pitied by all and when he has lost an inheritance is considered by all as an object of compassion with what tears ought he to be bewailed who fails of heaven and of the good things there stored up or rather he is not even to be wept for for one is wept for when he suffers something of which he is not himself the cause but when of his own choice he has entangled himself in evil he is not worthy of tears but of wailings or rather than of mourning since even our lord jesus christ mourned and wept for jerusalem impious as it was truly we are worthy of weepings innumerable of wailings innumerable if the whole world should receive a voice both stones and wood and trees and wild beasts and birds and fishes and in a word the whole world if receiving a voice it should bewail us who have failed of those good things it would not bewail and lament enough for what language what intellect can represent that blessedness and virtue that pleasure that glory that happiness that splendour what eye hath not seen and ear hath not heard and what hath not entered into the heart of man he did not say that they simply surpass what we imagine but none hath ever conceived the things which god hath prepared for them that love him for of what kind are those good things likely to be of which god is the preparer and establisher for if he immediately after he had made us when we had not yet done anything he freely bestowed so great favours paradise familiar intercourse with himself promised us immortality a life happy and freed from cares what will he not bestow on those who have laboured and struggled so greatly and endured on his behalf for us he spared not his only begotten for us when we were enemies he gave up his own son to death of what will he not count us worthy having become his friends what will he not impart to us having reconciled us to himself he both is abundantly and infinitely rich and he desires and earnestly endeavours to obtain our friendship we do not thus earnestly endeavour what am i saying do not earnestly endeavour we do not wish to obtain the good things as he wishes it and what he has done shows that he wishes it more than we for while for our own sake we with difficulty think lightly of a little gold he for our sake gave even the son who was his own let us make use of the love of god as we ought let us reap the fruits of his friendship for ye are my friends he says if ye do what i say to you how wonderful his enemies who were at an infinite distance from him whom in all respects he excels by an incomparable superiority these he has made his friends and calls them friends what then should not one choose to suffer for the sake of this friendship for the friendship of men we often incur danger but for that of god we do not even give up money our condition does indeed call for mourning for mourning and tears and wailings and loud lamentation and beating of the breast we have fallen from our hope we are humbled from our high estate we have shown ourselves unworthy of the honour of god even after his benefits we are become unfeeling and ungrateful the devil has stripped us of all our good things we who were counted worthy to be sons we his brethren and fellow heirs are come to differ nothing from his enemies that insult him henceforward what consolation shall there be for us he called us to heaven and we have thrust ourselves down to hell swearing and lying and stealing and adultery are poured out upon the earth some mingled blood upon blood and others do deeds worse than bloodshedding 
many of those that are wronged many of those that are defrauded prefer ten thousand deaths to the suffering such things and except they had feared god would even have killed themselves being so murderously disposed against themselves are not these things then worse than bloodshedding woe is me my soul for the godly man is perished from the earth and there is none upright among men let us also now cry out first about our own selves but aid me in my lamentation perhaps some are even disgusted and laugh for this very cause ought we to make our lamentations the more intense because we are so mad and beside ourselves that we do not know that we are mad but laugh at things for which we ought to groan o oh man there is wrath revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men god will come manifestly a fire will burn before him and round about him will be a mighty tempest a fire will burn before him and consume his enemies on every side the day of the lord is as a burning oven and no man lays up these things in his mind but these tremendous and fearful doctrines are more despised than fables and are trodden under foot he that heareth there is no one while they who laugh and make sport are all what resource will there be for us whence shall we find safety we are undone we are utterly consumed we are become the laughing-stock of our enemies and a mockery for the heathen and the demons now is the devil greatly elated he glories and is glad the angels to whom we had been entrusted are all ashamed and in sadness there is no man to convert you all means have been used by us in vain and we seem to you as idle talkers it is seasonable even now to call on the heaven because there is no man that heareth to take to witness the elements hear o heaven and give ear o earth for the lord hath spoken give a hand stretch it forth o ye who have not yet been overwhelmed to them who are undone through their drunkenness ye that are whole to them that are sick ye that are sober-minded to them that are mad that are giddily whirling round let no man i beseech you prefer the favour of his friend to his salvation and let violence and rebuke look to one thing only his benefit when one has been seized by a fever even slaves lay hold of their masters for when that is pressing on him throwing his mind into confusion and a swarm of slaves are standing by they recognize not the law of the master and servant in the calamity of the master let us collect ourselves i exhort you there are daily wars submergence of towns destructions innumerable all around us and on every side the wrath of god is enclosing us as in a net and we as though we were well pleasing to him are in security we all make our hands ready for unjust gains none for helping others all for plundering none for protecting each one is in earnest as to how he shall increase his possessions no one as to how he shall aid the needy each one has much anxiety how he may add to his wealth no one how he may save his soul one fear possesses all lest you say we should become poor no man is in anguish and trembling lest we should fall into hell these things call for lamentations these call for accusation these call for reprobation but i do not wish to speak of these things but i am constrained by my grief forgive me i am forced by sorrow to utter many things even those which i do not wish i see that our wound is grievous that our calamity is beyond comfort that woes have overtaken us greater than the consolation we are undone oh that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears that i might lament let us weep beloved let us weep let us groan 
possibly there may be some here who say he talks to us of nothing but lamentation nothing but tears it was not my wish believe me it was not my wish but rather to go through a course of commendations and praises but now it is not the season for these beloved it is not lamenting which is grievous but the doing things which cause for lamentations sorrow is not the thing to shrink from but the committing things that call for sorrow do not thou be punished and i will not mourn do not die and i will not weep if the body indeed lies dead thou callest on all to grieve with thee and thinkest those without sympathy who do not mourn and when the soul is perishing dost thou tell us not to mourn but i cannot be a father if i do not weep i am a father full of affection hear how paul exclaims my little children of whom i travail in birth again what mother in childbirth utters cries so bitter as he would that it were possible for thee to see the very fire that is in my heart and thou wouldest know that i burn with grief more intense than any woman or gift that suffers untimely widowhood she does not so mourn over her husband nor any father over his son as i do over this multitude that is here with us i see no progress everything turns to calumnies and accusations no man makes it his business to please god but he says let us speak evil of such an one or such an one such an one is unfit to be among the clergy such an one does not lead a respectable life when we ought to be grieving for our own evils we judge others whereas we ought not to do this even when we are pure from sins for who maketh thee to differ he says and what hast thou which thou didst not receive but if thou hast received it why dost thou glory as though thou hadst not received it and thou why dost thou judge thy brother being thyself full of innumerable evils when thou saidest such an one is a bad man and a spendthrift and vicious think of thyself and examine strictly thy own condition and thou wilt repent of what thou hast said for there is no no not any such powerful stimulus to virtue as the recollecting of our sins if we turn over these two things in our minds we shall be enabled to attain the promised blessings we shall be enabled to cleanse ourselves and wipe away what is amiss only let us take serious thought some time let us be anxious about the matter beloved let us grieve here in reflection that we may not grieve yonder in punishment but may enjoy the everlasting blessings where pain and sorrow and sighing are fled away that we may attain to the good things which surpass man's understanding in christ jesus our lord for to him is glory and power for ever and ever amen end of homily twenty three Homily twenty four of Homilies on Hebrews by St. John Chrysostom. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Homily twenty four. Hebrews eleven thirteen through sixteen. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country and truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out they might have had opportunity to have returned but now they desire a better country that is an heavenly wherefore god is not ashamed to be called their god for he hath prepared for them a city the first virtue yea the whole of virtue is to be a stranger to this world and a sojourner and to have nothing in common with things here but to hang loose from them as from things strange to us as those blessed disciples did of whom he said they wandered about in sheepskins and in goatskins being destitute afflicted tormented 
of whom the world was not worthy. They called themselves therefore strangers, but Paul said somewhat much beyond this, for not merely did he call himself a stranger, but said that he was dead to the world, and that the world was dead to him. For the world, he says, has been crucified to me, and I to the world. But we, both citizens and quite alive, busy ourselves about everything here as citizens, and what righteous men were to the world, strangers and dead, that we are to heaven. And what they were to heaven, alive and acting as citizens, that we are to the world. Wherefore we are dead, because we have refused that which is truly life, and have chosen this which is but for a time. Wherefore we have provoked God to wrath, because when the enjoyments of heaven have been set before us, we are not willing to be separated from the things on earth, but, like worms, we turn about from the earth to the earth, and again from this to that, and, in short, are not willing to look up even for a little while nor to withdraw ourselves from human affairs but as if drowned in torpor and sleep and drunkenness we are stupefied with imaginations and as those who were under the power of sweet sleep lie on their bed not only during the night but even when the morning has overtaken them and a bright day has come and are not ashamed to indulge in pleasure and to make the season of business and activity a time of slumber and indolence so truly we also, when the day is drawing near, when the night is far spent, or rather the day, for work, it is said, while it is day. When it is day, we practice all that belongs to the night, sleeping, dreaming, indulging in luxurious fancies, and the eyes of our understanding are closed as well as those of our body. We speak amiss, we talk absurdly even if a person inflict a deep wound upon us if he carry off all our substance if he set the very house on fire we are not so much as conscious of it or rather we do not even wait for others to do this but we do it ourselves piercing and wounding ourselves every day lying in unseemly fashion and stripped bare of all credit all honour neither ourselves concealing our shameful deeds nor permitting others to do so, but longing exposed to public shame, to the ridicule, the numberless jests of spectators and passers-by. Do ye not suppose that the wicked themselves laugh at those who are of like character to themselves, and condemn them? For since God has placed within us a tribunal which cannot be bribed, nor ever utterly destroyed, even though we come to the very lowest depth of vice, therefore even the wicked themselves give sentence against themselves and if one call them that which they are they are ashamed they are angry they say that it is an insult thus they condemn what they do even if not by their deeds yet by their words by their conscience nay rather even by their deeds for when they carry on their practices out of sight and secretly, they give the strongest proof of the opinion they hold concerning the thing itself. For wickedness is so manifest that all men are its accusers, even those who follow after it, while such is the quality of virtue that it is admired even by those who do not emulate it. For even the fornicator will praise chastity, and the covetous will condemn injustice and the passionate will admire patience, and blame quarrelsomeness, and the wanton will blame wantonness. How then, you say, does he pursue these things? From excessive indolence, not because he judges it good, otherwise he would not have been ashamed of the thing itself, nor would he have denied it when another accused him. Nay, many when caught, not enduring the shame, have even hanged to themselves, so strong is the witness within us in behalf of what is good and becoming. Thus what is good is brighter than the sun, and the contrary more unsightly than anything. The saints were strangers and sojourners. How and in what way? And where does Abraham confess himself a stranger and a sojourner? Probably, indeed, he even himself confessed it 
but david both confessed i am a stranger and what as all my fathers were for they who dwell in tents they who purchase even burial places for money evidently were in some sense strangers as they had not even where to bury their dead what then did they mean that they were strangers from the land that is in palestine by no means but in respect of the whole world and with reason for they saw therein none of the things which they wished for but everything foreign and strange they indeed wished to practise virtue but here there was much wickedness and things were quite foreign to them they had no friend no familiar acquaintance save only some few but how were they strangers they had no care for things here and this they showed not by words but by their deeds in what way he said to abraham leave that which seems thy country and come to one that is foreign and he did not cleave to his kindred but gave it up as unconcernedly as if he were about to leave a foreign land he said to him offer up thy son and he offered him up as if he had no son as if he had divested himself of his nature so he offered him up the wealth which he had acquired was common to all passers-by and this he accounted as nothing he yielded the first places to others he threw himself into dangers he suffered troubles innumerable he built no splendid houses he enjoyed no luxuries he had no care about dress which all are things of this world but lived in all respects as belonging to the city yonder he showed hospitality brotherly love mercifulness forbearance contempt for wealth and for present glory and for all else and his son too was such as himself when he was driven away when war was made on him he yielded and gave way as being in a foreign land for foreigners whatever they suffer endure it as not being in their own country when even his wife was taken from him he endured this also as being in a strange land and lived in all respects as one whose home was above showing sober-mindedness and a well-ordered life for after he had begotten a son he had no more commerce with his wife and it was when the flower of his youth had passed that he married her showing that he did it not from passion but in subservience to the promise of god and what did jacob did he not seek bread only and raiment which are asked for by those who are truly strangers by those that have come to great poverty when he was driven out did he not as a stranger give place did he not serve for hire did he not suffer afflictions innumerable everywhere as a stranger and these things he says they said seeking their own country ah how great is the difference they indeed were in travail pains each day wishing to be released from this world and to return to their country but we on the contrary if a fever attack us neglecting everything weeping like little children are frightened at death not without reason we are thus affected for since we do not live here like strangers nor is it hastening to our country but are like persons that are going away to punishment therefore we grieve because we have not used circumstances as we ought but have turned order upside down hence we grieve when we ought to rejoice hence we shudder like murderers or robber chiefs when they are going to be brought before the judgment seat and are thinking over all the things they have done and therefore are fearful and trembling they however were not such but pressed on and paul even groaned and we he says that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened such were they who were with abraham strangers he says they were in respect of the whole world and they sought a country what sort of country was this was it that which they had left by no means for what hindered them if they wished from returning again and becoming citizens but they sought that which is in heaven thus they desired their departure hence and so they pleased god for 
god was not ashamed to be called their god ah how great a dignity he vouchsafed to be called their god what dost thou say he is called the god of the earth and the god of heaven and hast thou set it down as a great thing that he is not ashamed to be called their god great and truly great this is and a proof of exceeding blessedness how because he is called god of earth and of heaven as also of the gentiles in that he created and formed them but god of those holy men not in this sense but as some true friend and i will make it plain to you by an example as in the case of slaves in large households when any of those placed over the household are very highly esteemed and manage everything themselves and can use great freedom towards their masters the master is called after them and one may find many so called but what do i say as we might say the god not of the gentiles but of the world so we might say the god of abraham but you do not know how great a dignity this is because we do not attain to it for as now he is called the lord of all christians and yet the name goes beyond our deserts consider the greatness if he were called the god of one person he who is called the god of the whole world is not ashamed to be called the god of three men and with good reason for the saints would turn the scale i do not say against the world but against ten thousand such for one man who doeth the will of the lord is better than ten thousand transgressors now that they called themselves strangers in this sense is manifest but supposing that they said they were strangers on account of the strange land why did david also call himself a stranger was not he a king was not he a prophet did he not spend his life in his own country why then does he say i am a stranger and a sojourner how art thou a stranger as he says all my fathers were seest thou that they too were strangers we have a country he means but not really our country but how art thou thyself a stranger as to the earth therefore they also were strangers in respect of the earth for as they were he says so also am i and as he so they too let us even now become strangers that god may not be ashamed of us to be called our god for it is a shame to him when he is called the god of the wicked and he also is ashamed of them as he is glorified when he is called the god of the good and the kind and of them that cultivate virtue for if we decline to be called the masters of our wicked slaves and give them up and should any one come to us and say such a one does innumerable bad things he is your slave is he not we immediately say by no means to get rid of the disgrace for a slave has a close relation to his master and the discredit passes from the one to the other but they were so illustrious so full of confidence that not only was he not ashamed to be called from them but he even himself says i am the god of abraham and the god of isaac and the god of jacob let us also my beloved become strangers that god may not be ashamed of us that he may not be ashamed and deliver us up to hell such were they who said lord have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have done many wonderful works but see what christ says to them i know you not the very thing which masters would do when wicked slaves run to them wishing to be rid of the disgrace i know you not he says how then dost thou punish those whom thou knowest not i said i know not in a different sense that is i deny you and renounce you but god forbid that we should hear this fatal and terrible utterance for if they who cast out demons and prophesied were denied because their life was not suitable thereto 
how much more we and how you ask is it possible that they should be denied who have shown prophetic powers and wrought miracles and cast out demons is it probable they were afterwards changed and became wicked and therefore were nothing benefited even by their former virtue for not only ought we to have our beginnings splendid but the end also more splendid still for tell me does not the orator take pains to make the end of his speech splendid that he may retire with applause does not the public officer make the most splendid display at the close of his administration the wrestler if he do not make a more splendid display and conquer unto the end and if after vanquishing all he be vanquished by the last is not all unprofitable to him should the pilot have crossed the whole ocean yet if he wreck his vessel at the port has he not lost all his former labour and what of the physician if after he has freed the sick man from his disease when he is on the point of discharging him cured he should then destroy him has he not destroyed everything so too in respect of virtue as many as have not added an end suitable to the beginning and in unison and harmony with it are ruined and undone such are they who have sprung forth from the starting-place bright and exulting and afterwards have become faint and feeble therefore they are both deprived of the prize and are not acknowledged by their master let us listen to these things those of us who are in love of wealth for this is the greatest iniquity for the love of money is the root of all evil let us listen those of us who wish to make our present possessions greater let us listen and sometimes cease from our covetousness that we may not hear the same things as they will hear let us listen to them now and be on our guard that we may not hear them then let us listen now with fear that we may not then listen with vengeance depart from me he says i never knew you no not even then he means when you made a display of prophesyings and were casting out demons it is probable that he also here hints at something else that even then they were wicked and from the beginning grace wrought even by the unworthy for if it wrought through balaam how much more through the unworthy for the sake of those who shall profit by it but if even signs and wonders did not avail to deliver from punishment much more if a man happened to be in the priestly dignity even if he reached the highest honour even if grace work in him to ordination even if unto all the other things for the sake of those who need his leadership he also shall hear i never knew thee no not even then when grace wrought in thee oh how strict shall the search be there as to purity of life how does that of itself suffice to introduce us into the kingdom while the absence of it gives up the man to destruction though we have ten thousand miracles and signs to show for nothing is so pleasing to god as an excellent course of life if he love me he declares he did not say work miracles but what keep my commandments and again i call you friends not when ye cast out demons but if ye keep my words for those things come of the gift of god but these after the gift of god of our own diligence also let us strive to become friends of god and not remain enemies to him these things we are ever saying these exhortations we are ever giving both to ourselves and to you but nothing more is gained wherefore also i am afraid i would have wished indeed to be silent so as not to increase your danger for when a person often hears and even so does not act this is to provoke the lord to anger but i fear also myself that other danger that of silence if when i am appointed to the ministering of the word i should hold my peace what shall we then do that we may be saved let us begin the practice of virtue 
as we have opportunity let us portion out the virtues to ourselves as laborers do their husbandry in this month let us master evil speaking injuriousness unjust anger and let us lay down a law for ourselves and say to-day let us set this right again in this month let us school ourselves in forbearance and in another in some other virtue and when we have got into the habit of this virtue let us go to another just as in the things we learn at school guarding what is already gained and acquiring others after this let us proceed to contempt for riches first let us restrain our hands from grasping and then let us give alms let us not simply confound everything with the same hands both slaying and showing mercy forsooth after this let us go to some other virtue and from that to another filthiness and foolish talking and jesting let it not be even named among you let us be thus far in the right way there is no need of spending money there is no need of labor none of sweat it is enough to have only the will and all is done there is no need to travel a long way nor to cross a boundless ocean but to be in earnest and of ready mind and to put a bridle on the tongue unseasonable reproaches anger disorderly lust luxuriousness expensiveness let us cast off and the desire of wealth also from our soul perjury and habitual oaths if we thus cultivate ourselves plucking out the former thorns and casting in the heavenly seed we shall be able to attain the good things promised for the husbandman will come and will lay us up in his garner and we shall attain to all good things which may we all attain by the grace and loving kindness of our lord jesus christ with whom to the father together with the holy ghost be glory power honour now and for ever and world without end amen end of homily twenty four homily twenty five of homilies on hebrews by st john chrysostom this librivox recording is in the public domain homily twenty five hebrews eleven seventeen through nineteen by faith abraham when he was tried offered up isaac and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said that in isaac shall thy seed be called accounting that god was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure great indeed was the faith of abraham for while in the case of abel and of noah and of enoch there was an opposition of reasonings only and it was necessary to go beyond human reasonings in this case it was necessary not only to go beyond human reasonings but to manifest also something more for what was of god seemed to be opposed to what was of god and faith opposed faith and command promise i mean this he had said get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and i will give thee this land he gave him none inheritance in it no not so much as to set his foot on seest thou how what was done was opposed to the promise again he said in isaac shall thy seed be called and he believed and again he says sacrifice to me this one who was to fulfil all the world from his seed thou seest the opposition between the commands and the promise he enjoined things that were in contradiction to the promises and yet not even so did the righteous man stagger nor say he had been deceived for you indeed he means could not say this that he promised ease and gave tribulation for in our case the things which he promised these also he performs how so in the world he says ye shall have tribulation he that taketh not his cross and followeth me is not worthy of me he that hateth not his life shall not find it 
and he that forsaketh not all that he hath and followeth after me is not worthy of me and again ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake and again a man's foes shall be they of his own household but the things which pertain to rest are yonder but with regard to abraham it was different he was enjoined to do what was opposed to the promises and yet not even so was he troubled nor did he stagger nor think he had been deceived but you endure nothing except what was promised yet you are troubled he heard the opposite of the promises from him who made them and yet he was not disturbed but did them as if they had been in harmony therewith for they were in harmony being opposed indeed according to human calculations but in harmony when viewed by faith and how this was the apostle himself has taught us by saying accounting that god was able to raise him up even from the dead by the same faith he means by which he believed that god gave what was not and raised up the dead by the same was he persuaded that he would also raise him up after he had been slain in sacrifice for it was alike impossible to human calculation i mean from a womb which was dead and grown old and already become useless for childbearing to give a child and to raise again one who had been slain but his previous faith prepared the way for things to come and see the good things came first and the hard things afterwards in his old age but for you on the contrary he says the sad things are first and the good things last this for those who dare to say he has promised us the good things after death perhaps he has deceived us he shows that god is able to raise up even from the dead and if god be able to raise from the dead without all doubt he will pay all that he has promised but if abraham so many years before believed that god is able to raise from the dead much more ought we to believe it thou seest what i at first said the death had not yet entered in and yet he drew them at once to the hope of the resurrection and led them to such full assurance that when bidden they even slay their own sons and readily offer up those from whom they expected to people the world and he shows another thing too by saying that god tempted abraham what then did not god know that the man was noble and approved why then did he tempt him not that he might himself learn but that he might show to others and make his fortitude manifest to all and here also he shows the cause of trials that they may not suppose that they suffer these things as being forsaken of god for in their case indeed it was necessary that they should be tried because there were many who persecuted or plotted against them but in abraham's case what need was there to devise trials for him which did not exist now this trial it is evident was by his command the others indeed happened by his allowance but this even by his command if then temptations make men approved in such wise that even when there is no occasion god exercises his own athletes much more ought we to bear all things nobly and here he said emphatically by faith when he was tried he offered up isaac for there was no other cause for his bringing the offering but that after this he pursues the same thought no one he says could allege that he had another son and expected the promise to be fulfilled from him and therefore confidently offered up this one and his words are he offered up his only begotten who had received the promises why sayest thou only begotten what then of whom was ishmael sprung i mean only begotten he would say so far as relates to the word of the promise therefore after saying only begotten showing that he says it for this reason he added of whom it was said in isaac shall thy seed be called that is from him seest thou how he admires what was done by the patriarch 
in isaac shall thy seed be called and that son he brought to be sacrificed afterwards that no one may suppose he does this in despair and in consequence of this command had cast away that faith but may understand that this also was truly of faith he says that he retained that faith also although it seemed to be at variance with this but it was not at variance for he did not measure the power of god by human reasonings but committed all to faith and hence he was not afraid to say that god was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure that is in idea by the ram he means how the ram having been slain he was saved so that by means of the ram he received him again having slain it in his stead but these things were types for here it is the son of god who is slain and observe i beseech you how great is his loving kindness for inasmuch as a great favour was to be given to men he wishing to do this not by favour but as a debtor arranges that a man should first give up his own son on account of god's command in order that he himself might seem to be doing nothing great in giving up his own son since a man had done this before him that he might be supposed to do it not of grace but of debt for we wish to do this kindness also to those whom we love others to appear first to have received some little thing from them and so give them all and we boast more of the receiving than of the giving and we do not say we gave him this but we received this from him from whence also are his words he received him in a figure that is to say as in a riddle for the ram was as it were a figure of isaac or as in a type for since the sacrifice had been completed and isaac slain in purpose therefore he gave him to the patriarch thou seest that what i am constantly saying is shown in this case also when we have proved that our mind is made perfect and have shown that we disregard earthly things then earthly things also are given to us but not before lest being bound to them already receiving them we should be bound still loose thyself from thy slavery first he says and then receive that thou mayest receive no longer as a slave but as a master despise riches and thou shalt be rich despise glory and thou shalt be glorious despise the avenging thyself on thine enemies and then shalt thou attain it despise repose and then thou shalt receive it that in receiving thou mayest receive not as a prisoner nor as a slave but as a free man for as in the case of little children when the child eagerly desires childish playthings we hide them from him with much care as a ball for instance and such like things that he may not be hindered from necessary things but when he thinks little of them and no longer longs for them we give them fearlessly knowing that henceforth no harm can come to him from them the desire no longer having strength enough to draw him away from things necessary so god also when he sees that we no longer eagerly desire the things of this world thenceforward permits us to use them for we possess them as free men and men not as children for in proof that if thou despise the avenging thyself on thine enemies thou wilt then attain it hear what he says if thine enemy hunger feed him if he thirst give him drink and he added for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head and again that if thou despise riches thou shalt then obtain them hear christ saying there is no man which hath left father or mother or house or brethren who shall not receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life and that if thou despise glory thou shalt then attain it again hear christ himself saying he that will be first among you let him be your minister and again for whosoever shall humble himself he shall be exalted what sayest thou 
If I give drink to mine enemy, do I then punish him? If I give up my goods, do I then possess them? If I humble myself, shall I then be exalted? Yea, he says, for such is my power, to give contraries by means of contraries. I abound in resources and in contrivances. Be not afraid. The nature of things follows my will. Not I attend upon nature. I do all things. I am not controlled by them. Wherefore also I am able to change their form and order. And why dost thou wonder if it is so in these instances? For thou wilt find the same also in all others. If thou injure, thou art injured. If thou art injured, then thou art uninjured. If thou punish, then thou hast not punished another, but hast punished thyself. For he that loveth iniquity, it is said, hateth his own soul. Seest thou that thou dost not injure, but art injured? Therefore also Paul says, Why do ye not rather take wrong? Dost thou not see that this is not to be wronged? When thou insultest, then art thou insulted. And most persons partly know this, as when they say one to another, Let us go away, do not disgrace yourself. Why? Because the difference is great between thee and him, for however much thou insultest him, he accounts it a credit. Let us consider this in all cases, and be above insults. I will tell you how. Should we have a contest with him who wears the purple, let us consider that in insulting him we insult ourselves, for we become worthy to be disgraced. Tell me, what dost thou mean? When thou art a citizen of heaven, and hast the philosophy that is above, dost thou disgrace thyself with him that mindeth earthly things? For though he be in possession of countless riches, though he be in power, he does not as yet know the good that is therein. Do not, in insulting him, insult thyself. Spare thyself, not him. Honor thyself, not him. Is there not some proverb such as this, He that honoreth, honoreth himself? With good reason, for he honors not the other but himself. Hear what a certain wise man says. Do honor to thy soul according to the dignity thereof according to the dignity thereof. What is this? If he have defrauded, it means, do not thou defraud. If he has insulted, do not thou insult. Tell me, I pray thee, if some poor man has taken away clay thrown out of thy yard, wouldst thou for this have summoned a court of justice? Surely not. Why? Lest thou shouldst disgrace thyself, lest all men should condemn thee. The same also happens in this case. For the rich man is poor, and the more rich he is, the poorer he is, in that which is indeed poverty. Gold is clay, cast out in the yard, not lying in thy house, for thy house is heaven. For this, then, will thou summon a court of justice, and will not the citizens on high condemn thee? Will they not cast thee out from their country, who art so mean, who art so shabby as to choose to fight for a little clay? For if the world were thine, and then someone had taken it, oughtest thou to pay any attention to it? Knowest thou not that if thou were to take the world ten times, or an hundred times, or ten thousand times, and twice that, it is not to be compared with the least of the good things in heaven? He then who admires the things here slights those yonder, since he judges these worthy of exertion, though so inferior to the other. Nay, rather indeed he will not be able to admire those other. For how can he, whilst he is passionately excited towards these earthly things? Let us cut through the cords and entanglements, for this is what earthly things are. How long shall we be stooping down? How long shall we plot one against another, like wild beasts, like fishes? Nay, rather, the wild bees do not plot against each other, but against animals of a different tribe. A bear, for instance, does not readily kill a bear, nor a serpent kill a serpent, 
having respect for the sameness of race but thou with one of the same race and having innumerable claims as common origin rational faculties the knowledge of god ten thousand other things the force of nature him who is thy kinsman and partaker of the same nature him thou killest and involvest in evils innumerable for what if thou dost not thrust thy sword nor plunge thy right hand into his neck other things more grievous than this thou doest when thou involvest him in innumerable evils for if thou hadst done the other thou wouldest freed him from anxiety but now thou encompassed him with hunger with slavery with feelings of discouragement with many sins these things i say and shall not cease to say not as preparing you to commit murder nor as urging you to some crime short of that but that you may not be confident as if you were not to give account for it says he that taketh away a livelihood and asketh bread it says let us at length keep our hands to ourselves or rather let us not keep them but stretch them out honourably not for grasping but for almsgiving let us not have our hand unfruitful nor withered for the hand which doeth not alms is withered and that which is also grasping is polluted and unclean let no one eat with such hands for this is an insult to those invited for tell me if a man when he has made us lie down on tapestry and a soft couch and linen interwoven with gold in a great and splendid house and had set by us a great multitude of attendants and had prepared a tray of silver and gold and filled it with many dainties of great cost and of all sorts then urged us to eat provided we would only endure his besmearing his hands with mire or with human ordure and so sitting down to meet with us would any man endure this infliction would he not rather have considered it an insult indeed i think he would and would have gone straightway off but now in fact thou seest not hands filled with what is indeed filth but even the very food and yet thou dost not go off nor flee nor find fault nay if he be a person in authority thou even accountest it a grand affair and destroyest thine own soul in eating such things for covetousness is worse than any mire for it pollutes not the body but the soul and makes it hard to be washed thou therefore though thou seest him that sitteth at meat defiled with this filth both on his hands and his face and his house filled with it nay and his table also full of it for dung or if there be anything more unclean than that it is not so unclean and polluted as those viands dost thou feel as if forsooth thou wert highly honoured and as if thou wert going to enjoy thyself and dost thou not fear paul who allows us to go without restraint to the tables of the heathen if we wish but not even if we wish to those of the covetous for if any man who is called a brother he says meaning here by brother every one who is a believer simply not him who leads a solitary life for what is it which makes brotherhood the washing of regeneration the being able to call god our father so that he that is a monk if he be a catechumen is not a brother but the believer though he be in the world is a brother if any man saith he that is called a brother for at that time there was not even a trace of any one leading a monastic life but this blessed apostle addressed all his discourse to persons in the world if any man he says that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or a drunkard with such an one know not to eat but not so with respect to the heathen but if any of them that believe not meaning the heathen bid you and ye be disposed to go whatsoever is set before you eat if any man that is called brother be he says a drunkard oh what strictness yet we not only do not avoid drunkards but even go to their houses partaking of what they said before us 
Therefore all things are upside down, all things are in confusion, and overthrown, and ruined. For tell me, if any such person should invite thee to a banquet, thee who are accounted poor and mean, and then should hear thee say, Inasmuch as the things set before me are the fruit of overreaching, I will not endure to defile my soul. Would he not be mortified? Would he not be confounded? Would he not be ashamed? This alone were sufficient to correct him, and to make him call himself wretched for his wealth, and admire thee for thy poverty, if he saw himself with so great earnestness despised by thee. But we are become i know not why servants of men though paul cries aloud throughout be not ye the servants of men whence then have we become servants of men because we first became servants of the belly and of money and of glory and of all the rest we gave up the liberty which christ bestowed on us what then awaiteth him who is become a servant tell me hear christ saying the servant abideth not in the house for ever thou hast a declaration complete in itself that he never entereth into the kingdom for this is what the house means for he says in my father's house are many mansions the servant then abideth not in the house for ever by a servant he means him who is the servant of sin but he that abideth not in the house for ever abideth in hell for ever having no consolation from any quarter nay to this point of wickedness are matters come that they even give alms out of these ill-gotten gains and many receive them therefore our boldness has broken down and we are not able to rebuke any one but however henceforward at least let us flee the mischief arising from this, and ye who have rolled yourselves in this mire, cease from such defilement, and restrain your rage for such banquets, if even now we may by any means be able to have God propitious to us, and to attain to the good things which have been promised, which may we all obtain in Christ Jesus our Lord, with whom to the Father, together with the Holy Ghost, be glory, power, honor, now and for ever and world without end amen end of homily twenty five homily twenty six of homilies on hebrews by st john chrysostom this librivox recording is in the public domain homily twenty six hebrews eleven twenty through twenty two by faith isaac blessed jacob and esau concerning things to come by faith jacob when he was a dying blessed both the sons of joseph and worshipped leaning on the top of his staff by faith joseph when he died made mention of the departing of the children of israel and gave commandment concerning his bones many prophets and righteous men it is said have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them did then those righteous men know all the things to come yea most certainly for if because of the weakness of those who were not able to receive him the son was not revealed he was with good reason revealed to those conspicuous in virtue this paul also says that they knew the things to come that is the resurrection of christ or he does not mean this but that by faith concerning things to come means not concerning the world to come but concerning things to come in this world for how except by faith could a man sojourning in a strange land give such blessings but on the other hand he obtained the blessing and yet did not receive it thou seest that what i said with regard to abraham may be said also of jacob that they did not enjoy the blessing but the blessings went to his posterity while he himself obtained the things to come for we find that his brother rather enjoyed the blessing for jacob spent all his time in servitude and working as a hireling 
and amid dangers and plots and deceits and fears and when he was asked by pharaoh he says few and evil have my days been while the other living in independence and great security and afterwards was an object of terror to jacob where then did the blessings come to their accomplishment save in the world to come seest thou that from the beginning the wicked have enjoyed things here but the righteous the contrary not however all for behold abraham was a righteous man and he enjoyed things here as well though with affliction and trials for indeed wealth was all he had seeing all else relating to him was full of affliction for it is impossible that the righteous man should not be afflicted though he be rich for when he is willing to be overreached to be wronged to suffer all other things he must be afflicted so that although he enjoy wealth yet is it not without grief why you ask because he is in affliction and distress but if at that time the righteous were in affliction much more now by faith he says isaac blessed jacob and esau concerning things to come and yet esau was the elder but he puts jacob first for his excellence seest thou how great was his faith whence did he promise to his son so great blessings entirely from his having faith in god by faith jacob when he was a dying blessed both the sons of joseph here we ought to set down the blessings entire in order that both his faith and his prophesying may be made manifest and worshipped leaning he says upon the top of his staff here he means he not only spoke but was even so confident about the future things as to show it also by his act for inasmuch as another king was about to arise from ephraim therefore it is said and bowed himself upon the top of his staff that is even though he was now an old man he bowed himself to joseph showing the obeisance of the whole people which was to be directed to him and this indeed had already taken place when his brethren bowed down to him but it was afterwards to come to pass through the ten tribes seest thou how he foretold the things which were to be afterwards seest thou how great faith they had how they believed concerning the things to come for some of the things here the things present are examples of patience only and of enduring ill-treatment and of receiving nothing good for instance what is mentioned in the case of abraham in the case of abel but others are examples of faith as in the case of noah that there is a god that there is a recompense for faith in this place is manifold both of there being a recompense and of awaiting it not under the same conditions and of wrestling before the prizes and the things also which concern joseph are of faith only joseph heard that god had made a promise to abraham that he had engaged his word to thee and to thy seed will i give this land and though in a strange land and not yet seeing the engagement fulfilled but never faltered even so but so believed as even to speak of the exodus and to give commandment concerning his bones he then not only believed himself but led on the rest also to faith that having the exodus always in mind for he would not have given commandment concerning his bones unless he had been fully assured of this they might look for their return to canaan wherefore when some men say see even the righteous men had care about their sepulchres let us reply to them that it was for this reason for he knew that the earth is the lord's and all that therein is he could not indeed have been ignorant of this who lived in so great philosophy who spent his whole life in egypt and yet if he had wished it was possible for him to return and not to mourn or vex himself but when he had taken up his father thither why did he enjoin them to carry up thence his own bones also evidently for this reason but what 
tell me are not the bones of moses himself laid in a strange land and those of aaron of daniel of jeremiah and as to those of the apostles we do not know where those of most of them are laid for of peter indeed and paul and john and thomas the sepulchres are well known but those of the rest being so many have nowhere become known let us not therefore lament at all about this nor be so little-minded for wherever we may be buried the earth is the lord's and all that therein is certainly what must take place does take place to mourn however and lament and bewail the departed arises from littleness of mind verse twenty three by faith moses when he was born was hid three months of his parents dost thou see that in this case they hoped for things on the earth after their death and many things were fulfilled after their death this is for some who say after death those things were done for them which they did not obtain while alive nor did they believe would be after their death moreover joseph did not say he gave not the land to me in my lifetime nor to my father nor to my grandfather whose excellence too ought to have been reverenced and will he vouchsafe to these wretched people what he did not vouchsafe to them he said nothing of all this but by faith he both conquered and went beyond all these things he has named abel noah abraham isaac jacob joseph all illustrious and admirable men again he makes the encouragement greater by bringing down the matter to ordinary persons for that the admirable should feel thus is nothing wonderful and to appear inferior to them is not so dreadful but to show oneself inferior even to people without names this is the dreadful thing and he begins with the parents of moses obscure persons who had nothing so great as their son had therefore also he goes on to increase the strangeness of what he says by enumerating even women that were harlots and widows for by faith he says the harlot rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace and he mentions the rewards not only of belief but also of unbelief as in the case of noah but at present we must speak of the parents of moses pharaoh gave orders that all the male children should be destroyed and none had escaped the danger whence did these expect to save their child from faith what sort of faith they saw he says that he was a proper child the very sight drew them on to faith thus from the beginning yea from the very swaddling clothes great was the grace that was poured out on that righteous man this being not the work of nature for observe the child immediately on its birth appears fair and not disagreeable to the sight whose work was this not that of nature but of the grace of god which also stirred up and strengthened that barbarian woman the egyptian and took and drew her on and yet in truth faith had not a sufficient foundation in their case for what was it to believe from sight but you he would say believe from facts and have many pledges of faith for the receiving with joyfulness the spoiling of their goods and other such things were evidences of faith and of patience but inasmuch as these hebrews also had believed and yet afterwards had become faint-hearted he shows that the faith of those saints of old also was long continued as for instance that of abraham although the circumstances seemed to contend against it and he says they were not afraid of the king's commandment although that was an operation but this their hope respecting their child was simply a kind of bare expectation and this indeed was the act of his parents but moses himself what did he contribute next again an example appropriate to them or rather greater than that for saith he verses twenty four through twenty six 
by faith moses when he was come to years refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of god than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season esteeming the reproach of christ greater riches than the treasures of egypt for he had respect unto the recompense of their reward as though he had said to them no one of you has left a palace yea a splendid palace nor such treasures nor when he might have been a king's son has he despised this as moses did and that he did not simply leave these things he expressed by saying he refused that is he hated he turned away for when heaven was said to before him it was superfluous to admire an egyptian palace and to see how admirably paul has put it he did not say esteeming heaven and the things in heaven greater riches than the treasures of egypt but what the reproach of christ for the being reproached for the sake of christ he accounted better than being thus at ease and this itself by itself was reward choosing rather he says to suffer affliction with the people of god for ye indeed suffer on your own account but he chose to suffer for others and voluntarily threw himself into so many dangers when it was in his power both to live religiously and to enjoy good things then he says to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season he called unwillingness to suffer affliction with the rest sin this he says moses accounted to be sin if then he accounted it sin not to be ready to suffer affliction with the rest it follows that the suffering affliction must be a great good since he threw himself into it from the royal palace but this he did seeing some great things before him esteeming the reproach of christ greater riches than the treasures of egypt what is the reproach of christ it is being reproached in such ways as ye are the reproach which christ endured or that he endured for christ's sake for that rock was christ the being reproached as you are but what is the reproach of christ that because we repudiate the ways of our fathers we are reproached that we are evil and treated when we have run to god it was likely that he also was reproached when it was said to him wilt thou kill me as thou killedst the egyptian yesterday this is the reproach of christ to be ill-treated to the end and to the last breath as he himself was reproached and heard if thou be the son of god from those for whom he was crucified from those who were of the same race this is the reproach of christ when a man is reproached by those of his own family or by those whom he is benefiting for moses also suffered these things from the man who had been benefited by him in these words he encouraged them by showing that even christ suffered these things and moses also two illustrious persons so that this is rather the reproach of christ than of moses inasmuch as he suffered these things from his own but neither did the one send forth lightnings nor the other feel any anger but he was reviled and endured all things whilst they wagged their heads since therefore it was probable that they the readers also would hear such things and would long for the recompense he says that even christ and moses had suffered the like so then ease is the portion of sin but to be reproached of christ for what then dost thou wish the reproach of christ or ease verse twenty seven by faith he forsook egypt not fearing the wrath of the king for he endured as seeing him who is invisible what dost thou say that he did not fear and yet the scripture says that when he heard he was afraid and for this cause provided for safety by flight 
and stole away and secretly withdrew himself and afterwards he was exceedingly afraid observe the expressions with care he said not fearing the wrath of the king with reference to his even presenting himself again for it would have been the part of one who was afraid not to undertake again his championship nor to have any hand in the matter that he did however again undertake it was the part of one who committed all to god for he did not say he is seeking me and is busy in the search and i cannot bear again to engage in this matter so that even flight was an act of faith why then did he not remain you say that he might not cast himself into a foreseen danger for this finally would have been tempting god to leap into the midst of dangers and say let us see whether god will save me and this the devil said to christ cast thyself down seest thou that it is a diabolical thing to throw ourselves into danger without cause and for no purpose and to try whether god will save us for he moses could no longer be their champion when they who were receiving benefits were so ungrateful it would therefore have been a foolish and senseless thing to remain there but all these things were done because he endured as seeing him who is invisible if then we too always see god with our mind if we always think in remembrance of him all things will appear endurable to us all things tolerable we shall bear them all easily we shall be above them all for if a person seeing one whom he loves or rather remembering him is roused in spirit and elevated in thought and bears all things easily while he delights in the remembrance one who has in mind him who is vouchsafed to love us indeed and remembers him when will he either feel anything painful or dread anything fearful or dangerous when will he be of cowardly spirit never for all things appear to us difficult because we do not have the remembrance of god as we ought because we do not carry him about all way in our thoughts for surely he might justly say to us thou hast forgotten me i also will forget thee and so the evil becomes twofold both that we forget him and he us for these two things are involved in each other yet are two for great is the effect of god's remembrance and great also of his being remembered by us the result of the one is that we choose good things of the other that we accomplish them and bring them to their end therefore the prophet says i will remember thee from the land of jordan and from the little hill of hermon the people which were in babylon say this being there i will remember thee therefore let us also as being in babylon do the same for although we are not sitting among warlike foes yet we are among enemies for some of them indeed were sitting as captives but others did not even feel their captivity as daniel as the three children who even while they were in captivity became in that very country more glorious even than the king who had carried them captive and he who had taken them captive does obeisance to the captives dost thou see how great virtue is when they were in actual captivity he waited on them as masters he therefore was the captive rather than they it would not have been so marvellous if when they were in their native country he had come and done them reverence in their own land or if they had been rulers there but the marvellous thing is that after he had bound them and taken them captive and had them in his own country he was not ashamed to do them reverence in the sight of all and to offer an oblation do you see that the really splendid things are those which relate to god whereas human things are a shadow he knew not it seems that he was leading away masters for himself and that he cast into the furnace those whom he was about to worship but to them these things were as a dream let us fear god beloved 
let us fear him even should we be in captivity we are more glorious than all men let the fear of god be present with us and nothing will be grievous even though thou speak of poverty or of disease or of captivity or of slavery or of any other grievous thing nay even these very things will themselves work together for us the other way these men were captives and the king worshipped them paul was a tent-maker and they sacrificed to him as a god here a question arises why you ask did the apostles prevent the sacrifices and rend their clothes and divert them from their attempt and say with earnest lamentation what are ye doing we also are men of like passions with you whereas daniel did nothing of this kind for that he also was humble and referred the glory to god no less than they is evident from many places especially indeed is it evident from the very fact of his being beloved by god for if he had appropriated to himself the honour belonging to god he would not have suffered him to live much less to be in honour secondly because even with great openness he said and as to me o king this secret hath not been revealed to me through any wisdom that is in me and again he was in the den for god's sake and when the prophet brought him food he saith for god hath remembered me thus humble and contrite was he he was in the den for god's sake and yet he counted himself unworthy of his remembrance and of being heard yet we though daring to commit innumerable pollutions and being of all men most polluted if we be not hurt at our first prayer draw back truly great is the distance between them and us as great as between heaven and earth or if there be any greater what sayest thou after so many achievements after the miracle which had been wrought in the den dost thou account thyself so humble yea he says for what things soever we have done we are unprofitable servants thus by anticipation did he fulfil the evangelical precept and accounted himself nothing for god hath remembered me he said his prayer again of how great lowliness of mind it is full and again the three children said thus we have sinned we have committed iniquity and everywhere they show their humility and yet daniel had occasions innumerable for being puffed up but he knew that these also came to him on account of his not being puffed up and he did not destroy his treasure for among all men and in the whole world he was celebrated not only because the king cast himself on his face and offered sacrifice to him and accounted him to be a god who was himself honoured as god in all parts of the world for he ruled over the whole earth and this is evident from jeremiah who putteth on the earth saith he as a garment and again i have given it to nebuchadnezzar my servant and again from what he the king says in his letter and because he was held in admiration not only in the place where he was but everywhere and was greater than if the rest of the nations had been present and seen him when even by letters the king confessed his submission and the miracle but yet again for his wisdom he was also held in admiration for it is said art thou wiser than daniel and after all these things he was thus humble dying ten thousand times for the lord's sake why then you ask being so humble did he not repel either the adoration which was paid him by the king or the offerings this i will not say for it is sufficient for me simply to mention the question and the rest i leave to you that at least in this way i may stir up your thoughts this however i conjure you to choose all things for the fear of god having such examples and because in truth we shall obtain the things here also if we sincerely lay hold on the things which are to come 
for that he did not do this out of arrogance is evident from his saying thy gifts be to thyself for besides this also again is another question how while in words he rejected it indeed he received the honour and wore the chain of gold moreover while herod on hearing the cry it is the voice of a god and not of a man inasmuch as he gave not god the glory burst in sunder and all his bowels gushed out this man received to himself even the honour belonging to god not words only however it is necessary to say what this is in that case at lystra the men were falling into greater idolatry but in this of daniel not so how for his being thus accounted of was an honour to god therefore he said in anticipation and as to me not through any wisdom that is in me and besides he does not even appear to have accepted the offerings for he the king said as it is written that they should offer sacrifice but it did not appear that the act followed but there at lystra they carried it even to sacrificing the bulls and they called the one jupiter and the other mercurius the chain of gold then he accepted that he might make himself known the offering however why does it not appear that he rejected it for in the other case too they did not do it but they attempted it and the apostles hindered them wherefore here also he ought at once to have rejected the adoration and there it was the entire people here the king why did he not divert him daniel expressed by anticipation namely that the king was not making an offering to him as to a god to the overthrow of religious worship but for the greater wonder how so it was on god's account that nebuchadnezzar made the decree wherefore daniel did not mutilate the honour offered but those others at lystra did not act thus but supposed them to be indeed gods on this account they were repelled and here after having done him reverence he does these things for he did not reverence him as a god but as a wise man but it is not clear that he made the offering and even if he did make it yet not that it was with daniel's acceptance and what of this that he called him belteshazzar the name of his own god thus it seems they accounted their gods to be nothing wonderful when he called even the captive thus he who commands all men to worship the image manifold and of various colours and who adores the dragon moreover the babylonians were much more foolish than those at lystra wherefore it was not possible at once to lead them on to this and many more things one might say but thus far these suffice if therefore we wish to obtain all good things let us seek the things of god for as they who seek the things of this world fail both of them and of the others so they who prefer the things of god obtain both let us then not seek these but those that we may attain also to the good things promised in christ jesus our lord with whom to the father together with the holy ghost be glory power honour now and for ever and world without end amen end of homily twenty six Homily twenty seven of Homilies on Hebrews by St. John Chrysostom. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Homily twenty seven. Hebrews eleven twenty eight through thirty one. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith he passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, which the Egyptians assaying to do were drowned by faith the walls of jericho fell down after they had been compassed about seven days by faith the harlot rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace 
Paul is one to establish many things incidentally, and is very full of thoughts, for such is the grace of the Spirit. He does not comprehend a few ideas in a multitude of words, but includes great and manifold thought and brevity of expressions. Observe at least how, in the midst of exhortation, and when discoursing about faith, of what a type and mystery he reminds us, whereof we have the reality. Through faith, he says, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. But what is the sprinkling of blood? A lamb was slain in every household, and the blood was smeared on the doorpost, and this was a means of warding off the Egyptian destruction. If, then, the blood of a lamb preserved the Jews unhurt in the midst of the Egyptians, and under so great a destruction, much more will the blood of Christ save us, who have had it sprinkled not on the doorpost, but in our souls. For even now also the destroyer is going about in this depth of night, but let us be armed with that sacrifice. He calls the sprinkling anointing. For God has brought us out from Egypt, from darkness, from idolatry. Although what was done was nothing, what was achieved was great. For what was done was blood, but what was achieved was salvation, and the stopping and preventing of destruction. The angel feared the blood, for he knew of what it was a type. He shuddered, thinking on the Lord's death therefore he did not touch the doorpost. Moses said, Smear, and they smeared, and were confident. And you, having the blood of the Lamb himself, are ye not confident? By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. Again he compares one whole people with another, lest they should say, We cannot be as the saints. By faith, he says, they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, which the Egyptians, assaying to do, were drowned. Here he leads them also to a recollection of the sufferings in Egypt. How? By faith? Because they had hoped to pass through the sea, and therefore they prayed, or rather it was Moses who prayed. Seest thou that everywhere faith goes beyond human reasonings, and weakness, and lowliness? Seest thou that at the same time they both believed, and feared punishment, both in the blood on the doors, and in the Red Sea? And he made it clear that it was really water, through those that fell into it, and were choked, that it was not a mere appearance. But as in the case of the lions those who were devoured proved the reality of the facts, and in the case of the fiery furnace those who were burnt, so here also thou seest that the same things become to the one a cause of salvation and glory, and to the other of destruction. So great a good is faith, and when we fall into perplexity, then are we delivered, even though we come to death itself, even though our condition be desperate. For what else was left for them? They were unarmed, compassed about by the Egyptians and the sea, and they must either be drowned if they fled, or fall into the hands of the Egyptians. But nevertheless he saved them from impossibilities. That which was spread under the one as land, overwhelmed the others as sea. In the former case it forgot its nature, and the latter it even armed itself against them. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down, after they had been compassed about for seven days. For assuredly the sound of trumpets is not able to throw down stones, though one blow for ten thousand years. But faith can do all things. Seest thou that in all cases it is not by natural sequence, nor yet by any law of nature that it was changed, but all is done contrary to expectation. Accordingly in this case also all is done contrary to expectation. For inasmuch as he had said again and again that we ought to trust to the future hopes, he introduced all this argument with reason, showing that not now only, but even from the beginning all the miracles have been accomplished and achieved by means of it. By faith the harlot Rahab, 
perished not with them that believed not having received the spies with peace it would then be disgraceful if you should appear more faithless even than a harlot yet she merely heard what the men related and forthwith believed whereupon the end also followed for when all perished she alone was preserved she did not say to herself i shall be with my many friends she did not say can i possibly be wiser than these judicious men who do not believe and shall i believe she said no such thing but believed what had taken place which it was likely that they would suffer verse thirty two and what shall i more say for the time would fail me to tell after this he no longer puts down the names but having ended with an harlot and put them to shame by the quality of the person he no longer enlarges on the histories lest he should be thought tedious however he does not set them aside but runs over them doing both very judiciously avoiding satiety and not spoiling the closeness of arrangement he was neither altogether silent nor did he speak as to annoy for he affects both points for when a man is contending vehemently in argument if he persists in contending he wearies out the hearer annoying him when he is already persuaded and gaining the reputation of vain ambitiousness for he ought to accommodate himself to what is expedient and what do i more say he says for the time would fail me to tell of gideon and of barak and of samson and of zephthah of david also and samuel and of the prophets some find fault with paul because he puts barak and samson and zephthah in these places what sayest thou after having introduced the harlot shall he not introduce these for do not tell me of the rest of their life but only whether they did not believe and shine in faith and the prophets he says verse thirty three who through faith subdued kingdoms thou seest that he does not here testify to their life as being illustrious for this was not the point in question but the inquiry thus far was about their faith for tell me whether they did not accomplish all by faith by faith he says they subdued kingdoms those with gideon wrought righteousness who the same plainly he means here kindness i think it is of david that he says they obtained promises but of what sort were these those in which he said that his seed should sit upon his throne stopped the mouths of lions verse thirty four quenched the violence of fire escaped the edge of the sword see how they were in death itself daniel encompassed by the lions the three children abiding in the furnace the israelites abraham isaac jacob in diverse temptations and yet not even so did they despair for this is faith when things are turning out adversely then we ought to believe that nothing adverse is done but all things in due order escaped the edge of the sword i think that he is again speaking of the three children out of weakness were made strong here he alludes to what took place at their return from babylon for out of weakness is out of captivity when the condition of the jews had now become desperate when they were no better than dead bones who could have expected that they would return from babylon and not return only but also wax valiant and turn to flight armies of aliens but to us some one says no such thing has happened but these are figures of the things to come verse thirty five women received their dead raised to life again here he speaks of what occurred in regard to the prophets elisha and elijah for they raised the dead verse thirty five and others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection but we have not obtained a resurrection i am able however he means to show that they also were cut off and did not accept deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection 
for why tell me when it was open to them to live did they not choose it were they not evidently looking for a better life and they who had raised up others themselves chose to die in order to obtain a better resurrection not such as the children of those women here i think he alludes both to john and to james for beheading is called torturing it was in their power still to behold the sun it was in their power to abstain from reproving sinners and yet they chose to die even they who had raised others chose to die themselves that they might obtain a better resurrection verse thirty six and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings yea moreover of bonds and imprisonment he ends with these with things that come nearer home for these examples especially bring consolation when the distress is from the same cause since even if you mention something more extreme yet unless it arise from the same cause you have effected nothing therefore he concludes his discourse with this mentioning bonds imprisonments scourges stonings alluding to the case of stephen also to that of zacharias wherefore he added they were slain with the sword what sayest thou some escaped the edge of the sword and some were slain by the sword verse thirty four what is this which dost thou praise which dost thou admire the latter or the former nay he says the former indeed is appropriate to you and the latter because faith was strong even unto death itself and it is a type of things to come for the wonderful qualities of faith are too that it both accomplishes great things and suffers great things and counts itself to suffer nothing and thou canst not say he says that these were sinners and worthless for even if you put the whole world against them i find that they weigh down the beam and are of greater value what then were they to receive in this life here he raises up their thoughts teaching them not to be riveted to things present but to mind things greater than all that are in this present life since the world is not worthy of them what then dost thou wish to receive here for it were an insult to thee shouldst thou receive thy reward here let us not then mind worldly things nor seek our recompense here nor be so beggarly for if the whole world is not worthy of them why dost thou seek after a part of it and with good reason for they are friends of god now by the world does he mean here the people or the creation itself both for the scripture is wont to use the word of both if the whole creation he would say with the human beings that belong to it were put in a balance they yet would not be of equal value with these and with reason for as ten thousand measures of chaff and hay would not be of equal value to ten pearls so neither they for better is one that doeth the will of the lord than ten thousand transgressors meaning by ten thousand not merely many but an infinite multitude consider of how great value is the righteous man joshua the son of nun said let the sun stand still at gibeon the moon at the valley of elam and it was so let then the whole world come or rather two or three or four or ten or twenty worlds and let them say and do this yet shall they not be able but the friend of god commanded the creatures of his friend or rather he besought his friend and the servants yielded and he below gave command to those above seest thou that these things are for service filling their appointed course this was greater than the miracles of moses why i ask because it is not a light thing to command the sea and the heavenly bodies for that indeed was also a great thing yes very great nevertheless it was not at all equal to the other why was this the name of joshua jesus was a type for this reason then and because of the very name the creation reverenced him what then 
was no other person called jesus yes but this man was on this account so called in type for he used to be called hoshea therefore the name was changed for it was a prediction and a prophecy he brought in the people into the promised land as jesus does into heaven not the law since neither did moses bring them in but remained without the law has not power to bring in but grace seest thou the types which have been before sketched out from the beginning he laid his commands on the creation or rather on the chief part of the creation on the very head itself as he stood below that so when thou seest jesus in the form of man saying the same thou mayest not be disturbed nor think it strange he even while moses was living turned back wars thus even while the law is living he directs all things but not openly but let us consider how great is the virtue of the saints if here they work such things if here they do such things as the angels do what then above how great is the splendor they have perhaps each of you might wish to be such as to be able to command the sun and moon at this point what would they say who assert that the heaven is a sphere for why did he not merely say let the sun stand still but added let the sun stand still at the valley of elam that is he will make the day longer this was done also in the time of hezekiah the sun went back this again is more wonderful than the other to go the contrary way not having yet gone round his course we shall attain to greater things than these if we will for what has christ promised us not that we shall make the sun stand still or the moon nor that the sun shall retrace his steps but what i and the father will come unto him he says and we will make our abode with him what need have i of the sun and the moon and of these wonders when the lord of all himself comes down and abides with me i need these not for what need i any of these things he himself shall be to me for sun and for light for tell me if thou hadst entered into a palace which would thou choose to be able to rearrange some of the things which have been fixed there or so to make the king a familiar friend as to persuade him to take up his abode with thee much rather the latter than the former but what wonder is it says some one that what a man commands christ should also but christ you say needs not the father but acts of his own authority you say well therefore first confess and say that he needs not the father and acts of his own authority and then i will ask thee whether his prayer is not in the way of condescension and arrangement for surely christ was not inferior to joshua the son of nun and that he might teach us for as when thou hearest a teacher lisping and saying over the alphabet thou dost not say that he is ignorant and when he asks where is such a letter thou knowest that he does not ask in ignorance but because he wishes to lead on the scholar in like manner christ also did not make his prayer as needing prayer but is desiring to lead thee on that thou mayest continually apply thyself to prayer that thou mayest do it without ceasing soberly and with great watchfulness and by watching i do not mean merely the rising at night but also the being sober in our prayers during the day for such an one is called watchful since it is possible both in praying by night to be asleep and in praying by day to be awake when the soul is stretched out towards god when it considers with whom it holds converse to whom its words are addressed when it has in mind that angels stand by with fear and trembling while he approaches gaping and scratching himself prayer is a mighty weapon if it be made with a suitable mind and that thou mayest learn its strength continued entreaty has overcome shamelessness and injustice and savage cruelty and overbearing rashness for he says hear what the unjust judge saith again it has overcome sloth also 
and what friendship did not affect this continued entreaty did and although he will not give him because he is his friend he says yet because of his importunity he will rise and give to him and continued as a duty made her worthy who was unworthy it is not meet he says to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs yea lord she says for even the dogs eat the crumbs from their master's table let us apply ourselves to prayer it is a mighty weapon if it be offered with earnestness if without vainglory if with a sincere mind it has turned back wars it has benefited an entire nation though undeserving i have heard their groaning he says and am come down to deliver them it is itself a saving medicine and has power to prevent sins and to heal misdeeds in this the desolate widow was assiduous if then we pray with humility smiting our breast as the publican if we utter what he did if we say be merciful to me a sinner we shall obtain all for though we be not publicans yet we have other sins not less than his for do not tell me that thou hast gone wrong in some small matter only since the thing has the same nature for as a man is equally called a homicide whether he has killed a child or a man so also is he called overreaching whether he be overreaching in much or in little yea and to remember injuries too is no small matter but even a great sin for it is said the ways of those who remember injuries tend to death and he that is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of hell and he that calleth his brother a fool and senseless and numberless such things but we partake even of the tremendous mysteries unworthily and we envy and we revile and some of us have even oftentimes been drunk but each one of these things even itself by itself is enough to cast us out of the kingdom and when they even come all together what comfort shall we have we need much penitence beloved much prayer much endurance much perseverance that we may be enabled to attain the good things which have been promised to us let us then say even we be merciful to me a sinner nay rather let us not say it only but let us also be thus minded and should another call us so let us not be angry he heard the words i am not as this publican and was not provoked thereby but filled with compunction he accepted the reproach and he put away the reproach the other spoke of the wound but he sought the medicine let us say then be merciful to me a sinner but even if another should so call us let us not be indignant but if we say ten thousand evil things of ourselves and are vexed when we hear them from others then there is no longer humility nor confession but ostentation and vainglory is it ostentation you say to call oneself a sinner yes for we obtain the credit of humility we are admired we are commended whereas if we say the contrary of ourselves we are despised so that we do this too for the sake of credit but what is humility it is when another reviles us to bear it to acknowledge our fault to endure evil speaking and yet even this would not be a mark of humility but of candor but now we call ourselves sinners unworthy and ten thousand other such names but if another apply one of them to us we are vexed we become savage seest thou that this is not confession nor even candour thou saidest of thyself that thou art such an one be not indignant if thou hearest it also said by others and art reproved in this way thy sins are made lighter for thee when others reproach thee for they lay a burden on themselves indeed but thee they lead onwards into philosophy hear what the blessed david says when shimei cursed him let him alone he says the lord hath bidden him that he might look on my humiliation he says and the lord will requite me good for his cursing on this day 
but thou while saying evil things of thyself even in excess if thou hearest not from others the commendations that are due to the most righteous art enraged seest thou that thou art trifling with things that are no subjects for trifling for we even repudiate praises in our desire for other praises that we may obtain yet higher panegyrics that we may be more admired so that when we decline to accept commendations we do it that we may augment them and all things are done by us for credit not for truth therefore all things are hollow all impracticable wherefore i beseech you now at any rate to withdraw from this mother of evils vainglory and to live according to what is approved by god that so you may attain to the good things to come in christ jesus our lord with whom to the father be glory together with his holy and good spirit now and ever and world without end amen end of homily twenty seven homily twenty eight part one of homilies on hebrews by st john chrysostom this librivox recording is in the public domain homily twenty eight part one hebrews eleven thirty seven and thirty eight they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins being destitute afflicted tormented of whom this world was not worthy wandering in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth at all times indeed but especially then when i reflect upon the achievements of the saints it comes over me to feel despondency concerning my own condition because we have not even in dreams experienced the things among which those men spent their whole lives not paying the penalty of sins but always doing rightly and yet always afflicted for consider i beseech you elijah to whom our discourse has come round to-day for he speaks of him in this passage and in him his examples end which example was appropriate to their case and having spoken of what befell the apostles that they were slain with the sword were stoned he goes back again to elijah who suffered the same things with them for since it was probable that they would not as yet hold the apostles in so great estimation he brings his exhortation and consolation from him who had been taken up into heaven and who was held in special admiration for they wandered about he says in sheepskins and goatskins being destitute afflicted tormented of whom this world was not worthy they had not even raiment he says through the excess of affliction no city no house no lodging-place the same which christ said but the son of man hath not where to lay his head why do i say no lodging-place no standing-place for not even when they had gained the wilderness were they at rest for he said not they sat down in the wilderness but even when they were there they fled and were driven thence not out of the inhabited world only but even out of that which was uninhabitable and he reminds them of the places where they were set and of things which there befell them then next he says they bring accusations against you for christ's sake what accusation had they against elijah when they drove him out and persecuted him and compelled him to struggle with famine which these hebrews were then suffering at least the brethren it is said decided to send relief to those of the disciples who were afflicted every man according to his ability determined to send relief unto the brethren that dwelt in judea which was the case of these also tormented or ill-treated he says that is suffering distress in journeyings in dangers but they wandered about what is this wandering he says in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth like exiles and outcasts as persons taken in the basest of crimes as those not worthy to see the sun they found no refuge from the wilderness but must always be flying must be seeking hiding-places must bury themselves alive in the earth 
always be in terror. What then is the reward of so great a change? What is the recompense? They have not yet received it, but are still waiting, and after thus dying in so great tribulation they have not yet received it. They gained their victory so many ages ago, and have not yet received their reward. And you who are yet in the conflict, are you vexed? Do you also consider what a thing it is, and how great, that Abraham should be sitting, and the Apostle Paul, waiting till thou hast been perfected, that then they may be able to receive their reward? For the Saviour has told them before that unless we also are present, he will not give it them. As an affectionate father might say to sons who were well approved, and had accomplished their work, that he would not give them to eat unless their brethren came and art thou vexed that thou hast not yet received the reward what then shall abel do who was victor before all and is sitting uncrowned and what noah and what they who lived in those early times seeing that they wait for thee and those after thee dost thou see that we have the advantage of them for God, he says, has provided some better thing for us, in order that they might not seem to have the advantage of us from being crowned before us. He appointed one time of crowning for all, and he that gained the victory so many years before receives his crown with thee. Seest thou his tender carefulness? And he did not say that they without us might not be crowned, but that they without us might not be made perfect, so that at that time they appear perfect also. They were before us as regards the conflicts, but are not before us as regards the crowns. He wronged not them, but he honored us. For they also wait for the brethren. For if we are all one body, the pleasure becomes greater to this body when it is crowned together, and not part by part, for the righteous are also worthy of admiration in this, that they rejoice in the welfare of their brethren as in their own, so that for themselves also this is according to their wish, to be crowned along with their own members, to be glorified all together is a great delight. Chapter 12, verse 1 Wherefore, he says, we also are being compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, in many places the scripture derives its consolation in evils from corresponding things, as when the prophet says, from burning heat and from storm and rain. This at least he says here also, that the memory of those holy men re-establishes and recovers the soul which had been weighed down by woes, as a cloud does from him who is burnt by the too hot rays of the sun. And he did not say, lifted on high above us, but compassing us about, which was more than the other, so that we are in greater security. What sort of cloud? A load of witnesses. With good reason he calls not those in the New Testament only, but those in the Old also, witnesses or martyrs. For they also were witnesses to the greatness of God, as, for instance, the three children, those with Elijah, all the prophets laying aside all things. All, what? That is, slumber, indifference, mean reasonings, all human things. And the sin which doth so easily beset us, eperistaton, that is, either, which easily circumvents us, or what can easily be circumvented, but rather this latter, for it is easy, if we will, to overcome sin. Let us run with patience, he says, the race that is set before us. He did not say, let us contend as boxers, nor let us wrestle, nor let us do battle, but what was lightest of all, the contest of the foot-race, this he has brought forward. Nor yet did he say, let us add to the length of the course, but let us continue patiently in this, let us not faint. Let us run, he says, the race that is set before us. In the next place, as the sum and substance of his exhortation, which he puts both first and last, even Christ. 
Verse 2. Looking, he says, unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The very thing which Christ himself also continually said to his disciples. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more them of his household? And again, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his lord. Looking, he says, that is, that we may learn to run. For as in all arts and games, we impress the art upon our mind by looking to our masters, receiving certain rules through our sight, so here also, if we wish to run, and to learn to run well, let us look to Christ, even to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. What is this? He has put the faith within us. For he said to his disciples, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And Paul too says, But then shall I know, even as also I have been known. He put the beginning into us. He will also put on the end. Who, he says, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. That is, it was in his power not to suffer at all, if he so willed, for he did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. As he also says in the Gospels, The prince of the world cometh and hath nothing in me. It lay then in his power, if he so willed, not to come to the cross. For I have power, he says, to lay down my life, and I have power to take it again. If then he who was under no necessity of being crucified was crucified for our sake, how much more is it right that we should endure all things nobly? Who for the joy that was set before him, he says, endured the cross, despising the shame. But what is despising the shame? He chose, he means, that ignominious death. For suppose that he died, why should he also die ignominiously? For no other reason but to teach us to make no account of the glory from men. Therefore, though under no obligation he chose it, teaching us to be bold against it, and to set it at naught. Why did he say not pain, but shame? Because it was not with pain that he bore these things. What then is the end? He is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Seest thou the prize which Paul also says in an epistle? Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow. He speaks in respect to the flesh. Well then, even if there were no prize, the example would suffice to persuade us to accept all such things. But now prizes also are set before us, and these no common ones, but great and unspeakable. Wherefore let us also, whenever we suffer anything of this kind, before the apostles consider Christ. Why? His whole life was full of insults, for he continually heard himself called mad, and a deceiver, and a sorcerer. And at one time the Jews said, Nay, it says, but he deceiveth the people. And again, that deceiver said while he was yet alive, After three days I will rise again. As to sorcery too they calumniated him, saying, He casteth out the devils by Beelzebub, and that he is mad and hath a devil. Said we not well, it says, that he hath a devil and is mad? And these things he heard from them when doing them good, performing miracles, showing forth the works of God. For indeed, if he had been so spoken of when he did nothing, it would not have been so wonderful. But it is wonderful that when he was teaching what pertained to truth, he was called a deceiver, and when he cast out devils, was said to have a devil, and when he was overthrowing all that was opposed to God, was called a sorcerer. For these things they were continually alleging against him. And if thou wouldst know both the scoffs and the ironical jeerings which they made against him, what particularly wounds our souls, hear first those from his kindred. Is not this, it says, the carpenter's son, 
whose father and mother we know? Are not his brethren all with us? Also scoffing at him from his country, when they said he was of Nazareth. And again, search, it says, and see, for out of Galilee hath no prophet arisen. And he endured being so greatly calumniated. And again they said, Doth not the scripture say that Christ cometh from the town of Bethlehem? Wouldst thou see also the ironical jeerings they made? Coming, it says, to the very cross they worshipped him, and they struck him and buffeted him, and said, Tell us who it is that smote thee. And they brought vinegar to him, and said, If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. And again, the servant of the high priest struck him with the palm of his hand. And he says, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? And in derision they put a robe about him, and they spat in his face, and they were continually applying their test, tempting him. Wouldst thou see also the accusations, some secret, some open, some from disciples? Will ye also go away? he says. And that saying, Thou hast a devil, was uttered by those who already believed. Was he not continually a fugitive, sometimes in Galilee and sometimes in Judea? Was not his trial great, even from the swaddling clothes? When he was yet a young child, did not his mother take him and go down into Egypt? For all these reasons, he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. To him, then, let us look, also to the sufferings of his disciples, reading the writings of Paul, and hearing him say, In much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments. And again, even to this present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place, and labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. Has any one of us suffered the smallest part of these things? For he says we are as deceivers, as dishonored, as having nothing. And again, of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. A night and day have I been in the deep, in journeyings often, in tribulations, in distress, in hunger. And that these things seem good to God, hear him saying. For this I besought the Lord thrice, and he said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Wherefore, he says, I take pleasure in infirmities, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Moreover, hear Christ himself saying, In the world ye shall have tribulation. Verse 3 for consider, saith he, him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. For if the sufferings of those near us arouse us, what earnestness will not those of our master give us? What will they not work in us? And passing by all else, he expressed the whole by the word contradiction, and by adding such. For the blows upon the cheek the laughter, the insults, the reproaches, the mockeries, all these he indicated by contradiction, and not these only, but also the things which befell him during his whole life of teaching. For a great, a truly great consolation are both the sufferings of Christ and those of the apostles, for he so well knew that this is the better way of virtue as even to go that way himself, not having need thereof, he knew so well that tribulation is expedient for us, and that it becomes rather a foundation for repose. For hear him saying, 
if a man take not his cross and follow after me he is not worthy of me if thou art a disciple he means imitate the master for this is to be a disciple but if while he went by the path of affliction thou goest by that of ease thou no longer treadest the same path which he trod but another how then dost thou follow when thou followest not how shalt thou be a disciple not going after the master this paul also says we are weak but ye are strong we are despised but ye are honoured how is it reasonable he means that we should be striving after opposite things and yet that you should be disciples and we teachers affliction then is a great thing beloved for it accomplishes two great things it wipes out sins and it makes men strong what then you say if it overthrow and destroy affliction does not do this but our own slothfulness how you say if we are sober and watchful if we beseech god that he would not suffer us to be tempted above that we are able if we always hold fast to him we shall stand nobly and set ourselves against our enemy so long as we have him for our helper though temptations blow more violently than all the winds they will be to us as chaff and a leaf borne lightly along hear paul saying in all these things are his words we are more than conquerors and again for i reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us and again for the light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory consider what great dangers shipwrecks afflictions one upon another and other such things he calls light and emulate this inflexible one who wore this body simply and heedlessly thou art in poverty but not in such as paul who was tried by hunger and thirst and nakedness for he suffered this not for one day but endured it continually whence does this appear hear himself saying even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked oh how great glory did he already have in preaching when he was undergoing so great afflictions having now reached the twentieth year thereof at the time when he wrote this for he says i knew a man fourteen years ago whether in the body or out of the body i know not and again after three years he says i went up to jerusalem and again hear him saying it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void and not only this but again also in writing he said we are become as the filth of the world what is more difficult to endure than hunger what than freezing cold what than plottings made by brethren whom he afterwards calls false brethren was he not called the pest of the world an impostor a subverter was he not cut with scourgings these things let us take into our mind beloved let us consider them let us hold them in remembrance and then we shall never faint though we be wronged though we be plundered though we suffer innumerable evils let it be granted us to be approved in heaven and all things are endurable let it be granted us to fare well there and things here are of no account these things are a shadow and a dream whatever they may be they are nothing either in nature or in duration while those are hoped for and expected for what wouldst thou that we should compare with those fearful things what with the unquenchable fire with the never dying worm which of the things here canst thou name in comparison with the gnashing of teeth with the chains and the outer darkness with the wrath the tribulation the anguish but as to duration why what are ten thousand years to ages boundless and without end not so much as a little drop to the boundless ocean but what about the good things there the superiority is still greater eye hath not seen it is said 
ear hath not heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. And these things again shall be during boundless ages. For the sake of these, then, were it not well to be cut by scourgings, times out of number, to be slain, to be burned, to undergo ten thousand deaths, to endure everything whatsoever that is dreadful both in word and deed? For even if it were possible for one to live when burning in the fire, ought one not to endure all for the sake of attaining to those good things promised? End of Homily 28, Part 1homily twenty eight part two of homilies on hebrews by st john chrysostom this librivox recording is in the public domain homily twenty eight but why do i trifle in saying these things to men who do not even choose to disregard riches but hold fast to them as though they were immortal and if they give a little out of much think they have done all this is not almsgiving for almsgiving is that of the widow who emptied out all her living. But if thou dost not go on to contribute so much as the widow, yet at least contribute the whole of thy superfluity. Keep what is sufficient, not what is superfluous. But there is no one who contributes even his superabundance. For so long as thou hast many servants, and garments of silk, these things are all superfluities nothing is indispensable or necessary without which we are able to live these things are superfluous and are simply superadded let us then see if you please what we cannot live without if we have only two servants we can live for whereas some live without servants what excuse have we if we are not content with two we can also have a house built of brick of three rooms and this were sufficient for us for are there not some with children and wife who have but one room? And there be also, if you will, two serving boys. How is it not a shame, you say, that a gentlewoman should walk out with only two servants? It is no shame that a gentlewoman should walk abroad with two servants, but it is a shame that she should go forth with many. Perhaps you laugh when you hear this. Believe me, it is a shame. Do you think it a great matter to go out with many servants, like dealers in sheep or dealers in slaves? This is pride and vainglory, the other is philosophy and respectability. For a gentlewoman ought not to be known from the multitude of her attendants. For what virtue is it to have many slaves? This belongs not to the soul, and whatever is not of the soul does not show gentility. When she is content with a few things, then is she a gentlewoman indeed but when she needs many she is a servant and inferior to slaves tell me do not the angels go to and fro about the world alone and need not any one to follow them are they then on this account inferior to us they who need no attendance to us who need them if then not needing an attendant at all is angelic who comes nearer to the angelic life she who needs many attendants, or she who needs few. Is not this a shame? For a shame it is to do anything out of place. Tell me who attracts the attention of those who are in the public places, she who brings many in her train, or she who brings but few. And is not she who is alone less conspicuous even than she who is attended by few? seest thou that this first-named conduct is a shame who attracts the attention of those in the public places she who wears beautiful garments or she who is dressed simply and artlessly again who attracts those in the public places she who is borne on mules and with trappings ornamented with gold or she who walks out simply and as it may be with propriety or we do not even look at this latter, if we even see her. But the multitudes not only force their way to see the other, but also ask, Who is she, and where from? And I do not say how great envy is hereby produced. What then tell me? Is it disgraceful to be looked at, or not to be looked at? 
when is the shame greater when all stare at her or when no one does when they inform themselves about her or when they do not even care seest thou that we do everything not for modesty's sake but for vainglory however since it is impossible to draw you away from that i am content for the present that you should learn that this conduct is no disgrace sin alone is a disgrace which no one thinks to be a disgrace sin alone is a disgrace which no one thinks to be a disgrace but everything rather than this let your dress be such as is needful not superfluous however that we may not shut you up too narrowly this i assure you that we have no need of ornaments of gold or of lace and it is not i who say this for that the words are not mine hear the blessed paul saying and solemnly charging women to adorn themselves not with platings of the hair or gold or pearls or costly apparel but with what kind o paul wouldst thou tell us or perhaps they will say that only golden things are costly and that silks are not costly tell us with what kind thou wouldest but having food and raiment let us therewith he says be content let our garment be such as merely to cover us for god hath given them to us for this reason that we may cover our nakedness and this any sort of garment can do though but of trifling cost perhaps ye laugh who wear dresses of silk for in truth one may well laugh considering what paul enjoined and what we practice but my discourse is not addressed to women only but also to men for the rest of the things which ye have are all superfluous only the poor possess no superfluities and perhaps they too from necessity since if it had been in their power even they would not have abstained from them nevertheless whether in pretense or in truth so far they have no superfluities let us then wear such clothes as are sufficient for our need for what does much gold mean to those on the stage these things are fitting this apparel belongs to them to harlots to those who do everything to be looked at let her beautify herself who is on the stage or the dancing platform for she wishes to attract all to her but a woman who professes godliness let her not beautify herself thus but in a different way thou hast a means of beautifying thyself far better than that thou also hast a theatre for that theatre make thyself beautiful clothe thyself with those garments what is thy theatre heaven the company of angels i speak not of virgins only but also of those in the world all as many as believe in christ have that theatre let us speak such things that we may please those spectators put on such garments that thou mayest gratify them for tell me if a harlot putting aside her golden ornaments and her robes and her laughter and her witty and unchaste talk clothe herself with a cheap garment and having dressed herself simply come on the stage and utter religious words and discourse of chastity and say nothing indelicate will not all rise up will not this theatre be dispersed will they not cast her out as one who does not know how to suit herself to the crowd and speak things foreign to that satanic theatre so thou also if thou enter into the theatre of heaven clad with her garments the spectators will cast thee out for there there is no need of these garments of gold but of different ones of what kind of such as the prophet names clothed in fringed work of gold and in varied colours not so as to make the body white and glistering but so as to beautify the soul for the soul it is which is contending and wrestling in that theatre all the glory of the king's daughter is from within it says with these do thou clothe thyself for so thou both deliverest thyself from other evils innumerable and thy husband from anxiety and thyself from care for so thou wilt be respected by thy husband when thou needest not many things 
for every man is wont to be shy towards those who make request of him but when he sees that they have no need of him then he lets down his pride and converses with them as equals when thy husband sees that thou hast no need of him in anything that thou thinkest lightly of the presents which come from him then even though he may be very arrogant he will respect thee more than if thou wert clad in golden ornaments and thou wilt no longer be his slave for those of whom we stand in need we are compelled to stoop to but if we restrain ourselves we shall no longer be regarded as criminals but he knows that we pay him obedience from the fear of god not for what is given by him for now when that he confers great favours on us whatever honour he receives he thinks he has not received all that is due to him but then though he obtain but a little he will account it a favour he does not reproach nor will he be himself compelled to overreach on thy account for what is more unreasonable than to provide golden ornaments to be worn in baths and in market-places however in baths and in market-places it is perhaps no wonder but that a woman should come into church so decked out is very ridiculous for for what possible reason does she come in here wearing golden ornaments she who ought to come in that she may hear the precept that they adorn not themselves with gold nor pearls nor costly array with what object then a woman dost thou come is it indeed to fight with paul and show that even if he repeat these things ten thousand times thou regardest them not or is it as wishing to put us your teachers to shame as discoursing on these subjects in vain for tell me if any heathen and unbeliever after he has heard the passage read where the blessed paul says these things having a believing wife sees that she makes much account of beautifying herself and puts on ornaments of gold that she may come into church and hear paul charging the women that they adorn themselves neither with gold nor with pearls nor with costly array will he not indeed say to himself when he sees her in her little room putting on these things and arranging them beautifully why is my wife staying within her little room why is she so slow why is she putting on her golden ornaments where has she to go into the church for what purpose to hear not with costly array will he not smile will he not burst out into laughter will he not think our religion a mockery and a deceit wherefore i beseech you let us leave golden ornaments to processions to theatres to signs on the shops but let not the image of god be decked out with these things let the gentlewoman be adorned with gentility and gentility is the absence of pride and of boastful display nay even if thou wish to obtain glory from men thou wilt obtain it thus for we shall not wonder so much that the wife of a rich man wears gold and silk for this is the common practice of them all as when she is dressed in a plain and simple garment made merely of wool this all will admire this they will applaud for in that adorning indeed of ornaments of gold and of costly apparel she has many to share with her and if she surpass one she is surpassed by another yea even if she surpass all she must yield the palm to the empress herself but in the other case she outdoes all even the emperor's wife herself for she alone in wealth has chosen the dress of the poor so that even if we desire glory here too the glory is greater i say this not only to widows and to the rich for here the necessity of widowhood seems to cost this but to those also who have a husband but you say i do not please my husband if i dress plainly it is not the husband thou wishest to please but the multitude of poor women or rather not to please them but to make them pine with envy and to give them pain and make their poverty greater how many blasphemies are uttered because of thee let there be no poverty say they god hates the poor god loves not those in poverty for that it is not thy husband whom thou wishest to please and for this reason thou deckest thyself out 
thou makest plain to all by what thou thyself doest for as soon as thou hast passed over the threshold of thy chamber thou immediately puttest off all both the robes and the golden ornaments and the pearls and at home of all places thou dost not wear them but if thou really wishest to please thy husband there are ways of pleasing him by gentleness by meekness by propriety for believe me o woman even if thy husband be infinitely debased these are the things which will more effectually win him gentleness propriety freedom from pride and expensiveness and extravagance for even if thou devise ten thousand such things thou wilt not restrain the profligate and this they know who have had such husbands for however thou mayest beautify thyself he being a profligate will go off to a courtesan while the husband that is chaste and regular thou wilt gain not by these means but by the opposite yea by these thou even causest him pain clothing thyself with the reputation of a lover of the world for what if thy husband out of respect and that as a sober-minded man does not speak yet inwardly he will condemn thee and will not conceal ill-will and jealousy wilt thou not drive away all pleasure for the future by exciting ill-will against thyself possibly you are annoyed at hearing what is said and are indignant saying he irritates husbands still more against their wives i say this not to irritate your husbands but i wish that these things should be done by you willingly for your own sakes not for theirs not to free them from envy but to free you from the parade of this life dost thou wish to appear beautiful i also wish it but with beauty which god seeks which the king desires whom wouldst thou have as a lover god or men shouldst thou be beautiful with that beauty god will desire thy beauty but if with the other apart from this he will abominate thee and thy lovers will be profligates for no man who loves a married woman is good consider this even in regard to the adorning that is external for the other adorning i mean that of the soul attracts god but this again profligates seest thou that i care for you that i am anxious for you that ye may be beautiful really beautiful splendid really splendid that instead of profligate men ye may have for your lover god the lord of all and she who has him for her lover to whom will she be like she has her place among the choir of angels for if one who is beloved of a king is accounted happy above all what will her dignity be who is beloved of god with much love though thou put the whole world in the balance against it there is nothing equivalent to that beauty this beauty let us then cultivate with these embellishments let us adorn ourselves that we may pass into the heavens into the spiritual chambers into the nuptial chamber that is undefiled for this beauty is liable to be destroyed by anything and when it lasts well and neither disease nor anxiety impair it which is impossible it does not last twenty years but the other is ever blooming ever in its prime there there is no change to fear no old age coming brings a wrinkle no undermining disease withers it no desponding anxiety disfigures it but it is far above all these things but this earthly beauty takes flight before it appears and if it appears it has not many admirers for those of well-ordered minds do not admire it and those who do admire it admire with wantonness let us not therefore cultivate this beauty but the other let us have that so that with bright torches we may pass into the bridal chamber for not to virgins only has this been promised but to virgin souls for had it belonged merely to virgins those five would not have been shut out this then belongs to all who are virgins in soul who are freed from worldly imaginations for these imaginations corrupt our souls 
if therefore we remain unpolluted we shall depart thither and shall be accepted for i have espoused you he says to one husband to present you a chaste virgin unto christ these things he said not with reference to virgins but to the whole body of the entire church for the uncorrupt soul is a virgin though she have a husband she is a virgin as to that which is virginity indeed that which is worthy of admiration for this of the body is but the accompaniment and shadow of the other while that is the true virginity this let us cultivate and so shall we be able with cheerful countenance to behold the bridegroom to enter in with bright torches if the oil do not fail us if by melting down our golden ornaments we procure such oil as makes our lamps bright and this oil is loving-kindness if we impart what we have to others if we make oil therefrom then it will protect us and we shall not say at that time give us oil for our lamps are going out nor shall we beg of others nor shall we be shut out when we are gone to them that sell nor shall we hear that fearful and terrible voice while we are knocking at the doors i know you not but he will acknowledge us and we shall go in with the bridegroom and having entered into the spiritual bridal chamber we shall enjoy good things innumerable for if here the bride chamber is so bright the rooms so splendid that none is weary of observing them much more there heaven is the chamber and the bride chamber better than heaven then we shall enter but if the bride chamber is so beautiful what will the bridegroom be and why do i say let us put away our golden ornaments and give to the needy for if ye ought even to sell yourselves if ye ought to become slaves instead of free women that so ye might be able to be with that bridegroom to enjoy that beauty nay merely to look on that countenance ought you not with ready mind to welcome all things we look at and admire a king upon the earth but when we see a king and a bridegroom both much more ought we to welcome him with readiness truly these things are a shadow while those are a reality and a king and a bridegroom in heaven to be counted worthy also to go before him with torches to be near him and to be ever with him what ought we not to do what should we not perform what should we not endure i entreat you let us conceive some desire for those blessings let us long for that bridegroom let us be virgins as to the true virginity for the lord seeks after the virginity of the soul with this let us enter into heaven not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing that we may attain also to the good things promised of which may we all be partakers through the grace and mercy of jesus christ our lord with whom to the father together with the holy ghost be glory power honour now and ever and world without end amen End of homily twenty eight homily twenty nine of homilies on hebrews by st john chrysostom this librivox recording is in the public domain homily twenty nine hebrews twelve four through six ye have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children my son despise not thou the chastening of the lord nor faint when thou art rebuked of him for whom the lord loveth he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth there are two kinds of consolation apparently opposed to one another but yet contributing great strength each to the other both of which he has here put forward the one is when we say that persons have suffered much for the soul is refreshed when it has many witnesses of its own sufferings and this he introduced above saying call to mind the former days 
in which after ye had been illuminated ye endured a great fight of afflictions the other is when we say thou hast suffered no great thing the former when the soul has been exhausted refreshes it and makes it recover breath the latter when it has become indolent and supine turns it again and pulls down pride thus that no pride may spring up in them from that testimony to their sufferings see what he does ye have not yet he says resisted unto blood striving against sin and he did not at once go on with what follows but after having shown them all those who had stood unto blood and then brought in the glory of christ his sufferings he afterwards easily pursued his discourse this he says also in writing to the corinthians there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man that is small for this is enough to arouse and set right the soul when it considers that it has not risen to the whole trial and encourages itself from what has already befallen it what he means is this ye have not yet submitted to death your loss is extended to money to reputation to being driven from place to place christ however shed his blood for you while you have not done it for yourselves he contended for the truth even unto death fighting for you while ye have not yet entered upon dangers that threaten death and ye have forgotten the exhortation that is and ye have slackened your hands ye have become faint ye have not yet he said resisted unto blood striving against sin here he indicates that sin is both very vigorous and is itself armed for the expression ye have resisted stood firm against is used with reference to those who stand firm which he says speaketh unto you as unto sons my son despise not thou the chastening of the lord nor faint when thou art rebuked of him he has drawn his encouragement from the facts themselves over and above he adds also that which is drawn from arguments from this testimony faint not he says when thou art rebuked of him it follows that these things are of god for this too is no small matter of consolation when we learn that it is god's work that such things have power he allowing them even as also paul says he said unto me my grace is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness he it is who allows them for whom the lord loveth he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth thou canst not say that any righteous man is without affliction even if he appear to be so yet we know not his other afflictions so that of necessity every righteous man must pass through affliction for it is a declaration of christ that the wide and broad way leads to destruction but the straight and narrow one to life if then it is possible to enter into life by that means and is not by any other then all have entered in by the narrow way as many as have departed unto life verse seven ye endure chastisement he says not for punishment nor for vengeance nor for suffering see from that from which they supposed they had been deserted of god from these he says they may be confident that they have not been deserted it is as if he had said because ye have suffered so many evils do you suppose that god has left you and hates you if ye did not suffer then it were right to suppose this for if he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth he who is not scourged perhaps is not a son what then you say do not bad men suffer distress they suffer indeed how then he did not say every one who is scourged is a son but every son is scourged for in all cases he scourges his son what is wanted then is to show whether any son is not scourged but that would it not be able to say there are many wicked men also who are scourged such as murderers robbers sorcerers plunderers of tombs 
these however are paying the penalty of their own wickedness and are not scourged as sons but punished as wicked but ye as sons then again he argues from the general custom seest thou how he brings up arguments from all quarters from facts in the scripture from its words from our own notions from examples in ordinary life verse eight but if ye be without chastisement etc seest thou that he said what i just mentioned that it is not possible to be a son without being chastened for as in families fathers care not for bastards though they learn nothing though they be not distinguished but fear for their legitimate sons lest they should be indolent so here if then not to be chastised is a mark of bastards we ought to rejoice at chastisement if this be a sign of legitimacy god dealeth with you as with sons for this very cause verse nine furthermore we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence again he reasons from their own experiences from what they themselves suffered for as he says above call to mind the former days so here also god he saith dealeth with you as with sons and ye could not say we cannot bear it yea as with sons tenderly beloved for if they reverence their fathers of the flesh how shall not you reverence your heavenly father however the difference arises not from this alone nor from the persons but also from the cause itself and from the fact for it is not on the same grounds that he and they inflict chastisement but they did it with a view to what seemed good to them that is fulfilling their own pleasure oftentimes and not always looking to what was expedient but here that cannot be said for he does this not for any interest of his own but for you and for your benefit alone they did it that ye might be useful to themselves also oftentimes without reason but here there is nothing of this kind seest thou that this also brings consolation for we are most closely attached to those earthly parents when we see that not for any interest of their own they either command or advise us but the earnestness is wholly and solely on our account for this is genuine love and love in reality when we are beloved though we be of no use to him who loves us not that he may receive but that he may impart he chastens he does everything he uses all diligence that we may become capable of receiving his benefits verse ten for they verily he says for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness what is of his holiness it is of his purity so as to become worthy of him according to our power he earnestly desires that ye may receive and he does all that he may give you do ye not earnestly endeavour that ye may receive i said unto the lord one says thou art my lord for of my goods thou hast no need furthermore he saith we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence shall we not much rather be in subjection to the father of spirits and live to the father of spirits whether of spiritual gifts or of prayers or of the incorporeal powers if we die thus then we shall live for they indeed for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure for what seems so is not always profitable but he for our profit therefore chastisement is profitable therefore chastisement is a participation of holiness yea and this greatly for when it casts out sloth and evil desire and love of the things of this life when it helps the soul when it causes a light esteem of all things here for affliction does this is it not holy does it not draw down the grace of the spirit 
let us consider the righteous from what cause they all shone brightly forth was it not from affliction and if you will let us enumerate them from the first and from the very beginning abel noah himself for it is not possible that he being the only one in that so great multitude of the wicked should not have been afflicted for it is said noah being alone perfect in his generation pleased god for consider i beseech you if now when we have innumerable persons whose virtue we may emulate fathers and children and teachers we are thus distressed what must we suppose he suffered alone among so many but should i speak of the circumstances of that strange and wonderful reign or should i speak of abraham his wanderings one upon another the carrying away of his wife the dangers the wars the famines should i speak of isaac what fearful things he underwent driven from every place and labouring in vain and toiling for others or of jacob for indeed to enumerate all his afflictions is not necessary but it is reasonable to bring forward the testimony which he himself gave when speaking with pharaoh few and evil are my days and they have not attained to the days of my fathers or should i speak of joseph himself or of moses or of joshua or of david or of elijah or of samuel or wouldst thou that i speak of all the prophets wilt thou not find that all these were made illustrious from their afflictions tell me then dost thou desire to become illustrious from ease and luxury but thou canst not or should i speak of the apostles nay but they went beyond all and christ said this in the world ye shall have tribulation and again ye shall weep and lament but the world shall rejoice and that straight and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life the lord of the way said that it is narrow and straight and dost thou seek the broad way how is this not unreasonable in consequence thou wilt not arrive at life going another way but at destruction for thou hast chosen the path which leads thither wouldst thou that i bring before you those that live in luxury let us ascend from the last to the first the rich man who is burning in the furnace the jews who live for the belly whose god is their belly who were ever seeking ease in the wilderness were destroyed as also those in sodom on account of their gluttony and those in the time of noah was it not because they chose this soft and dissolute life for they luxuriated it says in fullness of bread it speaks of those in sodom but if fullness of bread wrought so great evil what should we say of other delicacies esau was not he in ease and what if those who being of the sons of god looked on women and were borne down the precipice and what of those who were maddened by inordinate lust and all the kings of the nations of the babylonians of the egyptians did they not perish miserably are they not in torment and as to things now tell me are they not the same hear christ saying they that wear soft clothing are in kings houses but they who do not wear such things are in heaven for the soft garment relaxes even the austere soul breaks it and enervates it yea even if it meet with a body rough and hard it speedily by such delicate treatment makes it soft and weak for tell me for what other reason do you suppose women are so weak is it from their sex only by no means but from their way of living and their bringing up for their avoiding exposure their inactivity their baths their unguents their multitude of perfumes the delicate softness of their couches makes them in the end such as they are and that thou mayest understand attend to what i say tell me take from a garden a tree from those standing in the uncultivated part and beaten by the winds 
and plant it in a moist and shady place and thou wilt find it very unworthy of that from which thou didst originally take it and that this is true appears from the fact that women brought up in the country are stronger than citizens of towns and they would overcome many such in wrestling for when the body becomes more effeminate of necessity the soul also shares the mischief since for the most part its energies are affected in accordance with the body for in illness we are different persons owing to weakness and when we become well we are different again for as in the case of a string when the tones are weak and relaxed and not well arranged the excellence of the art is also destroyed being obliged to serve the ill condition of the strings so in the case of the body also the soul receives from it many hurts many necessities for when it needs much nursing the other endures a bitter servitude wherefore i beseech you let us make it strong by work and not nurse it as an invalid my discourse is not to men only but to women also for why dost thou o woman continually enfeeble thy body with luxury and exhaust it why dost thou ruin thy strength with fat this fat is flabbiness not strength whereas if thou break off from these things and manage thyself differently then will thy personal beauty also improve according to thy wish when strength and a good habit of body are there if however thou beset it with ten thousand diseases there will neither be bloom of complexion nor good health for thou wilt always be in low spirits and you know that as when the air is smiling it makes a beautiful house look splendid so also cheerfulness of mind when added to a fair countenance makes it better but if a woman is in low spirits and in pain she becomes more ill-looking but diseases and pains produce low spirits and diseases are produced from the body too delicate through great luxury so that even for this you will flee luxury if you take my advice but you will say luxury gives pleasure yes but not so great as the annoyances and besides the pleasure goes no further than the palate and the tongue for when the table has been removed and the food swallowed thou wilt be like one that is not partaken or rather much worse in that thou bearest thence oppression and distension and headache and a sleep like death and often too sleeplessness from repletion and obstruction of the breathing and erectation and thou wouldest curse bitterly thy belly when thou oughtest to curse thy immoderate eating let us not then fatten the body but listen to paul saying make not provision for the flesh to fulfil the lust thereof as if one should take food and throw it into a drain so is he who throws it into the belly or rather it is not so but much worse for in the one case he uses the drain without harm to himself but in the other he generates innumerable diseases for what nourishes is a sufficiency which also can be digested but what is over and above our need not only does not nourish but even spoils the other but no man sees these things owing to some prejudice and unseasonable pleasure dost thou wish to nourish the body take away what is superfluous give what is sufficient and as much as can be digested do not load it lest thou overwhelm it a sufficiency is both nourishment and pleasure for nothing is so productive of pleasure as food well digested nothing so productive of health nothing so productive of acuteness of the faculties nothing tends so much to keep away disease for a sufficiency is both nourishment and pleasure and health but excess is injury and unpleasantness and disease for what famine does that also satiety does or rather more grievous evils for the former indeed within a few days carries a man off and sets him free but the other eating into and putrefying the body gives it over to long disease and then to a most painful death but we while we account famine a thing greatly to be dreaded yet run after satiety which is more distressing than that 
Whence is this disease? Whence this madness? I do not say that we should waste ourselves away, but that we should eat as much food as also gives us pleasure, that is really pleasure, and can nourish the body, and furnish it to us well ordered and adapted for the energies of the soul, well joined and fitted together. But when it comes to be waterlogged by luxury, it cannot in the flood wave keep fast the bolts themselves, as one may say, and joints which hold the frame together. For the flood wave coming in, the whole breaks up and scatters. Make not provision for the flesh, he says, to fulfill the lust thereof. He said, well, for luxury is fuel for unreasonable lust, though the luxurious should be the most philosophical of all men. Of necessity he must be somewhat affected by wine, by eating. He must needs be relaxed. He must needs endure the greater flame. Hence come fornications, hence adulteries. For a hungry belly cannot generate lust, or rather not one which has used just enough. But that which generates unseemly lust is that which is relaxed by luxury. And as land which is very moist, and a dunghill which is wet through and retains much dampness generates worms, while that which has been freed from such moistness bears abundant fruits, when it has nothing immoderate, even if it be not cultivated, it yields grass, and if it be cultivated, fruits. So also do we. Let us not then make our flesh useless or unprofitable or hurtful, but let us plant in it useful fruits and fruit-bearing trees. Let us not enfeeble them by luxury, for they too put forth worms instead of fruit when they are become rotten. So also implanted desire, if thou moisten it above measure, generates unreasonable pleasures, yea, the most exceedingly unreasonable. Let us then remove this pernicious evil, that we may be able to attain the good things promised us in Christ Jesus our Lord, with whom to the Father, together with the Holy Spirit, be glory now and ever and world without end. Amen. End of homily 29Homily 30 of Homilies on Hebrews by St. John Chrysostom. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Homily 30, Hebrews 12, 11 through 13. No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. They who drink bitter medicines first submit to some unpleasantness, and afterwards feel the benefit, for such is virtue, such is vice. In the latter there is first the pleasure, then the despondency. In the former first the despondency, and then the pleasure. But there is no equality, for it is not the same to be first grieved and afterwards pleased, and to be first pleased and afterwards grieved. How so? Because in the latter case the expectation of coming despondency makes the present pleasure less but in the former the expectation of coming pleasure cuts away the violence of present despondency, so that the result is that in the one instance we never have pleasure, in the latter we never have grief. And the difference does not lie in this only, but also in other ways. As how? That the duration is not equal, but far greater and more ample. And here, too, it is still more so in things spiritual. From this consideration, then, Paul undertakes to console them, and again takes up the common judgment of men, which no one is able to stand against, nor to contend with the common decision, when one says what is acknowledged by all. Ye are suffering, he says, for such is chastisement, such is its beginning, for no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Well, said he, seemeth not chastisement he means is not grievous but seemeth so 
all chastisement not this and that but all both human and spiritual seest thou that he argues from our common notions seemeth he says to be grievous so that it is not really so for what sort of grief brings forth joy so neither does pleasure bring forth despondency nevertheless afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruits of righteousness to them which have been exercised thereby not fruit but fruit a great abundance to them he says which have been exercised thereby what is to them which have been exercised thereby to them that have endured for a long while and been patient and he uses an auspicious expression so then chastisement is exercise making the athlete strong and invincible in combat irresistible in wars if then all chastisement be such this also will be such so that we ought to look for good things for a sweet and peaceful end and do not wonder if being itself hard it has sweet fruits since in trees also the bark is almost destitute of all quality and rough but the fruits are sweet but he took it from the common notion if therefore we ought to look for such things why do ye vex yourselves why after ye have endured the painful do ye despond as to the good the distasteful things which ye had to endure ye endured do not then despond as to the recompense he speaks as to runners and boxers and warriors seest thou he arms them how he encourages them walk straight he says here he speaks with reference to their thoughts that is to say not doubting for if the chastisement be of love if it begin from loving care if it end with a good result and this he proves both by facts and by words and by all considerations why are ye dispirited for such are they who despair who are not strengthened by the hope of the future walk straight he says that your lameness may not be increased but brought back to its former condition for he that runs when he is lame galls the sore place seest thou that it is in our power to be thoroughly healed verse fourteen follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord what he also said above not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together he hints at in this place also for nothing so especially makes persons easily vanquished and subdued in temptations as isolation for tell me scatter a phalanx in war and the enemy will need no trouble but will take them prisoners coming on them separately and thereby the more helpless follow peace with all men and holiness he says therefore with the evil doers as well if it be possible he says as much as lieth in you live peaceably with all men for thy part he means live peaceably doing no harm to religion but in whatever thou art ill-treated bear it nobly for the bearing with evil is a great weapon in trials thus christ also made his disciples strong by saying behold I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, and harmless as doves. What dost thou say? Are we among wolves? And dost thou bid us to be as sheep, and as doves? Yea, he says, for nothing so shames him that is doing us evil, as bearing nobly the things which are brought upon us, and not avenging ourselves either by word or by deed this both makes us more philosophical ourselves and procures a greater reward and also benefits them but has such an one been insolent do thou bless him see how much thou wilt gain from this thou hast quenched the evil thou hast procured to thyself a reward thou hast made him ashamed and thou hast suffered nothing serious follow peace with all men and holiness what does he mean by holiness chaste and orderly living in marriage if any man is unmarried he says let him remain pure let him marry or if he be married let him not commit fornication but let him live with his own wife for this also is holiness how 
marriage is not holiness but marriage preserves the holiness which proceeds from faith not permitting union with a harlot for marriage is honourable not holy marriage is pure it does not however also give holiness except by forbidding the defilement of that holiness which has been given by our faith without which he says no man shall see the lord which he also says in the epistle to the corinthians be not deceived neither fornicators nor adulterers nor idolaters nor effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind nor covetous persons nor thieves nor drunkards nor revilers nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of god for how shall he who has become the body of a harlot how shall he be able to be the body of christ verse fifteen looking diligently lest any man come short of the grace of god lest any root of bitterness bringing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled lest there be any fornicator or profane person dost thou see how everywhere he puts the common salvation into the hands of each individual exhorting one another daily he says while it is called to-day do not then cast all the burden on your teachers do not cast all upon them who have the rule over you ye also he means are able to edify one another which also he said in writing to the thessalonians edify one another even as also ye do and again comfort one another with these words this we also now exhort you if ye be willing ye will have more success with each other than we can have for ye both are with one another for a longer time and ye know more than we of each other's affairs and ye are not ignorant of each other's failings and ye have more freedom of speech and love and intimacy and these are no small advantages for teaching but great and opportune introductions for it ye will be more able than we both to reprove and to exhort and not this only but because i am but one whereas ye are many and ye will be able however many to be teachers wherefore i entreat you do not neglect this gift each one of you has a wife has a friend has a servant has a neighbour let him reprove him let him exhort him for how is it not absurd with regard to bodily nourishment to make associations for messing together and for drinking together and to have a set day whereon to club with one another as they say and to make up by the association what each person being alone by himself falls short of as for instance if it be necessary to go to a funeral or to a dinner or to assist a neighbour in any matter and not to do this for the purpose of instruction in virtue yea i entreat you let no man neglect it for great is the reward he receives from god and that thou mayest understand he who was entrusted with the five talents is the teacher and he with the one is the learner if the learner should say i am a learner i run no risk and should hide the reason which he received of god that common and simple reason and give no advice should not speak plainly should not rebuke should not admonish if he is able but should bury his talents in the earth for truly that heart is earth and ashes which hides the gift of god if then he hides it either from indolence or from wickedness it will be no defence to him to say i had but one talent thou hadst one talent thou oughtest then to have brought one besides and to have doubled the talent if thou hadst brought one in addition thou wouldst not have been blamed for neither did he say to him who brought the two wherefore hast thou not brought five but he accounted him of the same worth with him who brought the five why because he gained as much as he had and because he had received fewer than one entrusted with the five he was not on this account negligent nor did he use the smallness of his trust as an excuse for idleness and thou oughtest not to have looked to him who had the two or rather thou oughtest to have looked to him and as he having two imitated him who had five so oughtest thou to have emulated him who had two 
for if for him who has means and does not give there is punishment how shall there not be the greatest punishment for him who is able to exhort in any way and does it not in the former case the body is nourished in the latter the soul there thou preventest temporal death here eternal but i have no skill of speech you say but there is no need of skill of speech nor of eloquence if thou see a friend going into fornication say to him why art thou going after an evil thing art thou not ashamed dost thou not blush this is wrong why dost he not know you say that it is wrong yes but he is dragged on by lust they that are sick also know that it is bad to drink cold water nevertheless they need persons who shall hinder them from it for he who is suffering will not easily be able to help himself in his sickness there is need therefore of thee who art in health for his cure and if he be not persuaded by thy words watch for him as he goes away and hold him fast peradventure he will be ashamed and what advantage is it you say when he does this for my sake and because he has been held back by me do not then be too minute in thy calculations for a while by whatever means withdraw him from his evil practice let him be accustomed not to go off to that pit whether through thee or through any means whatever when thou hast accustomed him not to go then by taking him after he has gained breath a little thou wilt be able to teach him that he ought to do this for god's sake and not for man's do not wish to make all right at once since you cannot but do it gently and by degrees if thou see him going off to drinking or to parties where there is nothing but drunkenness then also do the same and again on the other hand entreat him if he observe that thou hast any failing to help thee and to set thee right for in this way he will even of himself bear reproof when he sees both that thou needest reproofs as well and that thou helpest him not as one that has done everything right nor as a teacher but as a friend and a brother say to him i have done thee a service in reminding thee of things expedient do thou also whatever failing thou seest me have hold me back set me right if thou see me irritable if avaricious restrain me bind me by exhortation this is friendship thus brother aided by brother becomes a fortified city for not eating and drinking makes friendship such friendship even robbers have and murderers but if we are friends if we truly care for one another let us in these respects help one another this leads us to a profitable friendship let us hinder those things which lead away to hell therefore let not him that is reproved be indignant for we are men and we have failings neither let him who reproves do it as exulting over him and making a display but privately with gentleness he that reproves has need of greater gentleness that thus he may persuade them to bear the cutting do you not see surgeons when they burn when they cut with how great gentleness they apply their treatment much more ought those who reprove others to act thus for reproof is sharper even than fire and knife and makes men start on this account surgeons take great pains to make them bear the cutting quietly and apply it as tenderly as possible even giving in a little then giving time to take a breath so ought we also to offer reproofs that the reproved may not start away even if therefore it be necessary to be insulted yea even to be struck let us not decline it for those also who are cut by the surgeons utter numberless cries against those who are cutting them they however heed none of these things but only the health of the patients so indeed in this case also we ought to do all things that our reproof may be effectual to bear all things looking to the reward which is in store bear ye one another's burdens saith he and so fulfil the law of christ so then both reproving and bearing with one another shall we be able to fulfil edification 
and thus will ye make the labour light for us, in all things taking a part with us, and stretching out a hand, and becoming sharers and partakers, both in one another's salvation, and each one in his own. Let us then endure patiently, both bearing one another's burdens, and reproving, that we may attain to the good things promised in Christ Jesus our Lord, with whom to the Father, together with the Holy Ghost, be glory, might, honour, now and for ever, and world without end. Amen. End of Homily 30Homily 31 of Homilies on Hebrews by St. John Chrysostom. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Homily 31, Hebrews 12, 14 through 17. Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no one shall see the Lord. There are many things characteristic of Christianity, but more than all, and better than all, love towards one another, and peace. Therefore Christ also saith, My peace I give unto you. And again, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one another. Therefore Paul too says, Follow peace with all men, and holiness, that is, purity, without which no man shall see the Lord looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of god as if they were travelling together on some long journey in a large company he says take heed that no man be left behind i do not seek this only that ye should arrive yourselves but also that ye should look diligently after the others lest any man he says fail of the grace of god he means the good things to come the faith of the gospel the best course of life, for they are all of the grace of God. Do not tell me it is but one that perisheth, even for one Christ died. Hast thou no care for him for whom Christ died? Looking diligently, he saith, that is, searching carefully, considering, thoroughly ascertaining, as is done in the case of sick persons, and in all ways examining, thoroughly ascertaining lest any root of bitterness bringing up trouble you. This is found in Deuteronomy, and he derived it from the metaphor of plants. Lest any root of bitterness, he says, which he said also in another place when he writes, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Not for his sake alone do I wish this, he means, but also on account of the harm arising therefrom. That is to say, even if there be a root of this kind, do not suffer any shoot to come up, but let it be cut off, that it may not bear its proper fruits, that so it may not defile and pollute the others also. For he saith, lest any root of bitterness bringing up trouble you, and by it many be defiled. And with good reason did he call sin bitter, for truly nothing is more bitter than sin, and they know it, who after they have committed it pine away under their conscience, who endure much bitterness. For being exceedingly bitter, it perverts the reasoning faculty itself. Such is the nature of what is bitter, it is unprofitable. And well said he, root of bitterness. He said not bitter, but of bitterness. For it is possible that a bitter root might bear sweet fruits, but it is not possible that a root and fountain and foundation of bitterness should ever bear sweet fruit for all is bitter it has nothing sweet all are bitter all unpleasant all full of hatred and abomination and by this he says many be defiled that is cut off the lascivious persons verse sixteen lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And wherein was Esau a fornicator? He does not say that Esau was a fornicator. Lest there be any fornicator, he says, then follow after holiness. Lest there be any, as Esau, profane, that is, gluttonous, without self-control, worldly, selling away things spiritual 
who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, who through his own slothfulness sold this honor which he had from God, and for a little pleasure lost the greatest honor and glory. This was suitable to them. This was the conduct of an abominable, of an unclean person, so that not only is the fornicator unclean, but also the glutton, the slave of his belly. For he is also a slave of a different pleasure. He is forced to be overreaching, he is forced to be rapacious, to behave himself unseemly in ten thousand ways, being the slave of that passion, and oftentimes he blasphemes. So he accounted his birthright to be nothing worth, that is, providing for temporary refreshment, he went even to the sacrifice of his birthright. So henceforth the birthright belongs to us, not to the Jews. And at the same time also this is added to their calamity, that the first is become last, and the second first, the one for courageous endurance, the other last for indolence. Verse 17 for ye know, he says, how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. What now is this? Doth he indeed exclude repentance? By no means. But how, you say, was it that he found no place of repentance? For if he condemned himself, if he made a great wailing, why did he find no place of repentance? Because it was not really a case of repentance. For as the grief of Cain was not of repentance, and the murder proved it, so also in this case, his words were not those of repentance, and the murder afterwards proved it. For even he also in intention slew Jacob. For the days of mourning for my father, he said, are at hand, then will I slay my brother Jacob. Tears had not power to give him repentance, and the apostle did not say, by repentance, simply, but even with tears he found no place of repentance. Why now? Because he did not repent as he ought, for this is repentance. He repented not as it behoved him. For how is it that he, the apostle, said this? How did he exhort them again after they had become sluggish? How when they were become lame? How when they were paralyzed? How when they were relaxed? For this is the beginning of a fall. He seems to me to hint at some fornicators amongst them, but not to wish at that time to correct them, but feigns ignorance that they might correct themselves. For it is right at first indeed to pretend ignorance, but afterwards, when they continue in sin, then to add reproof also, that so they may not become shameless, which Moses also did in the case of Zimri and the daughter of Cosby. For he found, he says, no place of repentance. He found not repentance, or that he sinned beyond repentance. There are then sins beyond repentance. His meaning is, let us not fall by an incurable fall, so long as it is a matter of lameness, it is easy to become upright. But if we turn out of the way, what will be left? For it is to those who have not yet fallen that he thus discourses, striking them with terror, and says that it is not possible for him who has fallen to obtain consolation. But to those who have fallen, that they may not fall into despair, he says the contrary, speaking thus, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. And again, whosoever of you are justified of the law are fallen from grace. Lo, he testifies that they had fallen away, for he that standeth, hearing that it is not possible to obtain pardon after having fallen, will be more zealous, and more cautious about his standing. If, however, thou use the same violence towards one also who is fallen, he will never rise again, for by what hope will he show forth the change? But he not only wept, you say, but also sought earnestly. He does not then exclude repentance, but makes them careful not to fall. As many then as do not believe in hell, 
let them call these things to mind as many as think to sin without being punished let them take account of these things why did esau not obtain pardon because he repented not as he ought wouldst thou see perfect repentance hear of the repentance of peter after his denial for the evangelist in relating to us the things concerning him says and he went out and wept bitterly therefore even such a sin was forgiven him because he repented as he ought although the victim had not yet been offered nor had the sacrifice as yet been made nor was sin as yet taken away it still had the rule and sovereignty and that thou mayest learn that this denial arose not so much from sloth as from his being forsaken of god who was teaching him to know the measures of man and not to contradict the sayings of the master nor to be more high-minded than the rest but to know that nothing can be done without god and that except the lord build the house they labor in vain who build it therefore also christ said to him alone satan desired to sift thee as wheat and i allowed it not that thy faith may not fail for since it was likely that he would be high-minded being conscious to himself that he loved christ more than they all therefore he wept bitterly and he did other things after his weeping of the same character for what did he do after this he exposed himself to dangers innumerable and by many means showed his manliness and courage judas also repented but in an evil way for he hanged himself esau too repented as i said or rather he did not even repent for his tears were not tears of repentance but rather of pride and wrath and what followed proved this the blessed david repented thus saying every night will i wash my bed i will water my couch with my tears and the sin which had been committed long ago after so many years after so many generations he bewailed as if it had recently occurred for he who repents ought not to be angry nor to be fierce but to be contrite as one condemned as not having boldness as one on whom sentence has been passed as one who ought to be saved by mercy alone as one who has shown himself ungrateful toward his benefactor as unthankful as reprobate as worthy of punishments innumerable if he considers these things he will not be angry he will not be indignant but will mourn will weep will groan and lament night and day he that is penitent ought never to forget his sin but on the one hand to beseech god not to remember it while on the other he himself never forgets it if we remember it god will forget it let us exact punishment from ourselves let us accuse ourselves thus shall we propitiate the judge for sin confessed becomes less but not confessed worse for if sin add to itself shamelessness and ingratitude how will he who does not know that he sinned before be at all able to guard himself from falling again into the same evils let us then not deny our sins i beseech you nor be shameless that we may not unwillingly pay the penalty cain heard god say where is abel thy brother and he said i know not am i my brother's keeper seest thou how this made his sin more grievous but his father did not act thus what then when he heard adam where art thou he said i heard thy voice and i was afraid because i am naked and i hid myself it is a great good to acknowledge our sins and to bear them in mind continually nothing so effectually cures a fault as a continual remembrance of it nothing makes a man so slow to wickedness i know that conscience starts back and endures not to be scourged by the remembrance of evil deeds but hold tight thy soul and place a muzzle on it for like an ill-broken horse so it bears impatiently what is put upon it 
and is unwilling to persuade itself that it has sinned but all this is the work of satan but let us persuade it that it has sinned let us persuade it that it has sinned that it may also repent in order that having repented it may escape torment how dost thou think to obtain pardon for thy sins tell me when thou hast not yet confessed them assuredly he is worthy of compassion and kindness who has sinned but thou who is not yet persuaded thyself that thou hast sinned how dost thou think to be pitied when thou art thus without shame for some things let us persuade ourselves that we have sinned let us say it not with the tongue only but also with the mind let us not call ourselves sinners but also count over our sins going over them each specifically i do not say to thee make a parade of thyself nor accuse thyself before others but be persuaded by the prophet when he saith reveal thy way unto the lord confess these things before god confess before the judge thy sins with prayer if not with tongue yet in memory and be worthy of mercy if thou keep thy sins continually in remembrance thou wilt never bear in mind the wrongs of thy neighbour i do not say if thou art persuaded that thou art thyself a sinner this does not avail so to humble the soul as sins themselves taken by themselves and examined specifically thou wilt have no remembrance of wrongs done thee if thou hast these things continually in remembrance thou wilt feel no anger thou wilt not revile thou wilt have no high thoughts thou wilt not fall again into the same sins thou wilt be more earnest toward good things seest thou how many excellent effects are produced from the remembrance of our sins let us then write them in our minds i know that the soul does not endure a recollection which is so bitter but let us constrain and force it it is better that we should be gnawed with the remembrance now than at that time with vengeance now if thou remember them and continually present them before god and pray for them thou wilt speedily blot them out but if thou forget them now thou wilt then be reminded of them even against thy will when they are brought out publicly before the whole world displayed before all both friends and enemies and angels for surely he did not say to david only what thou didst secretly i will make it manifest to all but even to us all thou wert afraid of men he said and respected them more than god and god seeing thee thou caredst not but wert ashamed before men for it says the eyes of men this is their fear therefore thou shalt suffer punishment in that very point for i will reprove thee setting thy sins before the eyes of all for that this is true and that in that day the sins of us all are to be publicly displayed unless we now do them away by continual remembrance hear how cruelty and inhumanity are publicly exposed i was and hungered he says and ye gave me no meat when are these things said is it in a corner is it in a secret place by no means when then when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the nations are gathered together when he has separated the one from the other then will he speak in the audience of all and will set them on his right hand and on his left i was an hungered and ye gave me no meat see again the five virgins also hearing before all i know you not for the five and five do not set forth the number of five only but those virgins who are wicked and cruel and inhuman and those who are not such so also he that buried his one talent heard before all even of those who had brought the five and the two thou wicked and slothful servant but not by words alone but by deeds also does he then convict them even as the evangelist also says they shall look on him whom they pierced 
for the resurrection shall be of all at the same time of sinners and of the righteous at the same time shall he be present to all in the judgment consider therefore who they are who shall then be in dismay who in grief who dragged away to the fire while the others are crowned come he says ye blessed of my father inherit the kingdom which hath been prepared for you from the foundation of the world and again depart from me into the fire which hath been prepared for the devil and his angels let us not merely hear the words but write them also before our sight and let us imagine him to be now present in saying these things and that we are led away to that fire what heart shall we have what consolation and what when we are cut asunder and what when we are accused of rapacity what excuse shall we have to utter what specious argument none but of necessity bound bending down we must be dragged to the mouths of the furnace to the river of fire to the darkness to the never dying punishments and entreat no one for it is not it is not possible he says to pass across from this side to that for there is a great gulf betwixt us and you and it is not possible even for those who wish it to go across and stretch out a helping hand but we must needs burn continually no one aiding us even should it be father or mother or any whosoever yea though he have much boldness toward god for it says a brother doth not redeem shall a man redeem since then it is not possible to have one's hopes of salvation in another but it must be in oneself after the loving kindness of god let us do all things i entreat you so that our conduct may be pure and our course of life the best that it may not receive any stain even from the beginning but if not at all events let us not sleep after the stain but continue always washing away the pollution by repentance by tears by prayers by works of mercy what then you say if i cannot do works of mercy but thou hast a cup of cold water however poor thou art but thou hast two mites, in whatever poverty thou art. But thou hast feet, so as to visit the sick, so as to enter into a prison. But thou hast a roof, so as to receive strangers. For there is no pardon, no, none for him who does not do works of mercy. These things we say to you continually, that we may effect, if it be but a little, by the continued repetition, these things we say not caring so much for those who receive the benefits as for yourselves for ye give to them indeed things here but in return you receive heavenly things which may we all obtain in christ jesus our lord with whom to the father be glory together with the holy ghost now and ever and world without end amen end of homily thirty one Homily thirty two of Homilies on Hebrews by St. John Chrysostom. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Homily thirty two, Hebrews twelve, eighteen through twenty four. For ye are not come unto a fire that might be touched and that burned, and unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more for they could not endure that which was commanded and if so much as a beast touch the mountain it shall be stoned and so terrible was the sight that moses said i exceedingly fear and quake but ye are come unto mount zion and unto the city of the living god the heavenly jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven and to god the judge of all 
and to the spirits of just men made perfect and to jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of abel wonderful indeed were the things in the temple the holy of holies and again awful were those things also that were done at mount sinai the fire the darkness the blackness the tempest for it says god appeared in sinai and long ago were these things celebrated the new covenant however was not given with any of these things but has been given in simple discourse by god see then how he makes the comparison in these points also and with good reason has he put them afterwards for when he had persuaded them by innumerable arguments when he had also shown the difference between each covenant then afterwards the one having been already condemned he easily enters on these points also and what says he for ye are not come unto a fire that might be touched and that burned and unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words which they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more these things he means are terrible and so terrible that they could not even bear to hear them that not even a beast dared to go up but things that come hereafter are not such for what is sinai to heaven and what the fire which might be touched to god who cannot be touched for god is a consuming fire for it is said let not god speak but let moses speak unto us and so fearful was that which was commanded though even a beast touch the mountain it shall be stoned moses said i exceedingly fear and quake what wonder as respects the people he himself who entered into darkness where god was saith i exceedingly fear and quake but ye are come unto mount zion and unto the city of the living god the heavenly jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels and to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven and to god the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect and to jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of abel instead of moses jesus instead of the people myriads of angels of what firstborn does he speak of the faithful and to the spirits of just men made perfect with these shall ye be he says and to jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of abel did then the blood of abel speak yea he saith and by it he being dead yet speaketh and again god says the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me either this meaning or that because it is still even now celebrated but not in such a way as that of christ for this has cleansed all men and sends forth a voice more clear and more distinct in proportion as it has greater testimony namely that by facts verses twenty five through twenty nine see that ye refuse not him that speaketh for if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven whose voice then shook the earth but now hath he promised saying yet once more i shake not the earth only but also heaven and this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made that those which cannot be shaken may remain wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we serve god acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our god is a consuming fire fearful were those things but these are far more admirable and glorious for here there is not darkness nor blackness nor tempest it seems to me that by these words he hints at the obscurity of the old testament and the overshadowed and veiled character of the law 
and besides the giver of the law appears in terrible fire and apt to punish those who transgress but what are the sounds of the trumpet probably it is as though some king were coming this at all events will also be at the second coming at the last trump all must be raised but it is the trumpet of his voice which affects this at that time then all things were objects of sense and sights and sounds now all are objects of understanding and invisible and it says there was much smoke for since god is said to be fire and appeared thus in the bush he indicates the fire even by the smoke and what is the blackness and the darkness he again expresses its fearfulness thus isaiah also says and the house was filled with smoke and what is the object of the tempest the human race was careless it was therefore needful that they should be aroused by these things for no one was so dull as not to have had his thoughts raised up when these things were done and the law ordained moses spake and god answered him by a voice for it was necessary that the voice of god should be uttered inasmuch as he was about to promulgate his law through moses therefore he makes him worthy of confidence they saw him not because of the thick darkness they heard him not because of the weakness of his voice what then god answered by a voice addressing the multitude yea and his name shall be called they entreated he says that the word should not be spoken to them any more from the first therefore they were themselves the cause of god's being manifested through the flesh let moses speak with us and let not god speak with us they who make comparisons elevate the one side the more that they may show the other to be far greater in this respect also our privileges are more gentle and more admirable for they are great in a twofold respect because while they are glorious and greater they are more accessible this he says also in the epistle to the corinthians with unveiled countenance and not as moses put a veil over his face they he means were not counted worthy of what we are for of what were they thought worthy they saw darkness blackness they heard a voice but thou also hast heard a voice not through darkness but through flesh thou hast not been disturbed neither troubled but thou hast stood and held discourse with the mediator and in another way by the darkness he shows the invisibleness and darkness it says was under his feet then even moses feared but now no one as the people then stood below so also do we they were not below but below heaven the sun is near to god but not as moses there was a wilderness here a city and to an innumerable company of angels here he shows the joy the delight in place of the blackness and darkness and tempest and to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven and to god the judge of all they did not draw near but stood afar off even moses but ye are come near here he makes them fear by saying and to god the judge of all not of the jews alone and the faithful but even of the whole world and to the spirits of just men made perfect he means the souls of those who are approved and to jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that is of purification which speaketh better things than that of abel and if the blood speaks much more does he who having been slain lives but what does it speak the spirit also he says speaketh with groanings which cannot be uttered how does he speak whenever he falls into a sincere mind he raises it up and makes it speak see that ye refuse not him that speaketh that is that ye reject him not 
for if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth whom does he mean moses i suppose but what he says is this if they having refused him when he gave laws on earth did not escape how shall we refuse him when he gives laws from heaven he declares here not that he is another far from it he does not set forth one and another but he appears terrible when uttering his voice from heaven it is he himself then both the one and the other but the one is terrible for he expresses not a difference of persons but of the gift whence does this appear for if they escaped not he says who refused him that spake on earth much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven what then is this one different from the other how then does he say whose voice then shook the earth for it was the voice of him who then gave the law which shook the earth but now hath he promised saying yet once more i shake not the earth only but also heaven and this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things which are shaken as of things that are made all things therefore will be taken away and will be compacted anew for the better for this is what he suggests here why then dost thou grieve when thou sufferest in a world that abideth not when thou art afflicted in a world which will very shortly have passed away if our rest were to be in the latter period of the world then one ought to be afflicted in looking to the end that he says those which cannot be shaken may remain but of what sort are those things which cannot be shaken the things to come let us then do all for this that we may attain that rest that we may enjoy those good things yea i pray and beseech you let us be earnest for this no one builds in a city which is going to fall down tell me i pray you if any one said that after a year this city would fall but such a city not at all wouldst thou have built in that which was about to fall so i also now say this let us not build in this world it will fall after a little and all will be destroyed but why do i say it will fall before its fall we shall be destroyed and suffer what is fearful we shall be removed from them why build we upon the sand let us build upon the rock for whatsoever may happen that building remains impregnable nothing will be able to destroy it with good reason for to all such attacks that region is inaccessible just as this is accessible for earthquakes and fires and inroad of enemies take it away from us even while we are alive and oftentimes destroy us with it and even in case it remains disease speedily removes us or if we stay suffers us not to enjoy it fairly for what pleasure is there where there are sicknesses and false accusations and envy and intrigues or should there be none of these things yet oftentimes if we have no children we are disquieted we are impatient not having any to whom we may leave houses and all other things and thenceforward we pine away as laboring for others yea oftentimes too the inheritance passes away to our enemies not only after we are gone but even while we live what is more miserable then than to toil for enemies and ourselves to be gathering sins together in order that they may have rest and many are the instances of this that are seen in our cities and yet i say no more lest i should grieve those who have been despoiled for i could have mentioned some of them even by name and have had many histories to tell and many houses to show you which have received for masters the enemies of those who laboured for them nay not houses only but slaves also and the whole inheritance have oftentimes come round to enemies for such things are human but in heaven there is nothing of this to fear lest after a man is dead his enemy should come and succeed to his inheritance 
for there there is neither death nor enmity the tabernacles of the saints are permanent abodes and among those saints is exultation joy gladness for the voice of rejoicing it is said is in the tabernacles of the righteous they are eternal having no end they do not fall down through age they do not change their owners but stand continually in their best estate with good reason for there is nothing corruptible nor perishable there but all is immortal and undefiled on this building let us exhaust all our wealth we have no need of carpenters nor of laborers the hands of the poor build such houses the lame the blind the maimed they build those houses and wonder not since they procure even a kingdom for us and give us confidence towards god for mercifulness is as it were a most excellent art and a protector of those who labor at it for it is dear to god and ever stands near him readily asking favor for whomsoever it will if only it not be wronged by us and it is wronged when we do it by extortion so if it be pure it gives great confidence to those who offer it up it intercedes even for those who have offended so great is its power even for those who have sinned it breaks the chains disperses the darkness quenches the fire kills the worm drives away the gnashing of teeth the gates of heaven open to it with great security and as when a queen is entering no one of the guards stationed at the doors dares to inquire who she is and whence but all straightway receive her so also indeed with mercifulness for she is truly a queen indeed making men like god for he says ye shall be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful she is winged and buoyant having golden pinions with a flight which greatly delights the angels there it is said are the wings of a dove covered with silver and her back with the yellowness of gold as some dove golden and living she flies with gentle look and mild eye nothing is better than that eye the peacock is beautiful but in comparison of her is a jackdaw so beautiful and worthy of admiration is this bird she continually looks upwards she is surrounded abundantly with god's glory she is a virgin with golden wings decked out with a fair and mild countenance she is winged and buoyant standing by the royal throne when we are judged she suddenly flies in and shows herself and rescues us from punishment sheltering us with her own wings god would have her rather than sacrifices much does he discourse concerning her so he loves her he will relieve it is said the widow and the fatherless and the poor god wishes to be called from her the lord is pitiful and merciful long-suffering and of great mercy and true the mercy of god is over all the earth she hath saved the race of mankind for unless she had pitied us all things would have perished when we were enemies she reconciled us she wrought innumerable blessings she persuaded the son of god to become a slave and to empty himself of his glory let us earnestly emulate her by whom we have been saved let us love her let us prize her before wealth and apart from wealth let us have a merciful soul nothing is so characteristic of a christian as mercy there is nothing which both unbelievers and all men so admire as when we are merciful for oftentimes we are ourselves also in need of this mercy and say to god have mercy upon us after thy great goodness let us begin first ourselves or rather it is not we that begin first for he has himself already shown his mercy towards us yet at least let us follow second for if men have mercy on a merciful man even if he has done innumerable wrongs much more does god hear the prophet saying but i his words are am like a fruitful olive tree in the house of god 
let us become such let us become as an olive tree let us be laden on every side with the commandments for it is not enough to be as an olive tree but also to be fruitful for there are persons who in doing alms give little only once in the course of the whole year or in each week or who give away a mere chance matter these are indeed olive trees but not fruitful ones but even withered for because they show compassion they are olive trees but because they do it not liberally they are not fruitful olive trees but let us be fruitful i have often said and i say now also the greatness of the charity is not shown by the measure of what is given but by the disposition of the giver you know the case of the widow it is well continually to bring this example forward that not even the poor man may despair of himself when he looks on her who threw in the two mites some contributed even hair and the fitting up of the temple and not even these were rejected but if when they had gold they had brought hair they would have been accursed but if having this only they brought it they were accepted for this cause cain also was blamed not because he offered worthless things but because they were the most worthless he had accursed it is said is he which hath a male and sacrificeth unto god a corrupt thing he did not speak absolutely but he that hath he says and spareth it if then a man have nothing he is freed from blame or rather he has a reward but what is of less value than two farthings or more worthless than hair what then a pint of meal but nevertheless these are approved equally with the calves and the gold for a man is accepted according to that he hath not according to that he hath not and it says according as thy hand hath do good wherefore i entreat you let us readily empty out what we have for the poor even if it be little we shall receive the same reward with them who have cast the most or rather more than those who cast in ten thousand talents if we do these things we shall obtain the unspeakable treasures of god if we not only hear but practice also if we do not praise charity but also show it by our deeds which may we all attain in christ jesus our lord with whom to the father together with the holy ghost be glory might honour now and for ever and world without end amen end of homily thirty two homily thirty three of homilies on hebrews by st john chrysostom this librivox recording is in the public domain homily thirty three hebrews twelve twenty eight through twenty nine wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace or gratitude whereby we serve god acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our god is a consuming fire in another place he says the same for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal and from this makes an exhortation with regard to the evils which we endure in this present life and here he does this and says let us continue steadfast let us have thankfulness that is to say let us give thanks unto god for not only we ought not to be discouraged at present things but even to show the greatest gratitude to him for those to come whereby we serve god acceptably that is to say for thus is it possible to serve god acceptably by giving him thanks in all things do all things he says without murmurings and disputings for whatever work a man does with murmuring he cuts away and loses his reward as the israelites how great a penalty they paid for their murmurings wherefore he says neither murmur ye it is not therefore possible to serve him acceptably without a sense of gratitude to him for all things both for our trials and the alleviations of them that is let us utter nothing hastily nothing disrespectful 
but let us humble ourselves that we may be reverential for this is with reverence and godly fear chapter thirteen verses one through two let brotherly love continue be not forgetful of hospitality for hereby some have entertained angels unawares see how he enjoins them to preserve what they had he does not add other things he did not say be loving as brethren but let brotherly love continue and again he did not say be hospitable as if they were not but be not forgetful of hospitality for this was likely to happen owing to their afflictions therefore he says some have entertained angels unawares seest thou how great was the honour how great the gain what is unawares they entertained them without knowing it therefore the reward also was great because he entertained them not knowing that they were angels for if he had known it it would have been nothing wonderful some say that here he alludes to lot also verses three through five remember them that are in bonds as bound with them them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body marriage is honourable in all and the bed undefiled but whoremongers and adulterers god will judge let your conversation be without covetousness being content with such things as ye have see how large is his discourse concerning chastity follow peace he said and holiness lest there be any fornicator or profane person and again fornicators and adulterers god will judge in every case the prohibition is with a penalty follow peace with all men he says and holiness without which no man shall see the lord but fornicators and adulterers god will judge and having first set down marriage is honourable in all men and the bed undefiled he shows that he rightly added what follows for if marriage had been conceded justly is the fornicator punished justly does the adulterer suffer vengeance here he strips for the heretics he did not say again let no one be a fornicator but having said it once for all he then went on as with a general exhortation and not as directing himself against them let your conversation be without covetousness he says he did not say possess nothing but let your conversation be without covetousness that is let it show forth the philosophical character of your mind and it will show it if we do not seek superfluities if we only keep to what is necessary for he says above also and he took joyfully the spoiling of your goods he gives these exhortations that they might not be covetous being content he says with such things as ye have then hear also the consolation verse five for he he says hath said i will never leave thee nor forsake thee verse six so that we may boldly say the lord is my helper and i will not fear what man shall do unto me again consolation in their trials verse seven remember them which have the rule over you this he was labouring to say above therefore follow peace with all men he gave this exhortation also to the thessalonians to hold them in honour exceedingly remember he says them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of god whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation what kind of following is this truly the best for he says beholding their life follow their faith for from a pure life cometh faith or else by faith he means steadfastness how so because they believe in the things to come for they would not have shown forth a pure life if they had questioned about the things to come if they had doubted so that here also he is applying a remedy to the same evil verses eight and nine jesus christ the same yesterday and to-day and for ever be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines 
for it is good that the heart be established with grace not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein in these words jesus christ the same yesterday and to-day and for ever yesterday means all the time that is past to-day the present for ever the endless which is to come that is to say ye have heard of an high priest but not an high priest who fails he is always the same as though there were some who said he is not another will come he says this that he who was yesterday and to-day is the same also for ever for even now the jews say that another will come and having deprived themselves of him that is will fall into the hands of antichrist be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines not with strange doctrines only but neither with divers ones for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein here he gently hints at those who introduce the observance of meats for by faith all things are pure there is need then of faith not of meats for verse ten we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle not as the jewish ordinances are those among us as it is not lawful even for the high priest to partake of them so that since he had said do not observe and this seems to be the language of one who is throwing down his own building he again turns it round what have not we then observances as well he says yea we have and we observe them very earnestly too not sharing them even with the priests themselves verses eleven and twelve for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp wherefore jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered he says without the gate seest thou the type shining forth for sin he says and suffered without the gate verse thirteen let us go forth therefore to him without the camp bearing his reproach that is suffering the same things having communion with him in his sufferings he was crucified without as a condemned person neither let us then be ashamed to go forth out of the world verses fourteen and fifteen for we have here no continuing city he says but we seek one to come by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to god continually that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name by him as by an high priest according to the flesh giving thanks he says to his name let us utter nothing blasphemous nothing hasty nothing bold nothing presumptuous nothing desperate this is with reverence and godly fear for a soul in tribulations becomes desponding and reckless but let not us be so see here he again says the same thing which he said before not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together for so shall we be able to do all things with reverence for oftentimes even out of respect for men we refrain from doing many evil things verse sixteen but to do good and to communicate forget not i speak not merely with reverence to the brethren present but to those absent also but if others have plundered your property display your hospitality out of such things as ye have what excuse then shall we have henceforward when they even after the spoiling of their goods were thus admonished and he did not say be not forgetful of the entertaining of strangers but of hospitality that is do not merely entertain strangers but do it with love for the strangers moreover he did not speak of the recompense that is future and in store for us lest he should make them more supine but of that already given for thereby some he says have entertained angels unawares but let us see in what sense marriage is honourable in all and the bed undefiled 
because he means it preserves the believer in chastity here he also alludes to the jews because the account of the woman after childbirth polluted and whosoever comes from the bed it is said is not clean those things are not polluted which arise from nature o ungrateful and senseless jew but those which arise from choice for if marriage is honourable and pure why forsooth dost thou think that one is even polluted by it let your conversation he says be without covetousness since many after having exhausted their property afterwards wish to recover it again under the guise of alms therefore he says let your conversation be without covetousness that is that we should be desirous only of what is necessary and indispensable what then you say if we should not have a supply even of these that is not possible indeed it is not for he hath said and he doth not lie i will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we boldly say the lord is my helper and i will not fear what man shall do unto me thou hast the promise from himself do not doubt henceforward he has promised make no question but this i will never leave thee he says not concerning money only but concerning all other things also the lord is my helper and i will not fear what man shall do unto me with good reason this then also let us say in all temptations let us laugh at human things so long as we have god favourable to us for as when he is our enemy it is no gain though all men should be our friends so when he is our friend though all men together war against us there is no harm i will not fear what man shall do unto me remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of god in this place i think that he is speaking about assistance also for this is implied in the words who have spoken unto you the word of god whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation what is considering continually revolving examining it by yourselves reasoning investigating accurately testing it as you choose the end of their conversation that is their conversation to the end for their conversation had a good end jesus christ the same yesterday and to-day and for ever do not think that then indeed he wrought wonders but now works no wonders he is the same this is remember them that have the rule over you be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines strange that is different from those he heard from us divers that is of all sorts for they have no stability but are different one from another for especially manifold is the doctrine of meats for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace not with meats these are the divers these the strange doctrines especially as christ has said not that which entereth into the mouth defileth the man but that which cometh out and observe that he does not make bold to say this openly but as it were by a hint for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace not with meats faith is all if that establishes it the heart stands in security it follows that faith establishes consequently reasonings shake for faith is contrary to reasoning which he says have not profited them that have been occupied therein for what is the gain from the observance of them tell me does it not rather destroy does it not make such an one to be under sin if it be necessary to observe them we must guard ourselves which he says have not profited them that have been occupied therein that is who have always diligently kept them there is one observance abstaining from sin for what profit is it when some are so polluted as not to be able to partake of the sacrifices so that it did not save them at all although they were zealous about the observances but because they had not faith even thus they profited nothing in the next place he takes away the sacrifice from the type 
and directs his discourse to the prototype saying the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest are burned without the camp then those things were a type of these and thus christ suffering without fulfilled all here he makes it plain too that he suffered voluntarily showing that those things were not accidental but even the divine arrangement itself was of a suffering without he suffered without but his blood was borne up into heaven thou seest then that we partake of blood which has been carried into the holy place the true holy place of the sacrifice of which the priest alone had the privilege we therefore partake of the truth the reality if then we partake not of reproach only but of sanctification the reproach is the cause of the sanctification for as he was reproached so also are we if we go forth without therefore we have fellowship with him but what is let us go forth to him let us have fellowship with him in his sufferings let us bear his reproach for he did not simply bid us dwell outside the gate but as he was reproached as he condemned a person so also we and by him let us offer a sacrifice to god of what kind of sacrifice does he speak the fruit of lips giving thanks to his name they the jews brought sheep and calves and gave them to the priest let us bring none of these things but thanksgiving this fruit let our lips put forth for with such sacrifices god is well pleased let us give such a sacrifice to him that he may offer it to the father for in no other way it is offered except through the son or rather also through a contrite mind all these things are said for the weak for that the thanks belong to the son is evident since otherwise how is the honour equal that all men he says should honour the son even as they honour the father wherein is the honour equal the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name let us bear all things thankfully be it poverty be it disease be it anything else whatever for he alone knows the things expedient for us for we know not what we should pray for as we ought we then who do not know even how to ask for what is fitting unless we have received of the spirit let us take care to offer up thanksgiving for all things and let us bear all things nobly are we in poverty let us give thanks are we in sickness let us give thanks are we falsely accused let us give thanks when we suffer affliction let us give thanks this brings us near to god then we even have god for our debtor but when we are in prosperity it is we who are debtors and liable to be called to account for when we are in prosperity we are debtors to god and oftentimes these things bring a judgment upon us while those are a payment of sins those afflictions draw down mercy they draw down kindness while these on the other hand lift up even to an insane pride and lead also to slothfulness and dispose a man to fancy great things concerning himself they puff up therefore the prophet also said it is good for me lord that thou hast afflicted me that i may learn thy statutes when hezekiah had received blessings and been freed from calamities his heart was lifted up on high when he fell sick then was he humbled then he became near to god when he slew them it says then they sought him diligently and turned and were early in coming to god and again when the beloved waxed gross and fat then he kicked for the lord is known when he executeth judgments affliction is a great good narrow is the way so that affliction thrusts us into the narrow way he who is not pressed by affliction cannot enter for he who afflicts himself in the narrow way is he who also enjoys ease but he that spreads himself out does not enter in and suffers from being so to say wedged in see how paul enters into this narrow way he keeps under his body so as to be able to enter therefore in all his afflictions he continued giving thanks unto god 
hast thou lost thy property this hath lightened thee of the most of thy whiteness hast thou fallen from glory this is another sort of whiteness hast thou been falsely accused have the things said against thee of which thou art nowise conscious to thyself been believed rejoice and leap for joy for blessed are ye he says when men reproach you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven why dost thou marvel if thou art grieved and wish to be set free from temptations paul wished to be set free and oftentimes entreated god and did not obtain for the thrice for this i besought the lord is oftentimes and he said unto me my grace is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness by weakness he here means afflictions what then when he heard this he received it thankfully and says wherefore i take pleasure in infirmities that is i am pleased i rest in my afflictions for all things then let us give thanks both for comfort and for affliction let us not murmur let us not be unthankful naked came i out of my mother's womb naked also shall i depart thou didst not come forth glorious do not seek glory thou wast brought into life naked not of money alone but also of glory and of honourable name consider how great evils have oftentimes arisen from wealth for it is easier it is said for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven seest thou to how many good things wealth is a hindrance and dost thou seek to be rich dost thou not rejoice that the hindrance has been overthrown so narrow is the way which leadeth into the kingdom so broad is wealth and full of bulk and swelling out therefore he says sell that thou hast that that way may receive thee why dost thou yearn after wealth for this cause he took it away from thee that he might free thee from slavery for true fathers also when a son is corrupted by some mistress and having given him much exhortation they do not persuade him to part from her send the mistress into banishment such also is abundance of wealth because the lord cares for us and delivers us from the harm which arises therefrom he takes away wealth from us let us not then think poverty an evil sin is the only evil for neither is wealth a good thing by itself to be well pleasing to god is the only good poverty then let us seek this let us pursue so shall we lay hold on heaven so shall we attain to the other good things which may we all attain by the grace and loving kindness of our lord jesus christ with whom to the father together with the holy ghost be glory power honour now and ever and world without end amen End of homily 33homily 34 of homilies on hebrews by st john chrysostom this librivox recording is in the public domain homily 34 hebrews 13 17 obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for this is unprofitable for you anarchy is an evil and the occasion of many calamities and the source of disorder and confusion for as if thou take away the leader from a chorus the chorus will not be in tune and in order and if from a phalanx of an army thou remove the commander the evolutions will no longer be made in time and order and if from a ship you take away the helmsman thou wilt sink the vessel so too if from a flock thou remove the shepherd thou hast overthrown and destroyed all anarchy then is an evil and a cause of ruin but no less an evil also is the disobedience to rulers for it comes again to the same for a people not obeying a ruler is like one which has none and perhaps even worse 
for in the former case they have at least an excuse for disorder but no longer in the latter but are punished but perhaps some one will say there is also a third evil when the ruler is bad i myself too know it and no small evil it is but even a far worse evil than anarchy for it is better to be led by no one than to be led by one who is evil for the former indeed are oftentimes saved and oftentimes are in peril but the latter will be altogether in peril being led into the pit of destruction how then does paul say obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves having said above whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation he then said obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves what then you say when he is wicked should we obey wicked in what sense if indeed in regard to faith flee and avoid him not only if he be a man but even if he be an angel come down from heaven but if in regard to life be not over curious and this instance i do not allege from my own mind but from the divine scripture for hear christ saying the scribes and the pharisees sit on moses seat having previously spoken many fearful things concerning them he then says they sit on moses seat all therefore whatsoever they tell you observe do but do not ye after their works they have he means the dignity of office but are of unclean life do thou however attend not to their life but to their words for as regards their characters no one would be harmed thereby how is this both because their characters are manifest to all and also because though he were ten thousand times as wicked he will never teach what is wicked but as respects faith the evil is not manifest to all and the wicked ruler will not shrink from teaching it moreover judge not that ye be not judged concerns life not faith surely what follows makes this plain for why he says beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye all things therefore he says which they bid you observe do ye now to do belongs to works not to faith but do not ye after their works seest thou that the discourse is not concerning doctrines but concerning life and works paul however previously commended them and then says obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that shall give account let those who rule also hear and not only those who are under their rule that as the subjects ought to be obedient so also the rulers ought to be watchful and sober what sayest thou he watches he imperils his own head he is subject to the punishments of thy sins and for thy sake is amenable to what is so fearful and art thou slothful and affectedly indifferent and at ease therefore he says that they may do this with joy and not with grief for this is unprofitable for you seest thou that the despised ruler ought not to avenge himself but his great revenge is to weep and lament for neither is it possible for the physician despised by his patient to avenge himself but to weep and lament but if the ruler lament he means god inflicts vengeance on thee for if when we lament for our own sins we draw god to us shall we not much rather do this when we lament for the arrogance and scornfulness of others seest thou that he does not suffer him to be led on to reproach us seest thou how great is his philosophy he ought to lament who is despised is trodden under foot is spit upon be not confident because he does not avenge himself on thee for lamenting is worse than any revenge for when of himself he profits nothing by lamenting he calls on the lord and as in the case of a teacher and a nurse when the child does not listen to him one is called in who will treat him more severely so also in this case oh how great the danger what should one say to those wretched men 
who throw themselves upon so great an abyss of punishments, thou hast to give account of all over whom thou rulest, women and children and men. Into so great a fire dost thou put thy head. I marvel if any of the rulers can be saved, when in the face of such a threat, and of the present indifference, I see some still even running on, and casting themselves upon so great a burden of authority. For if they who are dragged by force have no refuge or defense, if they discharge duty ill and are negligent, since even Aaron was dragged by force, and yet was imperiled, and Moses again was imperiled, although he had oftentimes declined, and Saul, having been entrusted with another kind of rule, after he had declined it, was in peril, because he managed it amiss. How much more they who take so great pains to obtain it, and cast themselves upon it! Such an one much more deprives himself of all excuse. For men ought to fear and to tremble, both because of conscience, and because of the burden of the office, and neither when dragged to it should they once for all decline, nor, when not dragged, cast themselves upon it, but should even flee, foreseeing the greatness of the dignity. And when they have been seized, they ought again to show their godly fear. Let there be nothing out of measure. If thou hast perceived it beforehand, retire, convince thyself that thou art unworthy of the office. Again, if thou hast been seized, in like manner be thou reverential, always showing right-mindedness. Verse 18. Pray for us, he says, for we trust we have a good conscience among all, willing to live honestly. Thou seest that he used these apologies as writing to persons grieved with him, as to those who turned away, who were disposed as towards a transgressor, not enduring even to hear his name inasmuch then as he asked from those who hated him what all others ask from those who love them their prayers for him therefore he here introduces this saying we trust that we have a good conscience for do not tell me of accusations our conscience he says in nothing hurts us nor are we conscious to ourselves that we have plotted against you for we trust he says that we have a good conscience among all not among the Gentiles only, but also among you. We have done nothing with deceitfulness, nothing with hypocrisy, for it was probable that these calumnies were reported respecting him. For they have been informed concerning thee, it is said, that thou teachest apostasy. Not as an enemy, he means, nor as an adversary I write these things, but as a friend, and this he shows also by what follows. Verse 19. But I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. His thus praying was the act of one who loved them greatly, and that not simply, but with all earnestness, that so, he says, I may come to you speedily. The earnest desire to come to them is the mark of one conscious to himself of nothing wrong, also the entreating them to pray for him. Therefore, having first asked their prayers, he then himself also prays for all good things on them. Verse 20. Now the God of peace, he says, be ye not therefore at variance one with another, that brought again from the earth the shepherd of the sheep. This is said concerning the resurrection. The great shepherd. Another addition. Here again he confirms to them even to the end, his discourse concerning the resurrection. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21. Make you perfect in every good work, to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Again he bears high testimony to them, for that is made perfect, which having a beginning is afterwards completed and he prays for them which is the act of one who yearns for them. And while in the other epistles he prays in the prefaces, here he does it at the end, working in you, he says, that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. 
Verse 22. And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for indeed I have written a letter unto you in few words. Seest thou that what he wrote to no one else, he writes to them? For he means, I do not even trouble you with a long discourse. I suppose that they were not at all unfavorably disposed towards Timothy, wherefore he also put him forward. For, verse 23, Know ye, he says, that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he come shortly, I will see you. Set at liberty, he says. From whence? I suppose he had been cast into prison, or if not this, that he was sent away from Athens, for this also is mentioned in the Acts. Verses 24 and 25 Salute all them that have the rule over you, and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Seest thou how he shows that virtue is born neither wholly from God, nor yet from ourselves alone? First, by saying, Make you perfect in every good work. Ye have virtue indeed, he means, but need to be made complete. What is good work and word? So as to have both life and doctrines right. According to his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. In his sight, he says, for this is the highest virtue, to do that which is well-pleasing in the sight of God, as the prophet also says, and according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight. And having written thus much, he said this was little in comparison with what he was going to say. As he says also in another place, As I wrote to you in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And observe his wisdom. He says not, I beseech you, suffer the word of admonition, but the word of exhortation, that is, of consolation, of encouragement. No one, he means, can be wearied at the length of what has been said. Did this then make them turn away from him? By no means. He does not indeed wish to express this. That is, even if ye be of little spirit, for it is the peculiarity of such persons not to endure a long discourse. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he come shortly, I will see you. This is enough to persuade them to submit themselves, if he is ready to come with his disciple. Salute them that have the rule over you and all the saints. See how he honored them, since he wrote to them instead of to those their rulers. They of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Which was for them all in common. But how does grace come to be with us? If we do not do despite to the benefit, if we do not become indolent in regard to the gift, and what is the grace? Remission of sins. Cleansing. This is with us. For who, he means, can keep the grace despitefully, and not destroy it? For instance, he freely forgave thee thy sins. How then shall the grace be with thee, whether it be the good favor or the effectual working of the Spirit, if thou draw it to thee by good deeds? For the cause of all good things is this, the continual binding with us of the grace of the Spirit, for this guides us to all good things just as when it flies away from us, it ruins us, and leaves us desolate. Let us not, then, drive it from us, for on ourselves depends both its remaining and its departing, for the one results when we mind heavenly things, the other when we mind the things of this life, which the world, he says, cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, Seest thou that a worldly soul cannot have him? We need great earnestness that so there he may be held fast by us, so as to direct all our affairs, and to do them in security and in much peace. For as a ship sailing with favorable winds is neither to be hindered nor sunk, so long as it enjoys a prosperous and steady breeze, but also causes great admiration according to the march of its progress both to the mariners and to the passengers, 
giving rest to the one, and not forcing them to toil on at their oars, and setting the others free from all fear, and giving them the most delightful view of her course. So, too, a soul strengthened by the Divine Spirit is far above all the billows of this life, and more strongly than the ship cuts the way bearing on to heaven, since it is not sent along by wind, but has all the pure sails filled by the paraclete himself. And he cast out of our minds all that is slackened and relaxed. For as the wind, if it fall upon a slackened sail, would have no effect, so neither does the spirit endure to continue in a slack soul. But there is need of much tension, of much vehemence, so that our mind may be on fire, and our conduct under all circumstances on the stretch, and braced up. For instance, when we pray, we ought to do it with much intentness, stretching forth the soul toward heaven, not with cords, but with great earnestness. Again, when we do works of mercy, we have need of intentness, lest, by any means, thought for our household, and care for children, and anxiety about wife, and fear of poverty entering in, should slacken our sail, for if we put it on the stretch on all sides by the hope of the things to come, it receives well the energy of the spirit, and none of those perishable and wretched things will fall upon it. Yea, and if any one of them should fall, it does it no harm, but is quickly thrown back by the tightness, and is shaken off and falls down. Therefore we have need of much intentness, for we too are sailing over a great and wide sea, full of many monsters and of many rocks, and bringing forth for us many storms, and from the midst of serene weather raising up a most violent tempest. It is necessary, then, if we would sail with ease and without danger to stretch the sails, that is, our determination, for this is sufficient for us. For Abraham also, when he had stretched forth his affections towards God, and set before him his fixed resolution, what else had he need of? Nothing. But he believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. But faith comes of a sincere will. He offered up his son, and though he did not slay him, he received a recompense as if he had slain him. And though the work was not done, the reward was given. Let our sails, then, be in good order, not grown old, for everything that is decayed and waxen old is nigh to vanishing away, not worn into holes, that so they may bear the energy of the Spirit. For the natural man, it is said, receiveth not the things of the Spirit. For as the webs of spiders could not receive a blast of wind, so neither will the soul devoted to this life nor the natural man ever be able to receive the grace of the Spirit. For our reasonings differ nothing from them, preserving a connection in appearance only, but destitute of all power. Our condition, however, is not such if we are watchful, but whatever may fall upon the Christian, he bears all, and is above all, stronger than any whirlpool. For suppose there be a spiritual man, and that innumerable calamities befall him, yet is he overcome by none of them. And what do I say? Let poverty come upon him, disease, insults, revilings, mockings, stripes, every sort of affliction, every sort of mocking, and slanders and insults, yet as though he were outside the world, and set free from the feelings of the body, so will he laugh all to scorn." and that my words are not mere boasting, I think many such exist even now, for instance, of those who have embraced the life of the desert. This, however, you say, is nothing wonderful. But I say that of those who also who live in cities, there are such men unsuspected. If thou wish, however, I shall be able to exhibit some among those of old, and that thou mayest learn, consider Paul, I pray, what is there fearful that he did not suffer, and that he did not submit to? But he bore all nobly. Let us imitate him, for so shall we be able to land in the tranquil havens with much merchandise. Let us then stretch our mind towards heaven. 
let us be held fast by that desire let us clothe ourselves with spiritual fire let us gird ourselves with its flame no man who bears flame fears those who meet him be it wild beast be it man be it snares innumerable so long as he is armed with fire all things stand out of his way all things retire the flame is intolerable the fire cannot be endured it consumes all with this fire let us clothe ourselves offering up glory to our lord jesus christ with whom to the father together with the holy ghost be glory might honour now and for ever and world without end amen thanks be to god end of homily thirty four end of homilies on hebrews by st john chrysostom